Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's, a well, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to Ashoka University for this conference. Some of you are here physically in this uh, meeting room. Many of you are in the cloud. For those who are within India, of course, good afternoon to all of you on the clouds. Those who are outside India, it could be good morning or good evening, depending on which part of the world you are. Uh, it's a pleasure again to welcome you all. This is a unique workshop, first of its kind, uh, perhaps at least the first of its kind in India, which I'm aware of, where we are integrating very diverse topics, seemingly diverse topics or apparently diverse topics, which with the modern data science te techniques can actually bring together, not only simply to correlate each other factors, also to identify the causal relationship between many of these factors related to the health, agriculture, agricultural practices, the food production practices, the cooking practices, and the, the diet and nutrition, you know, and which have large diversity in this country, particularly all over the world, there's huge diversity. India itself is extremely diverse. We have uh, more than 4,000 anthropologically distinct population in this country. Amongst them, there is diversity in, in, in food practices and in addition to genetic diversity, and at the same time, huge geoclimatic diversity in this country, which also brings in variety of different types of the food and coming with different nutritional backgrounds. And in the modern days with rapid urbanization, with climate change and environmental degradation and deforestation and a fast changing world and globalization, we are also sort of coming with, you know, a state where it's very difficult to understand the correlation, particularly causative relation, causal relationship between what we eat and our health. And again, with the help of data science, we should be able to derive some of these correlations and causal relationship. That's the purpose of organizing this workshop, how modern data science can help understand uh, you know, our day-to-day, -day, what we do in the context of the food and nutrition and related to health. And health matters a lot, I'm sure all of you know. As long as you live, as long as you are aware of yourself, you know health matters a lot. And during this pandemic, I, it has really brought in the public health has become a, the major <clears throat> uh, you know, topical uh, issue these days. Although it's caused by a virus, this infection, but this manifestation is so different in different parts of the world. And whether it's Delta variant or Omicron variant, some people are extremely worried. Some people are very confident that nothing will happen to them. And we don't know yet how the, the virus, viral infection is being manifested in different parts of the world. It's because the spread itself is not even. So in the absence of uneven, in the absence of an even spread, it's because spread is uneven, the variants are different. We still do not have a clear idea about to what extent the genetic factors, nutrition factors, and other geoclimatic factors are influencing the pandemic. Again, data science is the one which helps when you collect all kinds of data. Just to give you a background why Ashoka is organizing this, of course, this has to be done all over the world, multiple times, and particularly in Indian context, in all institutions. I'm sure many other organizations like IIT Delhi and uh, IIIT Delhi, some of other organizations too are interested and in organizing in their own way, small workshops uh, in this, and also many faculty are researching in this area. The fact that Ashoka is organizing this is because in the recent years, when we started Ashoka as a liberal arts university, a research university where research and teaching is integrated across all disciplines. We are also trying to sort of bring in data science as sort of a connecting you know, discipline across all other disciplines where we get deeper understanding of history or archeology span or economics or political science. And of course, in natural sciences related to the, 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 what we want to understand, what we want to discover, what we want to innovate with the help of data science techniques. We also want to use data science techniques to derive information which will have societal applications, particularly again, related to health. 
so and and variety of different you know policies economic policy or health policy public health policy and so forth and amongst ourselves we have many many uh, famous you know uh, uh, data scientists who have been particularly in this pandemic time i'm sure many of you uh, you know outside ashoka are aware of professor gautam menon is an epidemiologist is a physicist uh, working in the area of complex systems and he has used his expertise and computational you know um, uh, techniques in understanding the epidemiology of this pandemic professor subhashish banerji is the head of computer science uh, department in ashoka he has been you know in the data science field for say decades now is well known in the whole country and across the world particularly application of data science for understanding the social science related data we have many other uh, you know scientists who are into generation of data you know large data not i'm talking about laboratory data amongst the social scientists we have uh, professor deshpande she is interested in uh, collecting all kinds of economic data the poverty data gender related data and for example what's the impact of the current pandemic in uh, in you know in in very different uh, socio economic and uh, gender uh, diverse populations and see how this can be bridged by you know appropriate policies we also have people like mekla she is uh, in agriculture economics and anthropology uh, you know faculty looking at agriculture marketing system particularly traditional agricultural marketing system where the data science would help in understanding you know what sort of how it is being you know practiced which is something which is evolved over centuries particularly in the context of the three form controversial formulas which thankfully repealed uh, last week uh, it's very useful to understand how the farming is practiced in a country like india and for which it's very difficult it's almost like trying to understand the whole india right 1.5 billion of so much diversity how to understand india you know there's a very complex question many times it becomes a philosophical question if you want to understand indian agriculture it's as complex as trying to understand india and again uh, you know data science is something which will help us and <clears throat> so as you could see from addressing some of fundamental sciences as deep philosophical questions like cognition and consciousness and one side of human existence to day to day issues of the society we are applying uh, you know data science techniques we have established two centers one is center for advanced computation uh, for data com and computation and which basically will provide an infrastructural support as well as expertise support to anybody who wants to use data science in their research and for policies we also have set up another center for center for health data and metrics which basically will look into the variety of disaggregated health data and bring them on one platform and trying to sort of analyze and derive india specific metrics develop some new visualization tools for for you know for policy experts to use those uh, metrics and the visualization tools for deriving health policies and so forth and uh, so we are going to continue to grow in data science we have just acquired more land and there will be more buildings there will be more people and more importantly we ashoka you know consciously we have decided we are not going to work in isolation we want to work in collaboration collaboration with clinicians collaborations with public health experts collaboration with academicians across the country and beyond across the world to an extent that they're all become sort of virtual as members of ashoka and we want to sort of establish very close organic contacts with everybody who want is interested in these some of these topics and all the centers that we are talking about we go those centers will basically not ashoka centers it is the centers for those particular problems to be addressed anybody can become a member of that center you know whether they are in ashoka or outside and they can work together so with this uh, short and sort of overview of about ashoka's interest in this area and again welcome you all i request uh, 
Professor Subhashish Banerjee to give an overview of this particular workshop. And afterwards, I'll come back again to introduce the, the first two speakers. Thank you very much. Hi, um, thanks, Shashi. Um, so this workshop uh, is primarily to explore the possibilities and opportunities for computer science in the area of health. Um, so we see uh, the possibility uh, in the data science centers that uh, Shashi talked about in uh, understanding nutrition, understanding causal effects, uh, understanding supply chains, epidemiology, and so on and so forth. Um, but having said that, computer science has often been accused uh, of defining public good as what it can conveniently deliver, uh, not as what is required. So the purpose of the workshop uh, is to listen to experts to, to find out what the problems are, and then uh, think over that where computer science uh, can be brought over, and what problems computer science should stay away from, both are important. Uh, uh, and that is the main purpose of the workshop. So the opportunities that we see are in the five sessions that we have outlined. Uh, we see the opportunities in all of them. Um, and also um, with the National Digital Health Mission, um, India is already into path of digitization at a scale that probably no other country has even contemplated. And um, it's been announced by the prime minister, it is happening. Uh, it is, uh, we are hearing that it will be rolled out uh, next year. So whether we like it or not, computer science is coming into public life. And uh, uh, we think this is an opportunity for us to intervene, uh, if at all, and give it the right shape. So um, what I'll, I'll stop here and I'll um, pass over the mic to Shashi to uh, introduce Professor Ramesh Jain and Anurag, who are the speakers for this session. Thanks, Subhashish. Sorry, I think I spoke too much, too long, took away some of your time. So very quickly, uh, you know, uh, both the speakers, inaugural uh, session speakers are well known. All of you know uh, them already, uh, but just uh, for formality purpose, I'll introduce them. Professor Ramesh Jain and uh, Professor Anurag Agarwal, they're the two uh, luminaries in this field. It's very interesting. Ramesh Jain comes from data science background, computer science and data science background and more interested in health related matters. Anurag is a medical practitioner, come medical researcher, and extremely efficient user of data science in his research and for public health purposes. So it's, uh, they complement extremely well. And uh, you know, thanks to both of them for uh, giving their time for this workshop, as well as for giving these uh, opening talks. So Sir Amesh Jain did his early studies in Nagpur. He's from Nagpur. And uh, then he moved to US. He moved US from East Coast to West Coast, you know, starting from uh, Georgia Tech. And then he went to Michigan, from Michigan to San Diego, and then slightly more north towards Arvine. So that's where he is for the last, I think, uh, maybe 20 years or so now. And uh, he is known for, <clears throat> very interestingly, you know, some of you, all of some of us are here physically, and some of the uh, audience are in the, on the Zoom and maybe some are on the YouTube use of audio and video for communication, for, for seamless you know, communication uh, between people. The very first such idea came up out from his group and he in fact floated a company. He was ahead of his time when people wanted to travel rather than meet over you know, Zoom. And uh, then he also has set up uh, uh, many programs related to use of artificial intelligence in addressing the data of social importance. And uh, over the last few years, he's been extremely passionate, almost obsessed with, uh, with the data related to the food and nutrition connected to the health. So he will be our first speaker. Anurag Agarwal, he did his early um, studies in medicine at Ames, uh, one of the top schools uh, in, uh, in, uh, in medicine in India, and in fact, it's one of the top for the whole world. And then he moved, was in uh, Baylor College of Medicine where he was a resident, a clinician and researcher. And then he moved to Patel Chest Institute, not only as a, 
as a resident doctor. He also did some research for which he was awarded the PhD there. Then he moved to uh, Indian Institute of Integrative Biology uh, and where he is um, uh, researching in the area of respiratory diseases, aging, asthma, basically because of the air pollution related matters and connecting to you know, the metabolism. So the metabolism obviously has other problems associated with uh, you know, disorders in metabolic disorders like diabetes and so forth. So he's basically making connections to all of these things and mitochondrial biogenesis, mitochondrial health at the cellular level connected to individual health, whether respiratory diseases or diabetes, and then connecting at the public health level because diabetes, respiratory disease is a basically public health phenomenon. And so he's sort of looking at from molecules all the way up to public health you know, and connecting extremely efficiently. Of course, when you hear his talk, you will know how efficient he's connecting from molecules to, you know, population level, you know, a, a biological phenomenon, which is, which we always envy Anurag when he talks about some of these things, because we always, as a reductionist biologist, we look at molecules as molecules or cells as cells, but he's the one who can seamlessly walk across the scale and size and complexity of biological system. So with this short introduction, first I request Professor Ramesh Jain to take over the mic. Thanks, Sasi and uh, Subhasis. Uh, I am delighted to be here, particularly after hearing uh, how Ahsoka is trying to build some programs. I am really very happy to be here because uh, what you are trying to do is needed uh, to really extend the boundaries of our knowledge. We need to break walls. And uh, that uh, appears to be the mission that you guys are bringing in here. So I'm really very happy to be here. Uh, I will be talking. Uh, I will be talking about uh, some of the things that uh, I did not know much about uh, these things. Let us say ten years ago. Uh, in the last ten years, I am trying to learn a lot uh, in these areas and try to do something that can help all of us. Uh, so with that, uh, one of the things that we are seeing is major transformations that have been going on to society, not only recently, but over quite a few years, uh, meaning quite a few really uh, generations and uh, we have been going in a direction that uh, many people consider not very sustainable. Now, if we want to change this direction, we have to really think very seriously and start considering what are we going to do about it. And uh, that, that's what uh, we'll try to do this. As you all know, the most obvious thing, the most important thing for us is life. And for life, the most important thing is health. But unfortunately, healthcare is broken in every country. You can go to any country and they will tell you horror stories about healthcare. As I was born here, I spent early life here, I am familiar with healthcare here. I now live in US. Every election in the US is fought over healthcare and the healthcare costs keep going up and life expectancy going, keep going down. And I can tell you similar kind of thing for all the countries, okay? So different countries have different problems, but the fundamental reason that this is happening is that when people talk about healthcare, they are neither talking about health 
nor they are talking about care. When we start thinking about this, we have to start thinking what could be done. We heard from uh, the introductions that we want to apply data science or computer techniques to different things. I have a slightly different perspective. My perspective is fundamentally human needs don't change. For the longest time, food and water, shelter and clothing have been the most fundamental needs. As the civilizations started going in a particular direction, then some new needs started coming in. But for everything, one thing remains common, that we identify a need, and then we think about particular technology or particular technique to solve this thing and come up with a solution. And this solution is then applied to see whether the need is really satisfied. In most cases, each solution results in some problem. It may even create some new situations. So we are always in this particular cycle. Identify a need and find a solution. Lots of tools get developed for this. I consider data science, machine learning, AI, all such tools that you are going to be talking for next few years, but after that, you will talk about something else. Okay? So with that, one of the important thing is for us to remember that technology is developed to help us. Technology is not our goal. Technology is going to solve some of our problems. If it does not, we are going to dump it. Maslow points this very nicely in today's workshop context. What are the basic needs of human beings at different levels? I will not go through this pyramid in details, only point out that uh, the most important thing that he points out is food and water, shelter and warmth. These are the basic needs. Food is particularly important because it provides us energy, it provides us nutrients, okay? and it provides us the most important thing, enjoyment. Okay? That's why even in India, we have been always saying, if you are, do not have correct food to eat, you cannot think of anything else. When you start talking about food systems, then you start thinking about how food systems start affecting each and every aspect of society. And if food systems work correctly, the society progresses. If food systems don't work correctly, we have all kinds of problems. And you are going to hear over the next uh, several talks, what kind of problems exist. Because apparently, there are problems in the food system. There were always problems, and possibly for some time they will always remain the problem. We always consider that the three major concerns of the world related to food, particularly, are hunger, malnutrition, and obesity. You can really consider malnutrition and obesity the same thing. They are really malnutrition. Let's look at health because that's one of the most important thing that uh, we are going to be talking at this workshop. Health needs to be considered at three different levels. You can start either at the top and say planetary health, or you can start at the bottom individual health. And social, societal health sits somewhere in between. But the fact is, these three things are very closely interlinked. And that's what we are going to see. Okay. So uh, let, let's start considering this, that when you are considering planetary health, what happens? We find that we don't realize it commonly, but that's what you are going to be hearing a lot in the talks, 
that environment and individual health are very closely intertwined. Okay. And you will also find out that uh, our food systems are the major contributor to global warming. Okay. What that means is environment affects very strongly individuals and individuals affect very strongly environment. That means what is going on is that this thing can become a cycle. Either it could become a virtuous cycle or it could become a vicious cycle. Obviously, our goal is to make it a virtuous cycle. Unfortunately, many times it takes us towards vicious cycle. It is for us to understand what, where we are going, how do we solve it. Societal health. Many times we don't think about this much. We don't realize that where we live affects our health significantly. And that's why many of the public policies that are designed and implemented consider factors that are going to improve living conditions, city conditions that will result in better health. Effectively, in the last two, three decades, there has been increasing interest in something called SDOH or society, a social determinants of health. Let me explain to you what does that really mean? Social determinants of health do not directly consider how many people are necessarily diabetic in particular area or how many people are having cancer and these things. These things become part of it, but they become secondarily part of it. Directly, it starts considering factors like, as is po pointed out here, uh, uh, as, as you can see, starting from uh, you start considering education, economic stability, social and community context, how people live there and how they interact, neighborhood and built environment, and finally access to healthcare. These are considered social determinants of health. What is interesting is this is shown a very small area in the United States. The light borders that you see are showing the borders of zip codes. Okay. And uh, the circles are showing you the life expectancy in those areas. Okay. Now, when you look at this diagram, there's very, very interesting. Something very, very close to each other can have life expectancy of 80, and here life expectancy is only 55. Okay. This is mind boggling. That's why people started considering that your zip code is really more important than your genetic code. Where you live determines more your health than your genetic uh, determines. So that takes us to the last aspect of the three things, which is possibly the most important aspect, and that is individual health. I don't care what happens to everybody else. I want to worry about my health. I want to be healthy and happy. Okay? Of course. The pandemic has shown us that no, no one of us is an isolated node. We are all linked to each other. What happens in Africa can start affecting you here very easily and very fast. Okay? Uh, what happens in China can start affecting United States as fast or faster. Okay? So with all this kind of things, let's start considering a little bit about the human health. The first problem with the health, as you start considering, and when I told you that uh, healthcare is broken in every country, because in every country, we do not consider health. We consider diseases. We focus on diseases. Okay. What we need to focus is on health. Okay. If we want to talk about healthcare, let's talk about healthcare, not sick care or not disease care. 
Okay. The second thing is health is not an episodic event. Your health is happening at every moment. The moment it starts not happening, you are dead. Okay. So you need to start considering, and that's why the guidance that starts coming to you for health could be 24 seven operator. It is not that once you are going to doctor and doctor is trying to help you, okay? Finally, because all the public policies and governments and everybody starts talking about economy. It has been shown through different mechanisms that health is definitely much more important than economy. So let's consider a concrete case. Nowadays, more than 70% people die because of chronic conditions. Okay. And more than 86% costs are because of these diseases. Okay. Very interesting number. This is only increasing. Why do chronic conditions take place? Wear and tear on the body. But the real reason ultimately boils down to one final simple thing, homeostasis. There's homeostasis going on in all our body. And this is describing to you what homeostasis is. All of us know it, that if our body temperature falls, our body has to do something so that our body temperature doesn't fall dangerously low. Okay. And the same thing happens when the uh, uh, external conditions start increasing the body temperature. If homeostasis is not sufficient to maintain that, then what do you do? You help homeostasis. So, oops. So, if your body cannot deal with falling temperatures, what do you do? You wear more clothes. Same thing in heat. If that it starts happening, then you go to beaches or do something like that. Okay? This is what you are trying to do is you are augmenting homeostasis. And we learned this right from the early days. Remember the basic needs of people? Getting warmth and clothing and things like that. So this is what has been happening. Put it more in technical terms, Norbert Wiener came up with these ideas almost 80 years ago and put all of them together in cybernetics. As you see in cybernetics, effectively it is saying that this deals with control and communication processes, both in animals or living beings and machines. Interestingly enough, the argument is that these processes are exactly the same, whether you are dealing with animals or machines. It is the implementation that is different. The implementation mechanisms are different. Okay? Effectively, what is going on? Very simple. There are sensors. They detect the state of the system, what is happening. There are models because we are dealing with human beings or we are dealing with our problems then these are models of the person, okay? And then there is a control mechanism. What do you do, okay? This is all the systems are. How can we bring this to health? One thing, because we are all used to running experiments and doing all kinds of things, uh, it is very important to remember what Oscar Wilde said 200 years ago. And that is, there is really no concept of society. It is the concept of individual. Individual is not a sample of society. Individual is not a sample of the population. It is the society that is aggregation of individuals. And that makes perfect sense when you are starting to think in terms of uh, how things really happen. And that's the reason that in last few years, 
particularly in last 10 years, at least in health community and in several other areas, they have started talking about this term called N of one. What does N of one mean? Whenever you are running experiments, everybody says, what is your sample size? If you have used 100 people to collect data, your results will be inferior to if you, have, if you would use 1,000, if you use 1 million. Okay. But is that right? Am I an average person? If you are an average and you take the population of the whole body of people, human beings living in the world, then each of us could have one testicle and one breast. Okay. How many of you have that? Okay. So the po point is, this whole idea of taking average and doing this does not make sense when you are dealing with individual problems. You have to consider individual as an individual. That's a very important thing to remember. Because if you are dealing with individuals, then in order to create models, you can collect all these individuals, okay? And based on geographic location and demographics or environmental factors, you can start forming different types of groups and you start using those in your experiments. Okay? So effectively, this is, by focusing on individuals, you can do much better and much more effective job on disease model. Rather than considering disease model, and then when I'm going to a doctor, doctor looks at me and says, oh, he's a 70 year old Indian guy. Hey, come on, there must be several million 70 year old Indian guy. Are they all the same? It all depends on the geographic condition, demographic condition, and all this kind of thing. Remember, zip code determines a lot more about my health than anything else, okay? So, if you, you co collect individual data, then you can aggregate it into any kind of cohorts. And this is a very interesting topic for discussion, okay? But equally interesting topic is, if we are going to deal with individuals and trying to control their health, what are the important? WHO puts round numbers telling you that in order for being healthy, that's what they call what makes us healthy. It is 10% access to healthcare or care, 20% genetics, environment is 20%, and your lifestyle or behavior is 50%. Consider the fact that your genetics is also influenced by environment and your lifestyle. That means that 20% becomes even less than 20% because of epigenetics. Okay? So effectively you realize that more than 70% of your health depends on your lifestyle. Okay? Now, let's look at something very interesting. Where do we spend our resources in terms of being healthy? Every country, every society talks about hospitals and healthcare, healthcare costs. We spend 88% on medical services. Okay. Look at this, 88% we are spending on 10%. Well, on this 50%, we spend 4%. Okay. Isn't that interesting? That tells you what could be done. What could be done is very simple. Go to healthy lifestyle. 3,000 years ago, Hippocrates famously said, let food be thy medicine. If you go to Ayurveda, you go to the Chinese medicine, you go to Yunani medicine, go to any medical ancient system. And they emphasize the importance of food on your health. Okay. So, Let's consider those things. Okay. Now, based on these things, can we de design a navigator? 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 
whenever you wanted to go to some place, you struggled with your maps. And you tried to find where you are going to go. And even then you got lost. You had all the instructions, but you got lost. Now your navigation system, even if you want to get lost, doesn't let you get lost. Okay? Even if you keep on making mistakes, they keep on correcting you. Can we do similar kind of things for health? Can we develop a personal health navigator that will guide you to better health? Remember, we are not saying remove diseases because I may want to run a half marathon in next uh, six months. What do I need to do that? Or I'm out of practice. I don't play tennis nowadays. I want to start playing tennis. Or I may have much simpler ambition. I want to be able to play uh, cricket with my grandson. What do I need to do to be able to do these things? Can this system give me real-time information like the navigation system tells, there's too much traffic here or this road is closed, take this other alternative route. And can this kind of systems be available to get you to optimal state, health state, independent of who you are, how wealthy you are. Right now, if you happen to be Virat Kohli, then he has six people looking at how his heart rate is working and how his social things are working and everything. If you haven't seen this, see the movie Beyond Borg, and it describes how eight to nine people were always following him each and every moment. And that's what made him thin his star. Okay. But can we do it for everybody? The answer is yes. That's what had been our dream uh, for last several years. And we started working on this at uh, my lab there, that uh, institute that I founded. But when we tried to do this, there are two major challenges, estate estimation and personal model. These two things are difficult. If we do this, this is what the kind of system we will have using your wearable devices, using your mobile phones and things like that. You should be able to do this. Just one slightly more complex diagram, but uh, we'll not go through all the details about this. Uh, this system is showing how this is. With all due respect to doctors, doctors usually are nothing but recommendation engines. Doctors look at this thing, what are the knowledge sources, what is the health state, and based on that, they give you recommendation. That's where their job ends. But the real job is collecting all the data, understanding who you are, building your personal model using genetics, using your environment, and all these things, determining your health state. And after this, Unlike the current practices that where doctor has told you what to do and you go home and forget about it. Who wants to care about doctors? Uh, more than half people, people uh, never listen or never buy medicine prescribed to them. Amazing, but nothing can be done. But if remember life is health is happening every moment. Navigation systems, when they, you are turning them on, they are continuously tracking you. Let's do that. Let's do this continuous tracking. So if you do not follow the instructions of the system, then the system knows that you are not following the instructions. So either it will give you the new instructions or will build your model that this person doesn't like to uh, do this particular activity. Let's suggest the other activity. Okay. And it will also have a dashboard that will be going to not only your doctors and nurses, but maybe to your family members and friends also. And all that information can be taken care of. So one of the things that you realize is that in controlling all these things, most important lifestyle factor is the food. You can ask people whether you do exercise or not, whether you slept well or not. But if somebody is not eating, there is only so many days the person is going to survive. 
Okay? And that's why it is very important, but it's very complex too. Very, very complex. But we can do what we have started doing, and that is leave the complexity to technology. Let technology deal with the complexity. And that's what we start doing. Okay, so let's see how an individual looks at food. For an individual, unlike most people who talk about food and health, for them, food is nutrition and this thing and that thing. They only talk about health. But for an individual, what is important? Enjoying. Food arguably is the thing that people start enjoying from the point that they are born till they die. There's nothing else, not even sex, that people enjoy all through their life. So from individual perspective, enjoyment and biology, and then you start building different levels to going towards the environment level. All these levels uh, start affecting. What is very important is this famous thing. This is the famous dilemma that you face. You want to eat samosas and jalebis, but your doctor tells you, don't eat carbohydrates and don't eat sugar. So what do you do? Are you going to eat broccoli and spinach? Okay. And that's where the big problem comes in. That is what I like to eat is usually not what my body wants me to eat. So how do we solve this problem? Nowadays in computer science, but earlier in our life, okay, now it is computer science, but otherwise also, we don't like to study and do anything. We want somebody to come and tell us what is the right thing to do. The whole society is based on that. So uh, can we do this? Here, so in food, there are three important components. What is the item that you are going to eat? Who the person is? And what is the context? And based on this, you start determining what you should be eating when. So there are these three very important factors. They result in three major challenges for us. Number one, can we build personalized food model? Believe me, all the things that you read about food and how it affects may not be true for you. Each person's body is different. I ran some experiments on myself and I found, and I started telling that to my wife all the time. And she says, yes, yes, you know more than doctors. And she makes fun of me because I found that based on Dexcom, which was measuring my uh, sugar content, body sugar, blood sugar content every five minutes, ice cream is less glycemic for me than rice is. So I said, I'm not going to eat rice. I'm going to eat only ice cream all the time. Okay. Wonderful thing for me. You guys may also discover something like that. Okay. Can we prepare a world food atlas? Whenever you go to any place, the biggest problem is where do I go to eat and what? Because there are both these aspects. Nowadays, we have all become a little bit sensitive to health. So we want to eat not too much junk food. But at the same time, we like to eat food that we will enjoy. Okay? So where are we going to find? Now, Google Maps and all the maps, we have enormous detailed information. Can we put together that kind of information about food? We don't have time today to discuss in details, but they also depend on food knowledge graphs. That means you take any food item, starting from ingredient to the finished dishes. Can you find out how it's going to taste? And can you find out what its effect is on health? Okay. So based on these kind of things, if you can build these three things, then we can start solving this problem. Granted, all these three are very challenging problems. But then Sasi mentioned that he is going to support 
solving these complex problems. If we give him easy problem, he's going to say, go away, go to Delhi and solve easy problems. If you want to be in Sonipat, you will have to solve some difficult problem. So we'll give him these problems to solve. Yeah. Most important factors in lifestyle are building personal model, food personal model. And everybody has known this. People started putting their food logs or personal food diaries. If you go and come to tell the doctors, they start asking you, what did you eat when you ate and all these things. Now we are starting to apply technology to this. So can we start building these models? Currently, there's no technique that can do this. My watch can tell you me how many times or how many steps I took in a day, how much exercise I did and all this kind of thing. But there is no system that can tell you how, what you ate, how much you ate, what were the nutrients in this. Can we build this? Lots of people are trying to do this. Uh, I'm personally involved with multiple groups. My own PhD students and other groups are building this food logger. Effectively, anytime you eat anything, you can either uh, tell through voice text or pictures or, and uh, the system will record where you are. Based on that, it can find out nutrition values and all this kind of thing. We'll not go in detail, but that kind of thing. But the problem is food systems are very complex. They have to consider individual health, but if you want to affect the society and if you want to affect planetary health, then you have to consider other factors also. Environmental health, economic vitality, and social equity. So when you are trying to de design a food recommendation engine, it is not only what you should be eating and that will be enjoyable and good, going to be good for your health. Can we bring in these factors also in our food knowledge graph and put those things in our World Food Atlas? That becomes a very important thing. As we all know, Computing tools are used to unify different fields to solve different problems. And we always start looking at things at three levels, data, information, and knowledge. I don't have to explain to you what these things are. Most of us know these things, okay? And that's what we want to do, build computing infrastructure to store, collect a lot of knowledge, and then in order to get the information and to solve the problem, we get the data, real-time data. Remember, health is going to work 24 seven. That is true, not only for you. It's true for environment, it's true for cities, it's true for everything. Every living thing has to be like that. So how do we do this? The problem is there's a lot of disinformation. There's a lot of harmful knowledge that is put in the system. And the data, how do you really consider the quality of data and deal with it? Let's deal with the, the uh, consider some simple aspects of this. Food is very important. As we have been discussing, food is equal to life. What I did not discuss in details is food is also equal to money. Every time I have come to India, I get very disturbed when I see that you go anywhere and all the things in the, even the villages the, in the shops, everything that is hanging there is the junk food. In small packages, $10 and uh, 10 uh, rupees and things like that, okay? Now there is also food is power. Based on religion, you are told to eat particular kinds of food. Based on countries, they try to control the food lines for different countries and things like that. And because of that, there is no wonder that there is no other area where you have more disinformation than about food. Many food experts will tell you that everything that you know, almost everything, more than 90% things are wrong. Okay. So how do we deal with this kind of thing? That's one source. Second thing is when you start dealing with data. Data can be collected in many different ways. And when you are analyzing the data, there are 
several sources of help. We all know this, we can read about this, but I wanted to bring to us in this today's discussion, two points, which are very important in my opinion. One is called Hammer syndrome, and another is called drunk man under the lamp post. Okay. You know Hammer syndrome? We already started listening about the Hammer syndrome a lot, particularly in last few years. What used to be called Hammer is now called machine learning. And that's what it is. If I have a hammer, I will go and try to solve every problem that you give me using the hammer. Nowadays, you give the people any problem and they want to solve it using machine learning and AI. Don't get me wrong. I've, I was the founding director of Michigan's AI lab in 1987. I became fellow of AI in 1995. Okay. So I'm not against those things. I'm against considering it a hammer. Okay. The second problem is this cartoon. Somebody loses something. They, you may have lost it somewhere, but where are you are looking for it? Under the lamppost. Why you are looking under the lamppost? Because you can see there. You cannot see in the dark. Okay. You do that all the time. Particularly we scientists do it all the time. We like to go and get the data that has been collected easily or that can be collected easily. We don't do what is described here. What is described here? Look at the real data, not just the conveniently available data. Okay. Before we collect the data, we need to redefine the right data to collect. Okay. So the whole process is starts before you get to the data. Okay. Otherwise, if your data is wrong, it's not going to give you any good result. So in my opinion, my interpretation is that this workshop is to explore relationships among health, food, nutrition, and data. We want to understand challenges. We do not want to say what are the solutions before we have understood the challenges. Okay? And uh, we want to do this in the context of India, and then only we want to take it out. Because you can never understand the whole pro world's problem. You can understand the problems in your backyard. So if in place of India, we said we are going to consider only Haryana or only this part of the world, that's perfectly fine. But let's start there. And then de develop in data infrastructure to address these problems. And why de develop data infrastructure to address these problems? Because until you have data infrastructure, people don't want to work with you. They are not motivated to work with you. When you have data infrastructure, then people get much more motivated because now you have the data. Remember lamppost pr problem? It's exactly the same problem. Then you are the lamppost so everybody, every scientist wants to come under the lamppost. And that, that's what you start doing, okay? These are the goals of the workshop that were specified. What should we do? Or what I want to do working with uh, you guys in this area is understand the problem in the right context. I'm going to be listening to today and tomorrow just to understand these things. And then identify clearly two or three possibly two, but you start with one challenge clearly and address this by building correspondingly food models for that particular situation, food graphs and food atlas for those things. Uh, this may not be very easy, but it will be fun. And that's what I would like to do. So this is what, where I will start. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. So Anurag will start. You can start sharing your screen and okay. 
Then we'll have. I guess you can time. see my slides by now. Yeah. Yes, we can see. Great. And it's wonderful to speak right after Professor Jen because, in many ways, I would like to take off from a very important observation that he made. That ice cream led to, inc uh, you know, less increase in his blood sugar compared to rice. There was beautiful work done in Israel uh, some time ago, where they took stool samples from a variety of people and gave them all standardized meals, and they monitored everybody's blood sugar, and they found that different people had different rises in sugar with different types of food. There was no universal. thing that you could say that eat eggs that is better or you know rice is always bad or ice cream is always bad <clears throat> and they found in the end that the microbiome uh, identified by next generation sequencing and classification of the people could tell them what to eat in terms of their personalized food recommendations but now how does that link to the title i have here today digital transformation healthcare and governance growing up in a digital world you know the more we talk about data the more we also automatically mean the data would have to be shared you know generated shared given analyzed used to make a difference and there is nothing called data without governance and there is nothing called easy data generation without true digital transformation so let me come to what i think is really critical the first very important thing that all of us must realize is that the world has changed there are people in this room who may have never perhaps seen a film camera in fact if one was to show them film they might wonder what the hell is this and digital life has far outpaced digital health in that professor jain is correct today your ability to generate data at any point in whatever you are doing from morning to evening and your likelihood of using something digital is so different from the way you know life is in terms of when you go to a healthcare system and get treated i mean what we used to be doing in medical school in 1990s is not very different from what my daughter is doing in medical school today in 2020 and while you know everything you're doing in any other part of life has changed completely but here comes the challenge if you want to talk about solutions you have to cater to the people on the top you have to cater to the people at the bottom you have to come up with solutions that bridge digital health divides <clears throat> and this is true for anything you know food nutrition actual care inside icus and you must realize that this world exists in three circles there are places still looking at digitization they will not have food bloggers and food apps at most you can write down things on a piece of paper scan them even if they were to have a smartphone which we often talk about the entire family will have one smartphone it will be dominantly be used by typically by the father the children and the mother would have much less access but that's a progressively smaller part of india the next one is digitalization the actual workflow is digital and that's for many of us you know when we visit a corporate hospital shown here at the bottom starting from the orders going you know to what you know that food tray that you are getting everything might be entered into a computer all this data is available perhaps data lakes can be created and you might be able to access them but even that's not enough what professor jain was really talking about you know wearing a smart watch charting a digital personal health navigator and perhaps even a centralized system that knows who you are and india has actually built the core of that called the india stack right all your financial transaction identity are purely digital you could interact with an entire ecosystem knowing who you are and what you need specifically for your personal digital health goals if you had the right devices connected to the right internet and with the right identification systems and of course if you had the money to pay for it all but the point is forget about money this digitally transformed healthcare system will become a reality uh, what dr jain talked about doctors being recommendation engines is to some degree true i mean you in, you ingest data 
and you, you know, put out advice. Of course, my surgical colleagues would point out the doctors are far more than that, but that's a different question for a different day. And ultimately, recommendation engines have to be trained and we'll come towards the end regarding some of those issues. So what's the first fundamental of digital health? Health is the better half of digital health. Digital is nice, health is critical. The goal remains to improve access, quality, affordability, equity, and justice. Digital is not the only way there. If you don't have enough doctors, if you don't have enough drugs being produced, if you don't have enough surgeries being done, you can do every possible digital that you want, but the impact will be small. But you can, whether you are in the developing world or the developed world, make maximum use of your infrastructure and increase health services using that limited skilled manpower in the most effective way, if you imagine it right. If you are trying to promote health so that less people need health care, that certainly is a very good start and food and nutrition are critical there. In many of these ways, which are, you know, <clears throat> this is by the Tata Managing Director, Chandra. Digital is not a solution by itself, just a bridge to solving analog problems. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that soon, digital will become a determinant of health. And that's important. It's really important for Ashoka as a university where humanities and science come together to realize that assuming Professor Jain is correct, and access to these kinds of trackers and gold finders and navigators will determine how healthy you are, then effectively you are saying that digital will become a determinant of health. Now, if digital was to become a determinant of health, you would come up with many important ethical questions. And many of these questions were debated by this Lancet Financial Times Commission that I co-chair. And we had representation pretty much from around the six terms. And for those of you interested in our recommendations, that's an issue of Lancet published last year. But fundamentally what we do point out that access to health information and services is going to become increasingly reliant upon digital technologies and data, which means that digital access and literacy must now be recognized as a determinant of health and made available to all, which also points out that universal affordable connectivity is also going to become almost like a basic right. India has done phenomenally well, actually, in terms of the basic cost of data, accessibility of such things to young people. And I think we could take a lead forward, given that we also have very good systems of food recommendations, ideas regarding what constitutes good health and wellness promotion in our traditional medical systems, which are completely integratable with digital health. And while the National Digital Health Mission was not necessarily thinking of food, the reality was they were talking about every person having a digital health ID to which their own health records are tagged, to which they have access, to which they can take from point A to point B, where the government creates a digital public good for a system of maintaining and integrating these records. And everybody else can use freely available APIs to create cross-functional services. If you look at the way India has done Aadhaar, India has done UPI, how easy it is in India to make payments for anybody, not only people with fancy credit cards, anybody to make transactions using their phones, you realize that this idea of looking at health in a very digital way can be transformative. Digital health is a public good, is a really important concept. I too, like Professor Jain, will spend actually very little time on ML. There are multiple types. All of them are useful. Some more useful than others. What I find pretty interesting to me is not the fact that you can classify diabetic retinopathy by a snapshot of the retina, but that you can tell the gender of the person without looking into their eyes before you get the retina snapshot. My medical friends, I myself, cannot possibly tell you the gender of a patient from a snapshot of their retina. But the very fact it can be done with near 100% accuracy tells you there is a pattern there, subtle, that computers can see. And such ability to find subtle patterns 
will surely be useful even when you talk about foods and so on. Already you have ways in which we can interact with computers for symptoms. You can have very similar ways for foods. This was used by the National Health Services in UK to keep people from unnecessarily visiting doctors and overloading the services. People liked it. I'm not saying it's perfect, but that's the way things will go. Far more fundamental advances are being made. It's not just about apps. If you want to solve protein structures, if you know the components of your food at a molecular level, you want to know what could bind what. Today, AI will help you better in solving a protein structure than many structural biologists. If you become sick and you need a new antibiotic, today you have Halicin, the first antibiotic in a sense discovered by AI. But what I'm gonna to come to now is digital transformation of biology. And I'm gonna come back to food and health and how we look at it. The biggest change in health will come from computational insights into the processes of life. But one thing I'm very clear on, it will not be computers finding things. It'll be humans finding things via computers. There is a world of difference between two things. Artificial intelligence is too dumb for the time being, at least, for it to really find anything. It takes very smart people using it to do stuff that would be difficult otherwise. This is a simple model of bench to bedside. You have a question, you come here, the scientist tells you something, you go back to the clinic, the clinic guy, clinical guy comes back to basic research. Reality of all data, all efforts looks like this. And that's where you need your navigators. Navigating something that looks like this is difficult without computers. And that's a good way of thinking about how you use them. And I'm gonna not speak too much about mitochondria, an area that I work on very relevant to diet, health, food, very well known as a central effector in metabolic disease. Before our labs work, they were not very well known in lung diseases, particularly asthma, but there was plenty of evidence. What you eat, your obesity status, your mitochondrial health, importantly determines your risk for asthma. That's not the topic I really want to talk on today. So I'll just narrow it down to where data comes in. We discovered, and this is one of the papers my lab is well known for, that mesenchymal stem cells form nanotubes with cells that have defective mitochondria, donate healthy mitochondria, mitos without borders, and rescue these cells. As we did more and more of this work, we asked ourselves a very simple question. You know, what if rather than donating mitochondria, we had mitochondria-like things in our body, talking to the mitochondria in our cells. And you ask yourself, what are mitochondria? Mitochondria, in one theory, by Margulis, is an internalized bacteria. Okay, so they are the bacteria inside your cells. Well, where else are there bacteria? Everywhere, especially in your gut. There are as many or 10 times more, depending on who you ask, bacterial cells in your body than human cells. 90% of all DNA, if you were to grind people up and just extract DNA, would turn out to be of microbial origin. If you were to look at metabolites, small metabolites circulating in your blood, 20% of them come from your gut microbiome. So why is it not considered that the bacteria in your gut are speaking to the most important determinant, determinants of the metabolism of fats and sugars in your cells, the mitochondria. Could it be that it's not just about the bacteria eating things and leaving something for you? It is actually about bacteria sending signals that changes your entire metabolism. And there are plenty of evidences I could tell you to support this line of thought, but here is something interesting. When you think of an idea like this, Prashant Bajpayee, a chemical engineer who was in my lab, decided to ask a really simple question. Look at all reported diseases on PubMed, look at everything with a mitochondrial connection, look at all recent papers that have a gut microbiome connection, and look at the overlap. If the two are linked, you should see a very strong overlap, and you will not get much bigger overlaps than what you see here. Out of you know, the recent diseases being linked to gut microbiome, 
the vast majority have previously been linked to mitochondria. But then comes the question, how are you going to use this? Can you simulate these things in computers? Yes, you can. Using the genomes of the gut microbes, you can figure out what metabolites can they create. Using mitochondrial reaction systems, you can understand what all reactions they have. When we started, there were only about 350 MAP reactions by the time we ended with a huge help from Karthik from IIT Madras, over one and a half thousand. Proper flux balance analysis could be done across the reactions and you could actually identify metabolites likely to be coming from the bacteria that could be influencing your mitochondrial function. This work is ongoing, but we have good initial data and it's led to some very interesting insights. I will not again speak about that today, but very nice work uh, from IIT Madras and from my institute. And you could find that you know, a bunch of important mitochondrial transport reactions were being modulated by these bacterial metabolites. So which is why I fully believe Professor Jan when he says that for him, ice creams are less risky than rice. The other important thing that we learned in a study we did with PGI Chandigarh is that the duodenal microbiome seems to be far more relevant to the glycemic status of people compared to the fecal microbiome. You heard his example in the end about people looking under a lamp. Well, people looking under a lamp towards fecal microbiome, so it's because shit is easy to collect. But if you really want to get to the part where the microbes are in close proximity to the intestine, where the walls are permeable, and the metabolites will go in very easily. Perhaps you should be looking at the duodenum. It is difficult to do, so people don't do it. And that's exactly the example of, you know the key is somewhere else, but you choose to look under a light because it's easy. The other part about hammers is also possibly true. Uh, once you know how to do a microbiome and a fecal microbiome, you simply start hammering every possible disease, saying, I want to look at the connection with the fecal microbiome. But coming now to the end of my talk and talking about how these things are far more relevant than anything else. If you ask people, what is the strongest risk factor for a premature heart attack and death? Most people will tell you cholesterol. Interestingly, it's not. Two very important papers came out of the Framingham study where almost all of your initial heart literature comes from. One talked about cholesterol, one talked about lower lung volumes the total amount of air you can breathe in to a full breath and then breathe out. Forced vital capacity. Your forced vital capacity being low is a stronger predictor of your risk of dying prematurely from heart attacks rather than your cholesterol. But it's easy to change cholesterol. So the entire world got interested in cholesterol. In fact, it's called vital capacity because it indicates a vitality. Who has the lowest forced vital capacity in the world? for the same height, age, gender, socioeconomic status. South Asians, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladesh. We have the worst lung function in the world and Indian children born in America have better lung function than their parents. So exactly what was being discussed about zip code, a lot of it, a lot of it is about your environment and upbringing. So in a study that we did around the country, because India is genetically diverse and we have diverse geographies, but in a single type of government school called Jawahar Navodaya Vidyalaya, we looked at two and a half thousand people all across India to understand what drives bad lung function. We found genetics was important. So people who are called Tibeto Burman have far better lung function than Gavidians. That seems genetic. But more importantly, what we found was thin people with high inflammatory cytokines that sound like, we didn't measure it, that are very close to what is described for people with too much bacteria. It's called environmental entropathy in their guts, upper guts, duodenum, that area. Elevation of these inflammatory markers, suggesting too many bacteria and very thin people exactly on exactly the same diet as everybody else. There's a boarding school, everybody gets the same food. These were the important factors. So what I'm gonna end by saying, the future of health is certainly going to be big biomedicine. 
big data, AI, human cell atlas, single cell sequencing, DNA, genomics, understanding health from the bottom up, the blueprint and the bricks, you know, before the building. But a lot of it will also come from devices, from measurements, from data that does not necessarily go grounds up. It comes top down from the physiology. Basic things happening to human beings in N of 1 that was talked about already to you. And this P6 medicine, participatory, will be the key word. People need to participate. Precision health, another word. Now it's precision public health. That's the sixth part. And we will come to a time when mutating normal genes can become a therapy. Famous names on the left, probably another Nobel Prize in the future on the right. She found that black people eating high cholesterol food in Texas, those of them who have very low cholesterol have a natural mutation in this gene. Today, targeting this gene in monkeys with one shot can give you low cholesterol for years. And antibodies to this are already become part of therapy. But we need to know which genes to target. We need to collect a huge amount of data and we don't want to be wrong. That's the trouble with data. Very easy to go wrong. And in data we trust, maybe. And then when you collect data, respect for human autonomy, privacy, and ethics are fundamental to health, not data science. Unbiased collection of biased data does not eliminate bias. Large and large and larger amounts of data does not remove bias. It all depends on your way. So I don't think data scientists will really solve the problems. I've always been very, very skeptical of that. I personally think people coming from a biomedicine background who learn about data and I work with data scientists will be solving these problems. Too much scope for data scientists to go wrong. And the best example I can tell you is this one. An algorithm built by AI people in America to look at who is getting sicker and needs more care. Beautiful paper by Obermeyer in Science 2019. What they found is that Blacks consistently seem to have more active chronic conditions to get exactly the same score on the AI. Now, an AI is not discriminatory, right? It does not care about black and white. It's not a human being. So it turns out that the people who programmed the AI used a proxy for changes in expenditure, changes in medical expenditure as a proxy for becoming sicker. It makes sense, right, to a person who comes from a data background. But people who come from a data background are not necessarily always aware of the inequities of health. And they fail to realize that a black person has to get sicker before they get care in America. These small things make me certain that AI and data science will need oversight from medicine. And without it, it cannot progress at the same time. Medicine should not become a restrictive fence around the possibilities of data science and AI. And particularly when we talk about wellness, you are free from many of these oversights, but if we are talking health, we must take it seriously. So with that, thank you all very much. I would end by this very simple point. Change is critical and adapting to it is critical. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ramesh Jain and uh, uh, Professor Anurag Agarwal for wonderful talks. Now it's open for questions, both the talks. Whether you are on the Zoom or here, those who are in Zoom can raise your hand. Well, those who are physically here also can raise your hand. Can you find out who is it? Because it's, there's also a question in the Q. So I see a question on QA. Are there examples of biases in data and social domain resulting bias decisions in India? India hasn't so far used AI for any of these things. And if there are any, it is probably down to insurance companies who certainly haven't shared any of it yet. So there's a hand raised here. 
Okay, okay Aparna, go ahead. Ask your question. Was she? Her question was in the Q and A. Yeah, yeah. Aparna's question I have already just answered. No good examples in India yet. Ah, will adding a bias factor while collecting bias data make the programs more efficient? There are ways of removing biases. That is absolutely correct. But to be very honest, the right way is to collect unbiased data. And if not able to collect unbiased data by, by design, and you're simply collecting real world data, measure as many of the factors as possible and adjust for them. Both, both work. Uh, and I completely understand that when you collect real world data, bias is likely to be there and recognizing it is important. But I'm going to come back to state one more point over here. This is exactly what you see for modeling during COVID-19. The ability to recognize bias and errors comes from expertise in the field. And that is something that pure data science and computational science may not often bring. So a interdisciplinary team, preferably including humanities, is important. Soham Dave wants to ask a question. Please unmute him. Ah, participatory medicine. Okay, I can give you an example. So for example, there is a rare disease. Let's take a very simple example of a real condition. And you want to find out whether a particular intervention works. A classical way would be that you first design a large study, recruit a certain number of people, create a randomized control trial to the intervention. In participatory, you might simply create a website of people like us. And many people sharing a common medical problem could decide to share their lives. They could decide to undergo many of the simple interventions being talked about while maintaining symptom cards. They could design data collection in such a way. It would be biased. You could argue that only people with digital access were able to become part of this participatory group, excluding all the people who are poor and from India. But you could still get the big signals right. So when people participate voluntarily in the process of generating, sharing data and experience, it is called uh, participatory medicine. And it can extend to anything, actually. I see another question. Uh, how to become a better data scientist understand biases. You know, this problem has been troubling me forever. I can't give you an answer suddenly to something I don't know the answer to. But I'll share my thoughts with you. I always asked myself, so my original plan was to go to IIT and do computer science. I went to Ames instead. And I always asked myself, was it better to become a doctor while maintaining interest in computer? Or would have been better to go into computer science and start learning health. My personal impression is if you're going to overall steer the direction, and Professor Jan may completely disagree with me on this one, better to start with medicine and then come to compute. And some really good people I know who have done actually degrees in both, who are probably the gold standard. It's harder the other way around because knowledge of bias in biomedicine is very non-intuitive unless you have done biomedical research. So, uh, Professor Ramesh, did you want to add to this question? Just yeah, if you slide it, then there's a question by Aparna Joshi. And uh, though the question is asked to me, I think Anurag is more qualified to answer that. No, no, not it, the first one. No, Go not the first down. one. Be below that, there is one question that he cannot. Further see. down. Uh, yeah. So uh, if you go down in that list, there is the fifth question. One more. After Utkash Kohli. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, Aparna, is that yeah. your question on supported by data scientists? You, Dr. Jen, you want me to take that one? No, the, the question is, are there any upcoming activities by Indian yes, there are. and supported by data scientists? to tackle malnutrition in India. 
Uh, yes, there are. I'm here to learn exactly this problem. Okay. Uh, exactly so, this data. So the National Institute of Nutrition is generating very large data sets. I do not know exactly what they're doing, uh, but along with other scientific institutes that I believe include engineering institutions as well, or they may have their own data science statistical people. They do plan to look at their very large volume of nutrition data to tackle malnutrition problem. I don't know any more detail than that, but it's NIN. It's an ICMR Institute. The last part, maybe both of you can answer. What about fields other than healthcare where biases may exist? Wait a minute. Say one more question. Oh, yes. The last one. Last one. I, Professor Jan, can take this one. I'm better with healthcare than other fields. Oh, my. Uh, in, in fact, this is a general question, and the answer is almost in every area that you can think about, data collection is very biased because uh, human beings, we are very subjective animals. Um, and uh, when we develop algorithms, we directly or indirectly bring in those factors uh, right there. And that's why in the last few, in fact, a few years, uh, people are talking a lot about fairness of um, uh, machine learning. It's starting from the training data to the features that are used are considered to be if you are not very careful, biased. So you can, in, in, in fact, introduce bias at every level if you are not very careful. And that's a very challenging problem that's being addressed now. And let me answer one question by Prisha Kapoor on the participatory. How would you assure adherence to the criteria? See, that actually has always been the divide. You can't, right? I mean, if somebody logs in and tells you I'm a four-year-old, I mean, a four-year-old baby and is doing something complicated, you can tell it's a false. But you can't really distinguish between a 12-year-old male uh, on you know, a chat versus a 60-year-old female. You can't. And if in these communities you were to ask people to self-verify them, it doesn't always work. So almost all of these trials tend to be of the type that are based on the premise of being able to become bigger and scale faster and relying upon some degree of, uh, you know, being able to discriminate, uh, you know, people who are real because these tend to be communities and in communities, people can identify red flags based on experience, but these are genuine problems. So anybody who tries this approach has a problem compared to a proper randomized controlled trial and on what we call the evidence tree, this kind of evidence would be a lower quality evidence than a proper RCT. Okay, uh, thanks uh, uh, Ramesh and Anurag. I think in the interest of time, we'll stop here. Those who have questions or comments, please send uh, on the chat box or q and or by email to the organizers. We will circulate them and get some answers also for them. So uh, we'll have a, a 15 minutes, a 10 minutes break rather. Uh, we'll, so we'll get back again uh, quarter past four for the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Richa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ah, so good. So maybe we just um, take two more minutes before we get you started. Okay. Yeah, sure. None of my panelists are here. They were here all in the last session, and uh, I just have to get them back on. Yeah. So um, maybe you call them. Saurav starts first, so he is here. Correct. Correct. Okay, Sudha is here. Great. Sudha Hi, Sudha. So I'll get people back. Just give me a minute to get people. <coughs> sure, sure. Uh, hi, Sudha. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you and see you. Great, great. Okay, okay I'll. Uh, I think Dr. Shatrugna was here in the last session. Um, maybe I'll just call her. Let me see. Yeah. Yes, she was here. So you get her back and I get people back from their samosas outside. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's uh, get started with the session on uh, food and nutrition. So I'll uh, hand over to Richa Kumar. Richa is a, a professor at IIT Delhi. She is a social anthropologist who has been working on uh, uh, food, agriculture, agriculture policy, and nutrition. And uh, um, over to you, Richa. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. And it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I think uh, all of our panelists are here. Uh, I just wanted to make sure Professor Bagler is also here. Um, offline, I think. Um, but uh, Professor Banerjee, maybe we can, uh, we can figure this out. But uh, I welcome all of you to the panel, the first panel of uh, the two-day session that we have which is specifically looking at uh, food and nutrition and its linkages to data. Uh, and we have a very nice set of panelists here from different disciplinary backgrounds uh, coming together. Um, I'll briefly introduce each panelist as they begin to speak. Um, and uh, we'll begin with uh, Professor Saurabh Paul from IIT Delhi, my own colleague uh, on campus. Um, Saurabh completed his PhD in economics uh, from the University of British Columbia. Uh, and his work broadly focuses on uh, issues re related to caste and labor mobility, trade policy, preferences, nutrition, gender and violence, among other questions. Uh, and he looks at how changes in the Indian economy have affected the most vulnerable sections of Indian society. Uh, and Saurabh will be sharing with us his work broadly around the NSSO uh, data related to nutrition uh, and uh, gaps in it and broadly also trying to set the stage for the larger questions of this session. Uh, so Saurabh, may I please invite you to begin? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Richa. So uh, Richa, could you please just remind me exactly at 12 minutes so that I can... I'll do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I change it here? Okay, so uh, let me just uh, uh, quickly go to 
the first two slides would be much more like broad and many of us we know exactly uh, the things which are there but uh, i'm i'm just uh, assuming that some of us we are we are looking at these statistics for the first time so there is some something called calorie consumption puzzle it is there for last almost uh, 20 years uh, yeah. so uh, what we know so far here is this i mean this summarizes it so sometime from early 1970s uh, to till very recently the per capita calorie calorie consumption has declined okay so this is something we we found from nsso data and something is perplexing here because there is a concept called calorie consumption curve which essentially uh, looks into the relationship between uh, income level and uh, calorie consumption it is usually positively sloped that means as you get richer you tend to consume more ca calorie but it does not hold good for longitudinal at the macro level that means when the country as a whole is uh, uh, getting richer uh, then for almost for all income groups the calorie level has declined in indian economy that's the that's the puzzle thing puzzle puzzling thing we we are talking about so it is it has declined for all income groups over time and uh, uh, the, the 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 question here is that why why this puzzle is so important because we know that uh, the the famine may be history but malnutrition is not i mean we are emphasizing even from for the inter, from the uh, introductory uh, session also we looked into it so basic statistics if you look into look at the data from nfhs 4 uh, and nfhs 5 you see that almost 21% children below 5 years of age uh, they are wasted 38% stunted 36% they are underweight and uh, the recently nfhs 5 data it shows that at the state level out of 17 states almost in 11 states stunting rate has increased severely wasted has increased in 13 states and underweight has increased in 11 states and remember it's out of 17 states and also there is dual burden of poor nutrition because obesity is also rising okay uh, nearly across all states for the for, for the age group between 15 to 49 it has increased so this is what we know from from the data but what we do not know is this and this is where i would like to emphasize and draw your attention to and then later at the end in question answer we would like to see that how data scientists can uh, can address this issue uh, and what are the challenges we may face here so the question here is that why do not we see that any significant development in nutritional status despite high economic growth and poverty alleviation and some of these things we already discussed in in the previous session so uh, one of the pioneer work by deter and dres they actually gave some thought provoking explanation that why this calorie consumption curve is falling down so one is that the calorie needs has fallen and the second is the squeeze in the household food budget so but but if so out of these two explanations i mean there are many other explanations but out of these two explanations which one is more uh, appropriate or more contextual uh, it will fit with the data we do not know clearly so some work has been done i mean one of my work is like shift in taste and the second one is rise in cost uh, efficiency so without going into detail uh, what what we found here is that the most plausible explanation is essentially uh, the squeeze in the household budget okay so uh, now this is something we 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 would like to kind of set the stage that why looking into dietary quality is important because as you know that when economy is growing i mean you have several things the first four most important thing which we have uh, listed here like rapid urbanization or irresistible demonstration effect or aggressive marketing these are the common things we talk about but also something we this is important that agricultural diversity and and how it is related to food consumption pattern uh, so over the time what we see that inferior good became more inferior whereas households appear to be less selective uh, in choosing superior quality diet or nutri nutrient rich food and also income elasticity is for protein rich protein rich food also decrease so that means uh, uh, the sensitivity of your demand with respect to your food has has fallen and also there is a drop in drop in the share of calorie from staples and it was mostly uh, matched by compensated by rise in the share from the poor quality uh, diets like beverages edible oils and sugars and uh, and 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 you know that some there is some evidence that taste and living standard it led to composition of the food demand and diet quality so uh, what do you see then in in terms of diet quality transition uh, so diet quality usually uh, people look into calorie okay so calories essentially you can think of uh, it's it's a final how much energy you your 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 body requires or your your body takes to do all these activities 
but calories coming from different kinds of macro and micronutrients. So when you, when you want to see the diet quality for the Indian population, you have to look at both macro as well as micronutrients, okay? And uh, what we did, looking at NSS household level data uh, over the years from 1984 to all the way 2011, 12, uh, how the diet quality at the household level has, has changed. And uh, we looked into carbohydrates, protein, fat, and fiber, like macronutrients. And at the same time, we looked into calcium, phosphorus, and other kind of uh, 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 vitamins and other things. So uh, you, you, if we, we, we also calculated two indices. One is called deficiency index. The other one is called excess index. So there are certain nutrients. If you take excess, uh, in excess, it, it actually deteriorates your health. And there are certain nutrients which, which you require, but you are, you are not meeting the recommended daily allowance. Uh, for to maintain your body, okay? So uh, here we also examine how certain socioeconomic factors, characteristics at the household level that affect diet quality. This is what we have uh, looked into. Now, uh, before, before I show any tables or anything, let me just uh, take you to uh, some findings. So uh, again, all these findings, when you show, show you the findings, these are, these are definitely correlation. You have to interpret in terms of correlation, not a causality. And also when I say correlation, these are, these are conditional correlation. That means we try to kind of control other factors at the household level, as well as uh, the factors at the community level. So one thing that educated household, when I say educated household, we are measuring, we're proxying it in terms of the education of the head of the household. So higher the education of the head of the household, the quality of diet decreases, okay? So this is kind of something uh, which, which we cannot make out, I mean, why, why it is so. However, this, this, this relationship has improved over time. That means now uh, educated households are, I mean, come relatively, I mean, not in absolute sense, they are choosing better quality diet compared to 1984 or 2004, five. Uh, poorer household, they lack important nutrients and richer household consume excess uh, nutrients which, are, which they don't require. And there is not much improvement over time in this deficiency index. However, it deteriorated for, for, for all the households for the excess index. Uh, two communities, one is Muslim compared to all other religions. They have a, high, a lower deficiency index. That means in, in, in some sense, they lack some uh, important nutrients. Uh, whereas uh, Sidul caste and Sidul tribes compared to all other caste groups, uh, their deficiency is also lower. So when I say lower, that means their nutrition quality is really bad compared to others. And also this relationship has actually deteriorated over time, past 30 years. Uh, urban population has lower diet quality. Again, uh, this is something uh, we found and also it has worsened over time. So these are the kind of a, a main bullets of our results. Now, uh, given my time, uh, I would like to kind of quickly show you some of the important uh, things I think uh, these are the numbers you don't have to remember. Just, just the first, the, the first uh, uh, table shows you that how, how the per capita per day calorie consumption has decreased over the time. Okay, so this is, this is the puzzle I was talking about at the very beginning. Okay, so now how do we explain this puzzle? There are two issues, as I, as I discussed before. One, that uh, the need for uh, calorie has decreased and need can decrease for many reasons because we are doing more sedentary activities. We are not doing a lot of physical things. So the need can go down. And at the, uh, on the other side, uh, we can consume lower because our, our food budget is tightened. Okay, so there is a squeeze in the food budget. And why, why is it so? Because it, it could be the case that uh, widespread uh, uh, impoverishment, or also it can, it can be explained by that non-food items are much more expensive and people are shifting from food items to non-food items. Uh, however, if, if, if these two explanations are correct, then if the food budget is squeezed, then we'd, li we'd like to see that the households are optimizing uh, their food budget in a sense that they are becoming much more cost efficient. And this is what we, what we did in another, another work that in fact, we found the evidence that households are becoming much more cost efficient uh, in terms of selecting their food items. So that kind of fits well with this ho household food budget squeeze hypothesis. However, we did not find any evidence that the, the need for calorie has decreased for the Indian population, okay? So this is something we'll come back later. Uh, and now here, uh, I showed you in this particular graph that in rural sector, 
uh, sorry, in this table that the percentage of household they are meeting recommended daily allowance. Now, recommended daily allowance is calculated based on ICMR data. Uh, broadly, it is based on several age group as well as gender group, and everything is calculated at the household level. So we picked every household from our sample, and we found that what is the, the household composition, the gender and age wise, and we calculated that, okay, for this household, uh, ignoring the intra-household allocation, this is how much calorie they require, this is how much carb they require, this is protein required and fat required. Uh, and then we found that how many, what is the proportion of households in India uh, in our sample, okay, uh, uh, they are meeting all these recommended daily allowances. Now you can clearly see that, uh, uh, that it, in fact, the, the households meeting all these allowances, the mean and the poorest and richest, the poorest and richest are defined in terms of their uh, total monthly per capita consumption expenditure, that, that the poorest quartile and the richest quartile. But you can, you can clearly see that the, the proportion of household meeting this recommended allowance has decreased over the time. Uh, for example, for CARB, uh, almost 80%, average 80% households, they are meeting CARB in 1983. But now in 2011-12, that's the latest analysis round, we see that 56% they are meeting recommended daily allowance. Now the question comes to our mind that, what is the problem? I mean, is it really true that only this much proportion of households they are meeting the recommended daily allowance? Or it is a data problem which we discussed in the previous session. Probably the recommended daily allowance is wrong. I mean, the way we calculated it is wrong. Or the way we are measuring uh, household level consumption that is wrong. I mean, anything can go wrong. So this is something alarming and we have to really dig further without, I mean, here we are not saying that, look, this is the conclusion. What we are highlighting that something is wrong, something is going on and we have to, we have to uh, look into it. Uh, same thing I have done for the urban sector. Uh, uh, the same trend continues. Okay, now I, I take you to some, what is called diet quality index. As I discussed before, what I did, we took every food item, what they're consuming for every household. So there are plenty of food items and uh, every food item has some nutrient in, in it. And we followed very old uh, calculation by Gopalan in 1971. And then we converted all the food items to all these macro and micronutrients, which are 12. And then we calculated this DI, which is deficiency index and EI, which is excess index. And uh, you, you, if you see clearly that all these indices are in fact uh, falling over time and the changes, for example, that efficiency index, uh, sorry, excess index uh, has, has, has decreased. What it says that in okay. terms of excess, that means the nutrients minutes. which are taking in excess uh, than what is recommended for you uh, is really bad. Whereas for in terms of the deficiency index, uh, the change is also negative. That means you are taking a bad quality diet in, in, in the second period. Second period means from 2004, five to 11, 12. Okay, so in, in terms of diet quality, what we see that there is, there is a negative change. We are the popular Indian population are selecting bad quality diet in some sense. And in our previous bullets, I have already shown you that how these diet quality are related with uh, certain uh, socioeconomic factors like caste and, and, and education and income level and, and, and religion, okay? So uh, how I'm doing with time? I think probably I, I'll... Um, three minutes, three, three minutes. minutes. Uh, I think I'll, I'll uh, all these plots are all related to this thing, but I, I would like to stop for, for, for any questions uh, later. So I'd like to save this time. Thank you so much. Um, no, Saurabh, you still have a couple of more minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Because I, some of these plots I would like to revisit if, if during the question and session. That would be much more interesting. Okay, great. Do you, do you want to talk about some of the other data stuff if you wish? Uh, yeah, let me just, let me just uh, take you to uh, this slide then. Uh, So I, I think this is something which, which we discussed in the previous session, that what data science can do, okay? So one is the data gap. So all these analysis in India in terms of nutrition is done at the household level data. We do not have intra-household food consumption. Usually uh, in other developed countries, they give you the diary where you have to, mint, you have to log all, all the food consumption at the individual level, and then you analyze it. For India, uh, we have not seen any such data in public domain. That is one problem. And the nutritional content data is coming from, 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 from some work in 1974. Uh, again, uh, the updated things, I have not seen uh, how, how the things are being updated. So now what, what are the things we, we, we can learn from uh, data scientists is that 
for example, food recognition and classification, calorie estimation, quality detection, safety inspection. So these are the kind of things Professor Jain has discussed little, uh, some of these and much more deeper level and much more broader level. Uh, similarly, RDA calculation recommended daily allowance, uh, how they are calculating that how, what my body requires. Again, these are all very generic, but the population is very heterogeneous. I'm completely different from my twin brother, okay? If you, if you go to that extreme. Uh, so this, these are the kind of things we have to really uh, use much more sophisticated biometric marker to come up with uh, calculation, individual specific, what uh, Professor Jain has mentioned at individual level model. And then uh, identification of vulnerable community based on ground level data. This is also very important. Uh, some other interesting stuff could be like direct monitoring of public programs like audit and, and quality of midday meals, PDS system, supply chain. There are also plenty of applications. And something which is missing in India is the occupation wise nutrition allowance. Okay, I mean, can we really see that the wage what a what a worker gets in a brick meal or a rickshaw puller uh, that wage can cover balanced diet and exploring alternative source of nutrients and other computational intensive problem in climate change and future uh, agriculture so I, I would like to stop here thank you thank you Saurabh. thank you so much for sticking to time and uh, for giving us a very very broad overview of the larger issues with uh, uh, nsso uh, well in terms of what nsso data can tell us and also the nutrition puzzle um, from looking at it from an economics perspective uh, thank you Saurabh. Uh, i'll now invite our next panelist sudha nagavarapu uh, who is actually coming at this question uh, from a more grounds uh, level perspective. She's a health activist and researcher based in Bangalore, who has been working with grassroots organizations uh, for the last 20 years uh, in the areas of community health, health rights, agriculture, food, governance, and livelihood interventions, uh, both in Karnataka and in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, she served on the executive boards of multiple organizations who've been working on these issues and has also coordinated community-led and collaborative of research into maternal health, health systems, disease prevalence, nutrition, and agrarian history. Uh, and she actually has a master's in computer engineering from Iowa State University. Uh, so Sudha will uh, bring us a, a, a more ground level sort of ethnographic perspective on these issues. So I invite Sudha, please. Richa, uh, there's several yes. questions, uh, both oh. online and uh, so do you want to take the questions at the end or? Um, right I now. can actually see only one uh, online, but there, is, uh, there are a uh, couple of questions from the audience here. So, um, I, if if you think it is okay, I was hoping that we'll have all the panelists go, and then the panelists can respond to each other, and then we address the audience questions. Do you think sure. that's all right? Yeah, that will be fine. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and if people in the audience can also type up their questions, then we'll have the record of the questions. Great, Sudha, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, along with uh, the other stuff that uh, Richa has mentioned, I thought I should also mention that I worked in a medical device company uh, for about six years, and I was in a team which had a hammer. So yes, that that the hammer problem is 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 universal. Um, so let me start with my presentation there. Um, yeah. Um, So um, what I uh, plan to do today is just- So that maybe you can close the uh, extra window on the right. Okay, yeah, no, I don't know why the uh, slideshow hasn't come. So I'm just waiting on that. Uh, it should actually go into the slideshow mode and, um, hmm, what's happening? Uh, just give me a minute, please. I don't know what's happening with this. Hmm. I have to close it. Okay, there it is. Yeah, okay. Oh, so now they are not able to hear you. Uh, could you also be a little louder? Um, okay. Is it better now? Um, is, is it better, there, Dia? Uh, is it better? Yes, it's better, Sudha. Please go ahead. Great. Okay, thanks. So um, yeah, I wanted to, um, I, today I plan to talk about dietary transitions from uh, my field experiences and also uh, the work we've done uh, trying to triangulate what we find in the field with what, uh, what national state level data says. And um, I 
work in two states primarily, as mentioned earlier, and these are my affiliations. I'm also part of many networks. So um, I plan to just start with an outline, then give some examples of what has been missed or invisibilized, uh, what, um, what has not been recorded well, and sort of the reasons for that possibly. And um, I mean, again, biases and uh, mis misinterpretations and what that does to our understanding of food and nutrition. And then some um, random thoughts about uh, other, other areas that we need more attention. So, um, uh, you know, Saurabh started talking about the NSSO and I'll just very rapidly go through this. I mean, we've seen a lot of shifts and uh, some of these have been recorded through NSSO data. Others, uh, there are ethnographic studies and um, I'm happy to share references if anyone wants at a later point. But we see all these uh, dietary transitions and uh, as Saurabh pointed out, you know, you have this huge uh, drop in protein consumption and that we see, um, especially in poor communities because they have, they have uh, reduced their consumption of milk, meat and fish. Um, and, and pulses also, but these, these are uh, more uh, stark. And um, so what are the things that we are seeing to some extent? Now, yes, in the last few NFHs, we can see there's a, an increase in stunting and wasting, but from a broad trend, if you look at data from the past 50 years, you see some improvement. And um, from what I have understood listening to various health activists and uh, people in the field is that, um, uh, you know, this community work with infant and young ch child feeding, you know, breast milk, exclusive breastfeeding, complementary foods, all of these have really um, uh, picked up. I mean, there's, there's a lot more understanding and awareness about it. But the problem is when we start introducing complementary food, like just today I was talking to a young mother and she says, yeah, yeah, I'm feeding my child biscuits. I mean, that's not complementary food. So that's where we are uh, getting stuck, uh, I think, in this uh, uh, children uh, nutrition. Uh, TV is still huge. Uh, you know, we don't hear as much about it, but it continues to be a problem. And, um, you know, um, it, it increases malnutrition and it is a cause and, and malnutrition is a risk factor. A um, lot of people talk about overnutrition. I'm glad no speakers today have done that, but it's, it's really... Uh, 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 very misleading to say that overnutrition is causing obesity, diabetes, lifestyle diseases because it's poor nutrition. Um, amnesia, uh, anemia seems to be on the rise. Again, this is not very clear because we weren't collecting data in the past, but based on changes in nutrition, I wouldn't be surprised if this is true. Um, there's some work now on this decline in average height of adults and um, again, uh, there's, there's NSS, uh, NFHS level data and um, um, you know, in, in, in the field or just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you see talk in health circles, you do see that. There's this term called stunted children and overweight obese mothers, which is, you know, uh, which, which is a, a generally accepted term today. Um, piles, you will see for ads, ads for treatment of piles anywhere across India. Uh, thyroid disease is on the rise. You know, you can talk to any of these mobile uh, health clinics and one of the biggest... Uh, um, uh, diseases that they have to treat is thyroid. Gallstones, you're seeing these poor people going in for gallbladder removal surgery. And um, that's a really interesting field. I can talk about it in Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I should just introduce. So uh, the first thing I want to go after this is I'm just sharing a small clip, a one minute clip of some video that we are taking in the field as documentation for our work on uh, dietary transitions. This is all going to go into a portal pretty soon. Um, so uh, yeah, just please listen to it. It's subtitled and um, I'll talk about it once you uh, listen to it.
तो कितना लेते थे ऐसे ऐसे झार ले जा रहे हैं मनुमन का दस पसेरी झार ले जाते आता का दिन में एक एक जन और मतलब साल उस उस सीजन में कितने ले लेते थे अरे बहुत ही मुड़िया था हमारे सब के खुदा झार झार या जोर जोर मना ने पंद्रह पंद्रह सोरा सोरा मना कठा कर दे रहे किन्हीं अच्छा um so this lady is a uh, uh, uh she's uh, a dalit she's landless uh, her family they don't have any land they work as agricultural laborers or um other kind of uh, they do um, labor work and um so she talks about wild rice she talks about fish and um you know all kinds of things that they collected from wetlands now is this some you know very isolated thing some some um uh, you know uh, outliers um uh, according to conventional data it is but i would like to share this map of wetlands in central uh, so this is in central uttar pradesh in sitapur district so um this is a map from 1972 of wetlands and uh, where i talk to this lady is actually what is designated as a swamp here um and uh there was there were a lot of wetlands in 1972 there's been a 75% decline uh, by 2004 uh, there were even more wetlands earlier and we have colonial records and we know that a lot of drainage channels have been built in this area to drain all the wetlands right so um i mean the uh, i guess what people talk about proxies right you know th this kind of information hints at what people were eating and this is not well documented uh i did not see any mention of wild rice most likely wild rice would have been documented under rice and many people who talk about rice have also pointed out that any type of rice is documented as rice and that doesn't really tell you what people were eating because there were so many varieties um agricultural scientists knew about it i mean they were breeding uh, it into commercial rice varieties because they knew how important it was so so um th there's a lot of information that we do not see when we look at just consumption because these were all invisibilized now what other foods were invisibilized um you know people eating rats every once in a while you'll see these news articles oh my god you know these people are starving and they're eating rats but but many communities traditionally ate rats they ate rats porcupine snakes and this is just not considered food um wing termites um so in the southern deccan where you know where bangalore is uh, in the nearby areas a lot of people consume wing termites and it's a delicacy it's a very seasonal thing they consume other insects through the year but um it's it's actually uh, um, you know it's a healthy thing and uh, when we are talking about climate change and the need to eat insects you know we start talking about southeast asia but india there's so much consumption of insects that is not recorded um in 2015 when drought hit bundelkhand there were reports everywhere about ghas ki roti right about how much people were suffering eating ghas ki roti and that grain is actually brown top millet which sells in urban markets among those who are um, you know aware of nutrition and so on it sells at a higher rate than other millets because it's considered very nutritious but in rural areas it's demeaned uh and and why is this because you know the people who are eating it are at the bottom of the caste ladder they are the um you know they are the poorest of the poor what food they eat is you know dehat ka khana um uh, it's just looked down on and because of that there is really no good record of these foods um another example that i wanted to talk about was butter milk um not the dilute curd but the the residue from the process of making uh, butter and ghee so uh, before there was a market for milk most milk was converted into ghee and uh, you got uh, you had butter milk and across the country i have given a andhra pradesh but across the country you will find that people were consuming butter milk but it uh, people also say that there's very little evidence of the consumption i mean um, so so one uh, you know we were wondering about this problem and uh, sorab actually uh, helped us get um, uh, the uh, nsso um, schedule of uh, 1983 and this is for uh, uttar pradesh and if you look at all the questions about milk and milk products right this was being used in rural uttar pradesh they're talking about baby food they're talking about ice cream um, butter ghee but they're not talking about matha or matha 
which is that buttermilk now what my experience uh, sudha we have lost your connection i'm not sure if it's just me or if it's everybody else yeah we have lost her i can't hear okay um she's actually in sitapur at the moment so maybe that is why she's probably logged in from a mobile connection um so maybe richa we can get started with the next speaker uh, and uh, when sudha rejoins we can resume do you think that makes sense um we can do that i can also uh, sort of uh, yeah she's she's back okay sudha yeah can you hear me yes can you share your presentation again we lost you okay uh where were we um you were showing us the schedule and you told us how matha is not part of the schedule okay so we didn't lose much so yeah so um my point is that unless we specifically ask people uh you know whether they've cons uh, whether they consume something they're not going to volunteer information especially in food people don't want to share uh, unless they think you want to hear about it so even with all those invisibilized foods i mentioned you know when you when when p uh, rural people adivasi people see someone from the city or you know there's a lot of assumptions that are made about food and unless we specifically ask questions we will not get information and there is no mention of buttermilk matha in this schedule and i'm sure that would have played a role in the um, low uh, record of consumption of buttermilk um but of course there was somebody okay, watching just a couple of more minutes oh just a couple of more minutes okay i'll just finish this and uh, wind down so people were uh, there were people watching so um varghese kurian knew all about it knew that there's protein that's wasted in the villages that needs to be monetized um so th there's that going on this is just some findings from our uh, mixed methods uh, multidisciplinary study and we found that milk and milk products were very important and there's been a rapid decline in that and even uh, today uh, when we look at milk consumption it's very low um yeah i just wanted to at least end with this particular thing so um you know uh, this was a uh, okay let me just put here yeah so this was a tweet uh, shared last year about a study and they say as you can see vegetarian women more likely to have you know uh, nutrient ad uh, adequacy and diet diversity than non vegetarian women um a lot of us saw this dr veena shatrugna also commented uh, because it was quite outrageous frankly i mean uh, how uh, what are you saying and then when we discussed with the um, group presenting it they said this was their title right that um, self identified vegetarian uh, pregnant women have a better diet because of the intersections of caste and economic status uh the more we talked with them i mean i told them look you know a better title would have been this caste and economic status is a better indicator of diets i mean why are you bringing vegetarian vegetarianism into it so um what we believe or you know the 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 markers that we identify very quickly make us jump to conclusions uh so we really have to watch our biases our backgrounds where we come from and and how we are uh, you know we have a huge responsibility when we are talking about the food of 1 billion plus people i mean we have to present it accurately um so okay i'll just end with this uh medicines i mean are we really looking enough at what's happening with medicines i mean during the uh, covid second wave also doctors were prescribing antibiotics left right and center when it was not needed and it's impacting your gut bacteria you're already weakened i mean your digestive system is just Uh, uh, weekend and why are you taking antibiotics? So uh, physical labor, other people have pointed out. Yes, we don't know enough about it. We don't understand. Um, we need to understand uncultivated foods in the context of biodiversity and diet diversity. It's um, uh, the, the during lockdown we heard a lot of stories of people returning to their old practices because they could not buy food. Um, and um, so recently with the floods uh, in in november december um, i was traveling through southern india and mm -hmm. everywhere i went i saw people you know fishing where they hadn't fished before i mean there's a huge 
consumption so people are also very um adaptive they do different things and we have to be um you know uh, we have to have more feet on the ground and uh, we have to have our eyes and ears open if we really want to uh, make sense of uh, food um current and past so i would just like to say that uh, food nutrition health all of this is so closely linked to caste class gender region that um, i mean uh india's not i mean uh, we we talk about a country but we are actually a um, you know a subcontinent with all kinds of agro climatic zones and we have to dis disaggregate our data otherwise it doesn't make sense uh, our biases and social context uh, contexts really hamper us when we are analyzing food and nutrition and we have to look at these linkages better i mean uh, we are we are talking about the environment and um, other factors we really need to look at medicines uh, because of the rampant overuse of medicines and and whatever other linkages emerge we have to uh, really broaden our um, lens when we look at uh, food and nutrition thank you thank you sudha thank you so much for giving us a very different perspective on the question linking food and nutrition and data um i now invite uh, dr veena shatrughna uh, to uh, join the conversation she retired as deputy director and head clinical division of the national institute of nutrition hyderabad and um, she is also associated with anveshi the research center for women studies in hyderabad and is an advisor to the supreme court uh, on the right to food bill her research and publications have focused on pregnancy women's work growth and nutrition amongst children and bone health um, she started several women studies departments at nalsar uh, shri padmavati mahila university tirupati and and other places uh, and we are delighted to have her with us to bring a public health perspective on uh, this broader question of food nutrition and data uh, professor veena chatrugna please thank you richa have i am i audible hello yes, we can hear you thank you i don't have slides and i would like to take on some of the questions and point to others which i feel must be thought through if data sets is the central concern of this group and uh, what is really been uh, my angst is that a large number of data sets are now being released flying around the country ns so hunger index nns nnmb was there which gave us individual diet surveys someone said we never got individual diet surveys that's not true till 2012 13 nin has produced individual diets okay it's a, and then uh, we flying around figures of one third unfunded uh, about 19% uh, and it goes on and on and on now what i want to flag is that we have simplified everything because of the fact that in the 70s uh, what happened was we had just come out of a famine and barely getting on to adequate uh, the green revolution giving us adequate calories and this that is the time the economists just uh, piled on to us and looked at calorie as indicator of adequacy and before we knew it calorie was being used for poverty line for adequate or you name it it was so simple it is uh, in the uh, many people in the academia love simple uh, one um, gun shot that they can use to change the world so calories but 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 calories come from any foods calories come from cereals largest amount do come from cereals but they come from fat and proteins and potato and bobbers uh, and chiku bananas i mean calories come from different foods but the assumption was it is the cereal calories that the population uh, wants and so even the food requirement was reduced to adequate cereals to stock other things just were overlooked because country couldn't afford it country didn't produce it we had shortage of oils shortage of proteins we had shortage of proteins in a very big way despite all the romance about people drinking milk and what do you think the scientists have done the scientists were as political as the bureaucrats so dr gopalan comes out with a thesis that there is a myth of protein gap for which he received flack from the world but i think he almost got a padma shri from the country because then you could not then you could forget about protein needs of children and we can go into that if the 
audience is interested. Now, what is this calorie? It is seen as so important. It is not that important. Calorie is necessary for work, just for body and soul to stay together. But the moment a child is undernourished and you give the child more calories, the child just runs around the village two, three times in the joy and never puts on weight. So we have data scientists who are telling us, but the weight doesn't correlate with calorie intakes, et cetera, et cetera. But remember, calories cannot be stored except as fat. And that is the fat that goes into making our bodies obese. Someone said uh, obesity is not because of overnutrition. In India, obesity is because we have too much calories coming from carbohydrate. Now, why are people shifting to fat calories? There was a suggestion that people are getting poor quality diet. For God's sake, fat is very good. 40 to 50% of calories of children under one year must come from fat, right? Because brain is all fat. It's the fat that is carrying all the vitamins, uh, fat soluble vitamins. It's fat that causes the membranes of every cell to not get uh, fragile. So fat calories are very important and it's not surprising people are shifting from cereal uh, calories to fat calories. So unless we tease or open the idea of calories, we'll always bemoan the fact that people are eating less or eating more and is poverty more, is poverty less. For God's sake, every nutrient has a function. And just because in the 70s we had nothing else to offer, we just gave rice, rice and more rice. And that's what happened with the Mm, uh, with the uh, uh, pandemic. Every time there was a hue and cry, the government would give five kilos of rice. Now, five kilos of rice, wonderful. But rice doesn't make muscle and bone. Do they look similar? Muscle and bone will be made if you get enough eggs and milk and uh, flesh foods, uh, etc. But we, were, we thought the country was food secure because the government was churning out this rice every few months. Now, why are we short? Obviously, if you want to grow tall, you have to make muscle and bone. And muscle and bone require calcium, they require animal protein, they require exercise, lack of infection, you know, a range of other supportive environment. So it's not surprising that children just stay short. But yes, with the extra calories, they'll ring, run around the village or the slum five times and play. Even when uh, uh, calories start, uh, there's inadequacy, there's hunger at home till the last minute children don't give up. They continue to be active till they collapse and they are found uh, whining away, pulling at the mother's sari because they're hungry. They don't even know they're hungry, by the way. So the, And then if there is not enough nutrients like vitamins, minerals, etc., they lose their appetites. So these are small physiological but very significant details that none of the data sets can capture. Data sets can capture calories, can capture weights, heights, etc. This whole business of wasting was a masterstroke because before the 2SD uh, uh, thing came up, we had uh, defined undernutrition in terms of 90 percent of the 80 percent or 85 percent. And the country had 90% undernutrition. Now, that was not acceptable. So NF, we shifted to another kind of standards and we brought down the undernutrition of uh, whatever this smart way of calculations to about 30, 35%. If anyone's interested in history of um, anthropometry, it's worth looking at it. The other thing that happens is which is an Professor Shatrughna, we are losing your voice. Uh, Professor Shatrughna, we are losing your voice. Oh, when did you lose it? Now, if you are you better now? Uh, am I better? No. Yes, you're better now. If you can start uh, with the anthropometry part. Oh, anthropometry about weights, heights, or about uh, uh, weights. The, the, you were saying something okay. about the history of anthropometry. Yeah, if anyone's interested in the history of anthropometry, you will realize that way back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, undernutrition was 90%. And then the, all, all the big shots, pediatricians, et cetera, because you have to do with such terrible data. So they came up with the SD classification and brought it down to 30, 35, where we are today. In the case of anemia, 
Remember, in the 50s and 60s, because iron was a major, major problem, uh, we didn't have uh, enough vegetables and fruits and uh, liver and uh, animal proteins. We said it's iron deficiency anemia. But for God's sake, that hemoglobin molecule is made up of many, many other nutrients, which includes good quality amino acids to make the globin fraction. It needs magnesium, it needs copper, it needs B12, it needs folic acid, to name a few. And we are still talking about, like we're still talking about calories as determining uh, you know, health. We're talking about iron as the only thing for anemia. I think it's about time we grew up and looked at physiology because any foods, now the government is talking about fortification of rice. The principle is that one food should provide you with multiple nutrients and each nutrient must come from many foods. Now we are going to get rice, which will provide us with calories, which will provide us with 6% uh, protein and iron and B12. So what we are doing is making a mockery of nutrition. When we just cling on to calories and don't see that people have made very wise choices by buying more fat, by buying oil. Oil gives you satiety. All the uh, fat-soluble vitamins are absorbed. The ch child is... Uh, not hungry for a much longer time, et cetera, et cetera. And it, I can go on and on about other things. Protein, absolutely essential if you want a child to grow and protein intakes are going down, pulse production is going down. So I have a feeling that it's about time we sat down and understood some of the uh, uh, confounding variables that are being missed out. To add to the mess, NNMB has been shut down, which used to give us individual diet intakes and we have all the fly-by-night agencies including USF, USAID, free pub council i mean i can go and on who are churning out it. these are unemployed people in the west who need data sets to do their pa for their students they've all landed up in india and they're churning out uh, reports after reports and then this whole thing about veg non-veg the hindutva project i i think uh, sudha very rightly mentioned how if pre walked into this trap by saying vegetarians were better nourished than non-veg without reflecting on the fact uh, that vegetarians came to the group and that is what uh, sorry professor shatrugna we have we lost your bit there again uh, you were saying vegetarians came from uh, higher oh, I think she should, should uh, turn down her turn off her video yes, maybe the vegetarians came from a Am I messing up something? A vegetarian? Shall I shut off the video because my that may be better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because vegetarians in this uh, CNS uh, thing came from better socioeconomic groups, so they guzzled milk and curd and uh, you name it, uh, protective foods, pulses. The non-veg was Dalits. They were theoretically non-veg, but they ate a bit of meat maybe once in fifteen days and called themselves non-veg. So this is what happens when you fly down and do data collection from a third world country where, about which you know very little and use reports that uh, are acceptable to the authorities. I'm sure the government in the center was thrilled that vegetarianism was better, right? And I can go on and on except to say that uh, there is, I was, re then of course you have these great um, attempts to say, I think Indian, um, Malnutrition is not going away. Maybe we should have Indian standards. Now, this is another joke because it took us years to figure out that Indians can grow as tall as anyone else in the world. And this was a WHO trial where standards were set. Suddenly, overnight, we have these hunger index which threw us off guard. And uh, it's always acceptable when somebody says, let's have Indian standards. How can you fault it? Because you don't know the history of how standards were set. Similarly, you have the others who will uh, say that, oh, what about the Asian enigma? Very stylish, of course, without even reading the paper because the title is so seductive that yes, we have to respond to people who talk of Asian enigma because we need to tell them, look, Indians have a little better healthcare system. Though children are starved, starved, they don't die overnight, right? Whereas in Africa, there is, uh, absolutely no healthcare system at that time when it was written children die much easily with malaria and other diseases i can go on with how um, uh, 
uh, colonialism, colonial mindset, etc., really determined what we research on. For instance, the whole business of sex ratio. If some of you have looked at what Indian Express is saying, that the NFHS is saying the sex ratios are better, could really be an artifact because they haven't really looked at the um, men who have migrated and therefore they found more women in the households wherever. And after all, it was a sample, it wasn't census. So if you're not capable of doing a census, please don't do a census. And that's what the NFHS ends up doing and getting into the good books of the government. So similarly, a lot of such nutrition research is done, which I would say needs to be torn to pieces. But since we have such a crisis, there is no time to sit and uh, dot the I's and cross the T's of every messy research that is held up as the gospel truth. I think I'll stop at that and take questions whenever they come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Shatrughana, also for staying I'm well with the professor. time. Uh, please, I'm, I'm not in an academic teaching institute, so please just call me Veena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing in a very, very important public health perspective and also for telling us that there is a lot of data that is um, misinterpreted and misused and miscollected. And we have to be very careful, again, harking back to what the first panel had also highlighted about the, the problems associated with, with data. Um, so I'm actually supposed to go next uh, and give a perspective on agriculture and food policy um, on the issue. And I'll request Professor Banerjee to please give me a 12 minute mark so that I also know when to stop. Uh, and then of course, uh, Dr. Bagler will, will be the last speaker and then we'll get back to the panel response and Q&A. Um, so um, I want to basically talk about uh, two important uh, points in my time. Uh, one is the role of the state and the other is the role of the market uh, in shaping uh, our diets and then the implications of that for nutrition over time. Uh, Professor Shatrugna already spoke about the Green Revolution and sort of, you know, build up from there. But the role of the state in India has largely shaped the kind of food that has been available to us. Um, the Green Revolution, of course, was a very important paradigm changing uh, time, uh, which effectively replaced our diet significantly. Um, we say that, uh, you know, a lot of new research on the Green Revolution, and especially the data around it is now telling us that uh, it effectively replaced calories of one kind with calories of another kind on our plate. And so uh, because farmers got input subsidies and output guarantees to grow rice, wheat and sugar cane, we've produced a great deal of that in our country. Uh, but a lot of this happened not just on land that was, you know, uh, empty. A lot of this happened on land that was, in fact, growing millets, pulses and oil seeds. Um, and so farmers shifted from those crops, mixed cropping of those uh, crops, uh, to monocultures of rice, wheat and sugar cane. Uh, this is what was supplied through the public distribution system and the other, uh, you know, food systems of the government, um, broadly under the rubric of dealing with food insecurity. So, you know, we have the whole famine story. And I'll, I'll get a little bit at, you know, questioning that a, a little later. Uh, but this is what ultimately um, has reshaped the availability of food such that I'll very briefly share these statistics that from 1961 to 2006, um, this is in grams per day, uh, the per capita availability of wheat went up from 79 grams to 154 grams. Um, of rice stayed about the same, 201 to 198 grams. Uh, but if you look at pulses, it went down by half. So we went from 69 grams to 32 grams. And for millets and gram or chana, uh, which is also eaten, you know, like uh, uh, chaniki roti uh, in various kinds of ways and besan, uh, that went down from 149 grams to 71 grams. So clearly there has been a huge shift in the kind of foods that have been available uh, from our agricultural production system. What this has also implied is that India uh, in, in the 70s and 80s, we were importing uh, edible oil. Um, we, we gave a little bit of a push towards the late 1990s. And so we became self-sufficient for just about one year in the middle. 
but now as of as of date in the last couple of years we've been importing 70 60 to 70% of our entire edible oil requirement uh, from outside palm oil and soybean oil is what has flooded um, our uh, food system uh, from you know outside to inside whatever i mean whether we are consuming uh, at at fast food restaurants or on the thela walas outside or within our own homes um and pulses you know we are the nation which is the largest consumer of pulses in the world we used to grow a huge amount of pulses in the past but now we are, it's all coming from you know myanmar and australia and elsewhere um which is of course also made these foods unaffordable for large segments of our population um and this links back directly to the question of you know protein lack of protein intake that all the three speakers before me um spoke about um the availability has also been shaped by state policies related to liberalization where we invited um uh, you know we, we liberalized the market in terms of food um uh, and invited a whole variety of corporations to come in both in the farming sector as well as in the food sector so in the farm sector um that's led to a great deal of uh, i mean a shift towards growing certain commodities that uh, are are linked to uh, uh, to you know to longer supply chains and not necessarily to regional or local uh, requirements of people in terms of food um it's also on the food food side it's led to an explosion of a uh, fast food or uh, as earlier was mentioned by professor jain junk food you go out and all you see is junk food around you uh, so your restaurants and and so it's you know The, the people often talk about a shift in rural areas now uh, from millets it's now directly to momos or, or noodles uh, all of which is uh, or you know the biscuits there there was even a discussion uh, at some point of time a few years ago that let us provide in our anganwadis and in our midday meals let's provide biscuits as the so called you know holistic food again um, looking at the, the 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 influx of sort of corporations and shaping agendas around food which is sort of the next point i i wish to talk about but all of these processed foods that have now flooded our households and markets um are made from maida which is highly refined wheat sugar salt and refined edible oil and none of these i mean there are tons and tons of studies on this um talking about the damage that these things do to our health um apart from the role of the state in shaping this there have been um, there has also been the role of the market that has created demand for these things so i just spoke about drivers of supply there have been a whole set of demand Uh, drivers of demand one of them um, being um, of course advertising which is also linked uh, to this notion of aspirational consumption so on the one hand advertising especially corporate advertising has linked many of these foods to you know being modern clean hygienic it's better quality there is a cer certain social status if you go to i mean at one point of time ironically in india going to a mcdonalds in the 1990s was supposed to be cool and high status uh, unlike you know in a country like the us where going to mcdonalds means, means that you really don't have much choice uh, in terms of where you can eat um but this was also this aspirational um form of consumption was also deeply linked to our own caste hierarchies as sudha has very nicely described earlier uh, where millets were considered to be which are the nutritious cereals now were considered to be foods of the poor or foods for animals wheat was meant to be for guests and for elites um what the green revolution did was in some ways provide this aspirational food to the masses make it available to the masses uh, but one more element was important in here and that was a link with technology uh, where you had processing technologies and modern food production technologies that came in and stripped the existing food of its nutrition and so uh, this aspiration towards uh, more refined pure white uh, was linked to us removing all of the fiber from the rice and wheat that we are eating so the whiter the atta the better it's supposed to be your maida has this sort of used to have this very high status uh, in terms of it being better for us quote and quote um which is again linked to the uh, the the availability of these modern technologies in providing these products for us bread for example is a product of the factory again stripping away most of the nutrients from it um it's also linked to for example the shift from gur to sugar uh again white refined pure and with good manufacturers then trying to also put chemicals into the good to clean it and to make it whiter so that it becomes more acceptable to consumers there are of course many other issues around this uh, notion of aspirations and advertising including formula milk for example and the entire debate uh, 
uh, that uh, we've had with people shifting towards, uh, you know, uh, the, the entire debate with the whole breastfeeding campaigns, where uh, a lot of, you know, doctors at one point of time were advising women. Uh, slum women were thinking that, you know, this dibbe ka dood is actually better for my child. And, you know, that's, I'm, I'm doing something good. I'm being a modern, responsible mother uh, by providing my child with this formula milk. Again, linking back to uh, corporate advertising and corporate profits. Um, and so uh, that sort of brings me to the second large point I want to make today, which is um, while we are talking about nutrition and food and agriculture and data, so far we've spoken, like Professor Jen, for example, gave us a very nice division earlier, uh, talking about the individual society and the planet. Uh, but I think we do need to bring in the corporation as a very important actor because the corporation has been shaping the modern farming system and the modern food system in very, very important ways. And we need to understand the power of corporations in terms of what they have done, not just uh, globally and in the US, for example, but also in India increasingly, um, and take on board these power hierarchies that you know shape ultimately our food environments, both in terms of supply as well as in terms of demand. And so, um, you know, just on the agricultural front, if we look at agricultural inputs, that is um, seed and agrochemicals, there are um, three corporations in the world that control 60 to 70 to 80 percent of the input markets globally. Um, if you look at processing and retail, supermarket chains, supply chains, um, and you know, you look at three main commodities, for example, wheat, soybean, and corn, which form the bedrock of the American food system. Uh, you have four corporations, the ABCD, ADM, Cargill, Bungil, Louis Dreyfus, who control, again, 70 to 80% of the entire farm to fork supply chain of these commodities. And so these corporations have got immense influence over governments as well as over multilateral bodies in shaping food and nutrition policy. There's very, very um, uh, interesting work talking about how companies have actually shaped the Food and Drug Administration of the United States in setting standards, whether it's the food pyramid uh, with the milk being given so much importance, given the milk lobby in the United States and people over consuming milk, uh, with the meat lobby pushing for a certain kind of you know, livestock and, and animal uh, consumption, even though it's known to be detrimental to human health, at least in the quantities in which it has been consumed in the United States. Um, the Coca-Cola lobby, uh, the sugar lobby that's been pushing for these kinds of foods to be still marketed to children um, and, and the huge resistance towards that, um, or the, the lobbying around, say, uh, inputs related to agricultural inputs um, or seeds and agrochemicals uh, and the requirement for intellectual property rights, the entire restructuring of our agricultural knowledge system through the language and framing of IPRs because it is beneficial in specific kinds of ways. Um, even the UN Food System Summit, you know, P Professor Jen mentioned that earlier, um, there has been a huge debate globally about how specific actors have, in fact, through the World Economic Forum, shaped the UN Food System Summit, pushing for specific agendas um, that have a role for large corporate actors to, to reshape things uh, to the exclusion of many other social groups whose needs and demands are not even brought to the table. And, you know, why is it that I'm highlighting the role of large corporations here? Um, I do that because there are two important requirements that large corporations need to have to actually be able to survive in the system. You know, if you if you go back to nature and go back to actually food production, um, diversity is the norm. Variability is the norm. So in nature, nature will never produce one thing. It will always have multiple things because you want to make sure if there's just one thing, it, you know, and there's a disease, a Best or something, it will all die off. Uh, and so to continue that, you need to ensure there's variability and diversity. If you want to be a large corporate player in the food supply chain, what you need is standardization. You need one standardized product that you can supply to consumers um, if, wherever you want to supply to, to maintain that kind of demand and supply shaping. Um, and you also need to be able to do it at scale. And this means corporate actors globally, and I think Professor Banerjee is telling me my 12 minutes are over. Um, Just go over. Um, uh, uh, globally, there is enough evidence to show that corporate actors are, because of this requirement, are able to shape farming practices at one end, 
And so you're getting farmers to grow a specific size and kind of potato because you're also shaping consumer practices at the other end because everybody wants to eat that one single sized McDonald's French fry. Um, and this is not just happening in the US, it's happening in many parts uh, of the world. And so this monoculture farming and the changing of the consumer is leading to a loss of diversity, not only on the farm, but a loss of diversity also on our plates. And so if we if we look at you know, the American diet, for example, the base of whatever you go and buy as a processed item on the, on, on the shelves is high fructose corn syrup to make it sweet, refined edible oil, refined wheat flour and salt. And if you look in India, as I mentioned earlier, it's the same thing. You have refined uh, wheat flour, maida, you have refined oil, sugar and salt, sugar from our sugar cane. Um, and so this reshaping of supply chains is something that we really need to take on board because we may look at a lot of data and analysis. We may try to figure out correlations and causations. But if we ignore the big power uh, hierarchies and power differentials and really how the food system has been shaped over time, um, we will to miss the big elephant in the room. And this, this certainly means, I guess, what I'm really calling for in some senses is bringing the role of the state back in, not only in terms of collecting data. There have been some comments in the chat about how NSSO data is not really available and an MB has been shut down. Um, we do need the state to be collecting data. We also need the state to be uh, you know, regulating the kind of food environments that we see around us. There are already food deserts, of course, in the US, but also in India, uh, in, in smaller towns, you don't get the kinds of varieties, you know, all the fresh vegetables will go to the city and in the in, in the smaller Taluk headquarters and district headquarters, much of that will not be available. Um, and so I'll end with one question for us to think about. What will it take for a healthy millet laddu, which used to be a staple part of our diet from north to south, from east to west? The millet would change, but it was a healthy millet laddu varying by season what would it take for that to become available at an affordable price at the remotest of locations to replace that five rupee biscuit packet, which is so unhealthy for us, which a working Adivasi construction worker and a working doctor, uh, both mothers in this case, may want to purchase to provide for their child. I'll stop here. Um, and I guess in my role now as, as the moderator for the panel, um, I'll invite uh, Dr. Bagla, who is in, in the room uh, at Ashoka University, uh, to please speak to us. Uh, Dr. Bagla is, is a very interesting panelist for us because he's bringing a completely different perspective to the discussion today. He's uh, got a, a very interesting interdisciplinary background in physics, in computational techniques, and in computational biology. Um, and uh, his pioneering research is in a field which is known as computational gastronomy. Um, he's also got postdoctoral training from NCBS Bangalore and MPIMG Berlin. Um, computational gastronomy blends data science uh, with uh, well, basically blends food with artificial intelligence and data science, uh, looking at flavors, nutrition, and health. Um, and his research involves questions on the interface of biology, medicine, and computational sciences. So I welcome Dr. Bagler to please uh, start his presentation. Thank you, Professor Decha. It's my pleasure and privilege to be presenting in this particular workshop and discussing about this esoteric topic of computational gastronomy. You must have heard about computational physics and computational chemistry, but surely must not have heard about computational gastronomy. Given the fact that food is an artistic endeavor, blending that with something as different as data and computation is something which people have not thought about until recently. But what I'm going to tell you is a story, is a journey that I have taken for the last seven years in my lab, where we are trying to build the foundation of this new niche called computational gastronomy. So what I'll tell you about is what is computational gastronomy? What are the different aspects of computational gastronomy that we are building in our lab? And what is the future that, that I foresee in the context of the workshop that we are holding today? So I'm Ganesh Bagler from IIIT Delhi, and I run a complex systems laboratory at uh, IIIT Delhi, wherein we look at questions of biological origin, but for the last seven years, I've been focusing on food. As I said, food is an artistic endeavor. And Across the world, various cultures have been evolving ways of processing raw ingredients into delicious recipes. 
And this is the process which cultures have followed. The idea here is, can we in 21st century, where data is playing a huge role, right from transportation, navigation to reservation in changing our lives in a big manner, can we have data and computation playing a big role even in making our food choices, changing our food habits and making food computable in general? Can we do that? That's the kind of question we are trying to ask in my lab. And while doing so, we believe we have laid the foundation of this new niche called computational gastronomy. My wager to this question that I asked just now is that indeed with the help of computational gastronomy, which I'm gonna to explain to you in a brief manner, it is possible for us to make this future possible wherein personalized food nutrition is uh, nutrition, personalized food recommendation systems, which can help you navigate you through the food landscape to make yourself healthier and eat food which is tastier. What is computational gastronomy? It is a data science which blends food with data and the power of computation for achieving data-driven food innovations. And I'll be telling you about some of these uh, data-driven food innovations as I go along. There are different aspects of computational gastronomy that we have touched upon. One is traditional recipes, which is what we consume on a day-to-day -day basis, including what you have must have had in mess today. And those of you who are listening online must have had in their, uh, in their homes. And the flavor aspect of ingredients that go into the recipes, the nutritional profiles of the ingredients, and the health associations of the ingredients that go into the recipes. All of these entail different aspects of food. And notice that no aspect of life can be converted into a data science until you bring in quality curated data, which has been missing in the area of food, which is what was highlighted by Professor Jain also earlier. And I'm sure most of us agree, panelists also agree on this matter, that the data has been largely missing, uh, quality curated data, which is needed for doing data, scientific, data science based analysis. What we have been trying to do is to trying to fill this lacuna in some ways, whichever way possible. And I'm not saying that this is the ultimate uh, thing that we have been able to do. There is, there is a lot of ground yet to be covered, but however, we have taken the first few steps in trying to make these quality curated data available. One of the databases that we have built toward that direction is RecipeDB, which is a compilation, a structured compilation of more than 118,000 recipes from across the world, 26 world regions and 84 countries. Similarly, we have FlavorDB, which has got information of flavor molecules and their molecular attributes that go into these ingredients. And notice these are the world standard today when it comes to databases. So I do get queries from multinational companies apart from academicians for using this data. And we are making APIs of, for these databases, which will be made available for playing around with those who would like to use it. In, back in 2020, uh, 2015, when I was still at IIT Jodhpur, we did this investigation starting with Indian cuisine, that of culinary fingerprints is what we call them, which are nothing but patterns which are found in the recipes of the cuisine. So we investigated only 2000, uh, around 2,500 recipes and found out what are the typical patterns that are found in the Indian recipes and uh, identified that spices play a key role in deciding the patterns in the Indian cuisine, which is not seriously surprising for those who are used to eating Indian food, I would say. However, this was the first time that a simple mathematical and a data-driven analysis was uh, exposing this to the world. So this became end ended up becoming extremely popular and was identified as the emerging technology by MIT Technology Review, highlighting the emergence of computational gastronomy for the first ever time. <clears throat> this got a lot of press including it is now part of a book called The Indian Pantry by Veer Sangvi, who wrote about uh, our uh, an analysis in root food column. And uh, also it appeared in various places, including chemistry world. And importantly, the business world took it very seriously. And they highlighted this as the sweet spot of the food. They believed that bringing food, data and computation together is going to change the pace of the food industry and the beverages industry uh, in the coming times to come. The practitioners of the food, such as chefs and food enthusiasts, were not far behind. This is Chef Garima Arora, who happens to be the Michelin star chef from Indian origin chef. 
who has also recognized the potential of our research in trying to uh, change recipes for making them tastier. That's the direction she is trying to take. We have not stopped at investigating the Indian recipes only. We have gone forward and now I'm going to portray what is the future that is going to be laid out in computational gastronomy. We investigated the culinary fingerprints of recipes from across the world regions. These are regional cuisines from various parts of the world, which we investigated and have published already. It won the best paper award in one of the uh, computer science conferences, which again highlights the fact that even the audiences from computer science are taking keen note of what is happening on the interface of food and computation. And they would like to see more of uh, such analysis and applications that are coming out of it. One of the most interesting questions that one can ask in the context of uh, food is that of how is it that the recipes have evolved over a period of time? Can we probe the history of the recipes? Can we try to pin down about what kind of recipes might have been eaten hundreds of years back and thereby try to prospect what kind of recipes would be potentially be consumed in the future? How are cuisines interrelated with each other? So similar to that of a language tree that has been built, we have built uh, the tree of world cuisines, which has been shown in front of you. Another question that can be asked in the context of food, which is far more interesting from a data science perspective, is that how many recipes are actually there? And the number, if you try to get a number from an audience, you will end up getting a number which is of the order of a few hundred thousand or a million or so, which is actually true in terms of documented recipes, right? But the theoretical number of recipes that are possible, given the number of diversity of ingredients that we have, is astronomically large. The number comes out to be as large as 10 to the power 30. Uh, of course, if I were to ignore, even if I were to be ignoring some non-palatable recipes, I will be still be left with uh, another astronomical number, which is slightly smaller than this one. The question that we are asking is that, are we staring at a situation where computers can help us design new recipes? Can we apply to techniques of machine learning and AI, not as a hammer, but more like an innovation wherein we can generate novel recipes using computers? Can we have a Turing test where a computer generated recipe can fool a chef into a thinking that a computer generated recipe is actually that of a real recipe? Can we come up with such a situation? That's the question we are asking. And towards that, we have made certain progress in building one of the tool called Ratatouille. I'm sure some of you are already smiling in your cheek, thinking about Chef Gustav and his quote that anyone can cook. Can computers cook? That's a question we are asking. And one of the early attempts is Ratatouille from our lab is already online. You might want to play with this tool. And this is a very, very early tool and there will be a lot of mistakes in that. So please don't be bothered by that. We'll be very soon coming up with a refined version, which will have better recipes being generated along with quantities. Another direction beyond novel recipe generation that we are taking is that of predicting taste of a molecule. This is important from the perspective of diabetes and predicting uh, or coming up with artificial sweeteners. So we have built again, machine learning algorithms, which are state of the art uh, for predicting the molecular taste given a small molecule and its molecular features can we predict whether it is bitter, sweet or tasteless. That's a question we asked and this is already a published work and a corresponding tool for the same called bittersweet is already made available for anybody who would like to play with it. And for the sake, for one thing I know is that some of the already companies who are working in uh, artificial sweetness are already using it. The last dimension that I'm going to touch upon is that of the health aspect of it. The way human body interacts with food is extremely complex, giving rise to health consequences. Thereby, it is important for us to come up with data-driven techniques which can help us uh, or data, uh, databases which can help us in probing relationship between food and health. Towards that direction, we have built this resource called DietRx by probing 38,000 odd Medline research articles, their titles and abstracts using a text mining protocol to identify an ingredient, food ingredient, which are approximately 2000 odd food ingredients, a health term, a medical subject heading and a relationship between the two, whether it is positive, negative or a neutral relationship. And by doing so, we have done the analysis and have figured out that spices, for example, culinary herbs and spices 
tend to have broad spectrum benevolence across variety of diseases. Where is it all taking the computational gastronomy, the future that I'm trying to portray in front of you, where is it taking us? In my opinion, we are moving towards a direction where we can build a personalized nutrition predictor. And this is one of the landmark research articles coming from Wiseman Institution that I'm flashing in front of you, wherein they showed that indeed, the way it has been highlighted by Professor Anurag Agarwal, Professor Jain, that a single diet doesn't decide whether your glycemic index will be rising or lowering for all people across uh, you know, people. It is not true. It's not generic. So it is very personal, person specific and individual specific. And that is what a predictor can be developed for all populations for depending on which culture you are looking at. For example, for Indian cuisines, we may want to, or India and Indian population, we may want to develop a similar uh, predictor, a glucose level predictor as was done by the Weizmann, Weizmann Institution. So in summary, computational gastronomy, once again to highlight, brings together data and the power of computation and tries to bring forward the future of the food in terms of making food computable and various tools and techniques that can be developed, which can change the face of food and beverages industry. We have been already working with industry such as uh, Google Research and uh, Sony AI, wherein uh, and in uh, some other industries as well, which are FMCG companies and beverages company. The idea here is to come up with food beverage pairings, for example, novel food beverage pairings, predicting taste and odor of molecules, culinary fingerprinting of cuisines, which will tell us about what are the likings of a population, dietary interventions that can be potentially be designed food and beverages design, novel ones. And importantly, the direction that we want to take is that of sustainable food innovations. Can we come up with strategies by which local and seasonal can be promoted? New recipes can be designed, which are having ingredients which are local and uh, seasonal. That, that is another direction that we would like to take with our novel recipe generation algorithm. With that, I would like to stop with this quote by none other than Brilla Savarin, who was the writer of this, author of this book called The Physiology of Taste and the one who coined the term gastronomy. While it took 150 years after the coining of the term gastronomy to come up with the niche of computational gastronomy to uh, 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 the, the, the sense of what Brilla Savarin said still rings true. The discovery of a new dish confers more happiness on humanity than the discovery of a new star. And somebody as a teenager who was an aspiring astronomer for me, this rings so much true that I hope to discover with the help of computational gastronomy, new dishes, which are not only tastier, but hopefully healthier. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bagla, for that very interesting presentation and a completely new field for all of us, I think, most of us in the room. Um, I uh, now invite, I mean, originally I had thought that we would get the panelists to sort of respond to each other. Um, and uh, But we now have a lot of questions on the chat. Um, so perhaps uh, we can go uh, go around and, you know, we can begin with Saurabh again, uh, where Saurabh, I also request you to address the questions on the chat and any other points you want to make in relation to the comments of the other panelists. Um, and you can take, you know, three minutes or so. Sure. Uh, sorry, unfortunately, I cannot see any of these questions. Yeah. Oh, can um, okay. Let me let me read out a couple that I can see here. One of them is uh, asking you. Um, as the NSS is no longer being continued and the last round 2016 isn't on the public domain, what other data sources are available at the household level that we could use to understand what's happened to food consumption bundles since 2012? Um, the other one is, um, uh, Professor Subhashish is asking, is the NSS or data completely unreliable? Um, and uh, uh, Prajita has responded saying that it's, uh, it is, um, fairly reliable. Um, yeah. uh, you can. I, I don't know whether you can actually read some of these comments because th th there's an interesting debate on uh, on the NSS or data here. Um, there is also a question about the calorie norm for NSSO. Uh, in 1993, 2,400 calories was set uh, as a threshold for rural as opposed to 2,100 in urban. And Professor Subhashish is saying maybe that's too much. Um, so perhaps you can look at this and if there are any other questions in the room uh, linked to this, then you can respond. Sure. 
Yeah, I I think uh, uh, first question is uh, whether the uh, the discontinuation of uh, I mean the not discontinuation the NSS data is not published since two thousand twelve. So is there any other data? I mean, there is no, at least to my knowledge, there is no publicly available data as large as NSA. So uh, there are definitely some other data sets which are in, the small, in small geographical area, not representative at the national level. And also it goes back to, um, uh, I think, uh, 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 Professor v uh, Veena has uh, said that uh, some NIA data is available, but I'm not sure whether it is available on public domain. We'll be very glad if 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 that is so. And then uh, the individual level data, not the household level data. Uh, that is what. And uh, uh, what else? Yeah. So and also, uh, is there any other question I I missed? Probably there was one question which was already explained by Aparajita that whether NSSO data is completely unreliable. No, definitely. I mean. That is the only that in the in large scale what is available we can we can analyze, and going back to the other other question that uh, I I completely agree what Professor uh, Vina uh, has said that uh, we are too much obsessed with calorie but definitely we have to think that calorie is just an energy I mean it comes from several micro and macronutrients. And that is the very purpose that we looked into much more desegregated diet quality, looking at 12 macro and micronutrients like carb and uh, in fiber and different kinds of vitamins and other salts and other things. So uh, that's why looking at the quality is also important. Uh, any other questions? Sort of, there's one more asking yeah. how effective is the Manush ranking technique developed by IIT Bombay as compared to the other health and nutrition indices such as SGD index, food and nutrition security analysis, and the Niti Aayog's health index. No, I I am not sure. I I won't be able to answer that question because I have not checked that Manush data from IIT Bombay. So if anyone else has looked into it, they will be able to answer. Okay, so sort of, if you wanted to make any other brief remarks, uh, please go ahead. Mm, yeah, I, I noted down. I mean, uh, I mean, almost all of us we agree that uh, the challenges are how we are measuring food consumption and how we are calculating uh, dietary index. That is one one source of uh, important source. And second, I totally agree that uh, in any of these large studies, uh, there are plenty of missing food items. Definitely, I mean, uh, how data scientist is going to help? I'm not sure. I'm skeptical. I'm probably the uh, those who are doing research on fields, they will be able to tell us that if there is any bias, in what direction the bias is, probably we, we, we have seen that the direction of the bias and how big the bias is going to be and how we're going to uh, statistically incorporate those biases if we have a lot of missing items in, in large uh, questionnaire. The other thing which came to my mind that probably we are, we are, we are, we are in misinterpreting a lot of these uh, data and results, particularly when it, it comes to the media. First of all, NFHS is not a census. It is a survey, okay? And uh, then if it is a survey, we cannot simply say that this is what uh, is the truth of the population. This is just an inference. So the point estimates when they, when they put the statistics of the, the sex ratio, uh, it is not that what is there in the population. I mean, they are not reporting what is the confidence band. I mean, how 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 far it can and it can move. I mean, those are the things very, very problematic when you simply say that, look, for the India as a whole, we have, uh, we have crossed that, uh, the gender, uh, the, the sex ratio thing. We have to keep those things in mind. So probably more and more education for the media and all other people that how to really, I mean, the data is a very, very problematic thing. I mean, if you do not know how to interpret it, better not to start interpreting it. So in, this, this actually directed towards us as well. Like, those who claim to be data scientists. So that is my final point. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Um, I'll now invite Sudha. Um, if you can uh, you know, respond, please. Um, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, one thing uh, that I want to say is uh, I do share the uh, share Saurabh's skepticism about what uh, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of that can really tell, uh, you know, do with the larger problems because uh, there is a market, right? Uh, there's always a market, especially in India. I mean, um, you know, the, the 
uh, whatever percentage own smartphones uh, i don't have that number but i doubt it would be more than 10 15 percent um there's enough to market to them i mean um if we can tell them you know what the best recipes are or create these uh uh personal uh tools and so on to help them monitor their uh diet and so on there's there's plenty that can be done there uh so you know that the threshold to get into serious uh society level um interventions in food and nutrition will require a lot more than the existing data so it is going to be a steep uh threshold and um will will take a lot of work will um require you to go where there is no light so i'm i i do wonder uh, yeah, another trope is the low hanging fruit. There's so much low hanging fruit that's lucrative and that can be monetized. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how uh, data can be used to solve the big problems, but I think, you know, one would have to take some um, less traveled routes. I mean, one has to triangulate and uh, conjecture and things like that. Um, about the food stuff itself, uh, you know, we've talked about individuals and society and planetary. I mean, the family is a very important component about of food. Um, you know, for those who will not order from outside or have a cook or so on, there is one member in the household, typically the woman who's cooking. And, um, you know, personalized diets are um are, are not really possible for that woman uh we've seen with the uh, icds right the integrated child Devel uh, development scheme where they give these take-home rations and these take-home rations are supposed to be for the children for a month and that never happens they're cooked for the entire family i mean how can you say you keep this amount of food for the child and not cook for the whole family uh, i mean it just gets cooked so um these kinds of dynamics have to uh you know uh, be accounted for in um uh, you know when we are talking food and nutrition the cooking is will continue to be an important part for the majority of the population or or at least a significant portion of the population um in, in terms of food quality, I would like to flag fermented foods and, and other things that we sort of, um, you know, when we think about foods, we just think about nutrients and uh, food groups and so on. But uh, the way in which food is transformed and fermentation is one important part, which we are really losing out in, in uh, diets in India today, the uh, percentage of fermented foods has, has been going down. And um, I mean, I think these are some questions we have to ask. And uh, I just want to reiterate finally again, uh, understanding what people are saying when they're talking about food. Um, so in uh, Karnataka, um, Rail Seema, the inner Andhra Pradesh, uh, uh, Ragi Mudda, the Ragi ball is a very uh, common uh, form of cereal consumption, right? You have that with uh, sambar and other liquidy stuff. Now, there were people who were telling me, oh, you know, we used to mix this with rice and that we'd eat it in the morning and it would stay in our stomach till the evening and i just couldn't understand how that's possible because when it's mixed with rice it just um, you know you're hungry in a, in a couple of hours and later we realized that they were talking about little millet rice and we actually had those um ragi balls with little millet rice and they were right i mean it stayed in our stomachs for four five hours so um people mix up what they eat uh, how they talk about their experiences i mean uh, they are hints to um, other things that they experience that we need to be um, understanding better when we are talking about food and nutrition. Thank you. Thank you, Sudha. Um, that's again very important and kind of the kinds of things that we miss out on if we don't ask for them, those things specifically. And even when we ask, we get answers that need to be passed out more carefully. Um, Professor Shatrukna has rejoined us again, um, and I'll uh, invite her uh, to make again some brief remarks. And there are a couple of questions uh, for you, if I can read them out. Um, one is, if you are familiar with these uh, uh, data sets, one, is, one question is asking, how effective is the Manush ranking technique developed by IIT Bombay as compared to the other health and nutrition indices, such as the S SDG index, Food and Nutrition Security Analysis, and the Niti Aayog's Health Index. I just, uh, I'm sorry, but why are we so stuck up on uh, rankings, indexes? I would like to, I haven't looked uh, Professor Shatrugna, we have lost your voice. Um, 
uh, if you can arrive at where we have. Uh, can you please uh, restart from uh, the beginning? Uh, we are unable to hear you. This next ranking is a uh, we are unable to hear you uh, very well. Okay, and we've now lost her. Okay. Um, maybe we can uh, go to Dr. Bagla uh, and have him respond. And then once Dr. Shatrughna is able to rejoin, she's been having some connectivity issues and was bumped off the meeting earlier. Oh, she's back. <laughs> Um, uh, can you please try again, Professor Shatrugna? Is this better? Can you hear me? No. Yes, yes, this is better. Please, please go ahead. Uh, please go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm wary of in rankings and stuff like that. Also, I haven't looked at this particular one in great detail. So I would refrain from commenting. But I'm wary of all the above or below some great uh, or small nation. Like we are below Bangladesh or above Bangladesh. It gives you a lot of satisfaction. But I would refrain from talking about it. Okay, were there any other comments you wish to make uh, uh, regarding the comments by the other panelists or the larger issues uh, uh, around food, and nutrition, and data? Uh, I think I made most of the points, and unfortunately, my network collapsed and I had to close down because I'm not in Bangalore. I have a good network, building the data card, but it's not working. So, really sorry about it, but. Uh, I enjoyed the presentations and really look forward to talking to people who are going to do big data work. Yeah, if if uh, it sort of brings in the lives of people closer to the data sets that they are generating. Yeah, it would be great. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Shatrughna. Uh, I'll invite Dr. Bagla to respond to uh, the other panelists or to, and, and there is one question for him also on the Q&A, uh, which is there's been a lot of talk about creating personalized food plans as one does with finance or other things. What exactly is the state of personalizing food today? Uh, Dr. Bagla? Can you all hear me in the room? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Professor, yeah, I think now I'm audible, yeah. Yes, now we can hear. Yeah, so quite clearly there has been a lot of interest in trying to create personalized food plans and uh, trying to integrate data right from food uh, consumption to all the way up to genetics is data. Uh, but if you ask me about the progress, I would say it is very primitive right now. And to think about having personalized food plants uh, coming up in short time, I'm a bit skeptical. It might take much longer for us to reach to a stage where we do have a plan which is, uh, which is extremely personalized and gives a recommendation which is uh, going to intervene into your health condition. Uh, if, if, if it is a simple health condition such as, uh, or looking at a simple parameter such as glycemic index, uh, postprandial glucose level, then probably it is still easy. But talking about other parameters or other disease conditions such as obesity or uh, cardiovascular disorders, it is going to be very difficult to come up with uh, meaningful personalized plans. That's my take on it, on that question. And if you would like to make any further remarks. Um... Yeah, uh, a very quick remarks uh, from my side. My, uh, as, as you can see that I come from a space where neither I'm a, uh, I, I'm not a food scientist to begin with, nor I did I work on nutrition earlier. It serendipitously happened that I ended up uh, entering into this zone 
where we are trying to bridge food with uh, data and computing computing techniques right so whatever data we have been gathering i can clearly see there are shortcomings shortcomings in terms of not having representation from for example when i compiled the data of indian recipes they were obviously coming from elite communities and they were not representative of across the uh, recipes from across the strata such as dalit recipes or tribal recipes were not very well represented in those they were primarily vegetarian because we had taken it from tarla dalal's website so, so such are the shortcomings that i i myself notice uh, only later after finishing my analysis but quite clearly as saurav has also highlighted we need to find ways by which we can compile this data at a much granular level at a fine grained level and to be able to do meaningful data driven analysis out of it there's another question for you uh, asking what are your uh, what are the projects you're currently working on and your current areas of research if you can also respond to that dr bagla okay there are uh, within computational gastronomy we are working on a variety of projects some of which i had highlighted in my uh, perhaps the last slide that i had talked about but uh, primarily we are working on novel recipe generation uh, personalized food recommendation app developments for all the databases that we have created making android apps out of it api creations out of these databases so these are some of the projects apart from application of machine learning um to the data that we have created so these in, i am sure some of the students are asking this question so in case they are interested they can get in touch with me okay thank you uh, dr bagla i'll uh, just take a couple of minutes to briefly uh, make one uh, richa there are some questions from the room uh, oh okay sure let's take those and also then this is also an invite for people on online to type up their questions or they can raise their hand Richard, this is a question that is probably should be addressed to you, or you can pass it on. Okay. Um, this is about the intersection of health data and food data. When you look at states, often states do a better job of recording and making public health data on a regular basis, especially connected with the pandemic, than the center has. Why is it that states are not incentivized to do something like NSSO on a more regular basis with more better coverage? I mean, and this is from someone outside the field. So it's really just a very general question. Uh, i think i'm actually going to pass it on either to professor shatrughna or sudha or saurabh any one of them uh, please uh, uh, because again i'm not familiar with this couldn't hear the question uh, can you um, repeat yeah why why is it that states are not incentivized to do the same thing that nsso does on a on a more regular basis so that they just have better data about the state of food security of the population especially given that during the pandemic you said states were better at collecting data yes a uh, professor shatrughna i couldn't get the question it's so soft uh, okay I'll, i'll repeat um it's being uh, professor gautam menon has asked the question uh, that the states were far better in terms of data collection during the pandemic in the last couple of years um and so he's asking that since nsso nnmb all of these are sort of national level data sets um uh, is there any way for states to actually be collecting this data because he suspects they might do a better job in, in terms of both representation perhaps and uh, getting a getting better quality data well even the national level nnmb has been shut down okay for lack of adequate funding and therefore uh that's a big loss because all the skills have disappeared uh data collection on food intakes has a uh, uh what you would say error of about 25% and unlike in the us where your packets tell you what are the ingredients in india there is no two houses with the same recipe so the person who's doing recipes please be careful because the way i make sambar is very different from the way maybe sudha does it or you make so there is no standardization in india number one a huge amount of training is required none of the states have centers of nutrition where there are personnel trained to do diet surveys in fact even among the migrants the government had no figures among the deaths the government had no figures we are in a state where the government is now wary of collecting data 
So it's really a bad time, pandemic or no pandemic. Let's be, there are lots and lots of uh, variables that you have to look into before you shoot off about food intakes, about purchasing NSSO kind, or about family intakes. And uh, I think we need to brainstorm on how do we now reignite interest in the, and skills across the states, but states must also be ready to put aside that kind of money. They are much better at just uh, giving uh, smartphones to the ICDS workers, <laughs> ask them to report. You know that whole joke about smartphones that were distributed, somehow it would reduce the nutri uh, undernutrition. So priorities have to be set right. I think we need a central body whether it's within the government or outside the government, outside the academia, that must now raise these questions. But in the meanwhile, we have hundreds and hundreds of data sets that are being churned out to satisfy uh, researchers and uh, stir up the interests of even the government bodies. So we are really at a bad phase in history uh, where we don't have giants in nutrition or health who will put their foot down. It's a bad time politically too. So this is the scenario as far as I can see. Um, I would just like to, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Shatrugna uh, talked about all the um, state level stuff, but I also just want to flag that there's so much intrastate variation also. And um, uh, so, okay, one thing is that if you collect data, you have to provide uh, appropriate food. And then we just see with the public distribution system, how poorly uh, equipped it is to provide the appropriate kind of food. Um, uh, I, um, I had uh, personal experiences during the COVID second wave where we were providing rations to uh, migrant workers in Bangalore. And we had this whole thing where uh, migrants from different parts of the country were asking for different rations because we were responsive and you know you just we could just see that in in one city itself there's so much uh, variation of food practices diet and so on um, yeah I mean if we were recording these things in a better way we would uh, know more but if we knew more I guess we would also have the pressure to provide more of that can I can I add something I mean uh, I, I totally agree that the problems with uh, the states collecting these samples, just to answer Professor Menon's answer. In fact, within NSSO, there is something called state sample. So the states are incentivized to collect a matching sample, but unfortunately, all these state samples are not properly utilized and uh, tabulated, but uh, do, they have more. But the kind of things you are asking about decentralization, but it is also linked with, in, in any way, like there is a lot of non harmonization of data. I mean, if you just completely leave. And also, this is a field which is very sophisticated. And unfortunately, you have only one institute uh, <laughs> since independence uh, run by, I mean, established by Mohan Abis, and still we are continuing that. But we, we need more decentralization. But we have a statistical commission uh, which looks into it, and they should incentivize to use that. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Um, there must be more questions in the room that we yeah. can take. Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Professor, my question is, how do you go about raising awareness for nutritious food? Because we've been talking about the whole, you know, lobbies and groups that go about commercializing food and they make a choice on what we are going to eat rather than making us. Because, so I'm somewhat, you know, just occupied because you talked about, you know, a millet laddu and, and you know, than, uh, than a packet of biscuit. It is just because the biscuit is better marketed than a laddu. So um, if, if the panel could address this question on reaching to the masses about awareness of nutritious food. Um, I'll again defer to Dr. Shatrugna, if you could please take that up first. Oh, I wish I could. I had an easy answer. But remember, we have home science departments across the country. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, most of the youngsters are trained now to handle chronic diseases. There is very little knowledge of undernutrition that uh, is part of the academic curriculum. So well, I think we need to discuss with uh, state agriculture universities. For instance, in Bangalore, uh, the Egg Coordination Committee is very actively working with us to see that eggs are given in the 
school lunch program, partly because Karnataka decided they will give eggs and then the, uh, the Lingayat community has come down heavily. So there's a political context in which they are part of uh, political and uh, economic reasons. I think every state would have its own issues, but there are agriculture universities and home science departments uh, that could take up this in a big way. Unfortunately, unlike IITs, IIMs, All India Institutes, there is only one NIN, and this can't serve the needs of the whole country. We just don't have that kind of staff. So it's got to be local uh, uh, centers of excellence, such as agriculture universities, that will have to work on this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shatrughna. Sudha, you wish to add? Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I'll share the experience from about, uh, from 2014 when there was some mal uh, deaths due to malnutrition in Karnataka and a whole committee was set up to look at what was happening, why were these families not able to get nutritious food and at that time there was a rapid survey that a lot of uh, uh, community groups did. And uh, I mean, all of the multiple choice uh, questions were fine, but the place where the mothers were asked you know, what they felt and uh, why was this happening? I mean, it was so um, heartbreaking because these women were not were trying to access good food, were trying to access healthcare. They said that when they went to the doctors, the doctors told them buy fruits and vegetables, greens, um, you know, all the things that they were recommending were the expensive things in the market. I mean, there are cheaper alternatives culturally, you know, historically, which these communities consume that could have been promoted. But then what we are seeing from the health departments, nutrition departments, I mean, when we talk about fruits, I mean, I, I talked to a group of youth, about 200 youth, and I asked them name some fruits. They told me apple and um, anar, you know, pomegranate. I asked them, what about your local fruits? And this, this disconnect has built in where their beer and jamun or um, any of the local uh, robust fruits that grow in their uh, regions are not considered good. So when we are talking about how to make communities eat nutritiously, first we should know what nutritious food they had and then think about culturally appropriate, economically uh, viable kind of foods because you can have nutritious food at lower budgets, but you know you have to know your foods. And I, and I think, unfortunately, doctors spend so much time studying that they don't really um, learn about food and cooking and um, things like that. Uh, Richa, I have, a, yes. I have a question. Sorry, I, am I out of turn? Or no, go ahead. Good? Yeah. So uh, this is to Professor uh, Buckler. Like, uh, what we kind of at this stage, what we all agree is that lack of data, huge data gap. We cannot continuously monitor, continuously in the sense, at least every year for this large population. So how how difficult it is to develop an app where it's a community-based uh, participation to collect data. So for example, every time I eat a dish, I take a photograph and upload to your lab server. And then through some image processing, you just quantify what, what is this food and what is there. And that Don't you us... please talk into the mic. Yes. Is it? Okay, thank you. So uh, is it possible to develop such kind of uh, app so that we have more continuous, I mean, at least uh, the, uh, the sample size would not be that large, but at least we'll, we'll have some data to, to take it further. Right. So uh, quite a lot of research is happening within the computer science uh, domain, wherein one wants to take a picture of the food or the dish plate and the recipe would be recognized automatically, right? So there are deep learning algorithms which are being built for various cuisines. Uh, we ourselves are invested in doing it for the Indian cuisine. And just to mention, even Google research, for example, is want, wanting to do the same in the context of Indian recipes. And the idea, of course, is move all the way up to the nutritional profiling of the recipes and thereby building a personalized recommender. But even before that, compilation of the data itself is under, pro I mean, people are doing it. Uh, I wouldn't say the problem is solved, but it's under process. It's happening already. I think Professor Jain wants to say something. 
But I guess just to add to that, sort of, as Dr. Shatrugna said, the recipes might be different. You know, even if the dish may be the same, some of the under underlying ingredients might be different, and that would be difficult to capture. I think uh, the points that we have heard, both from Ganesh and Rita, are very valid. Uh, but uh, I just want to add that there is really this is a very very active field, and has been a very active field for at least. Uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, there is a lot of research in that. Uh, they don't, uh, cannot directly find the recipe yet, but uh, they can uh, find the dish and based on the location, they can try to get more information about uh, what could be the ingredient. There are lots of uh, very strong ingredient databases. Uh, for example, a company like uh, Nutritionic makes very powerful database. There is a company called Pasio, Pasio Health. Uh, that uh, is possibly the best company that uh, can recognize most of the uh, dishes. Uh, they will recognize some of the Indian dishes, not all. Uh, but uh, for example, the common Indian dishes, they will uh, very easily recognize. And the point that is being made is uh, every house may have a different recipe. The thing is, uh, if we, and when we talk about the World Food Atlas, the idea is, can we go to the granularity that we can get recipes and ingredients at much more granular level? Now, granted that every house will have variations, but then every time you will cook will have variation. Uh, but you got to realize that uh, you look very different under different lighting conditions, under different emotional situations, uh, when you are wearing different clothes, but uh, deep learning and other techniques can still recognize you there. Now, in terms of exact value of nutrition, doctors will tell you, you don't really require exact values of nutrition. If you are getting ballpark figure about the major nutrients and micronutrients, you are doing very well. So if you are within a particular ballpark, you, you have solved the problem. Okay, are there any further questions in the room? Uh, on that, I put a question just recently that uh, I'm very curious about all the data that uh, we have been seeing and hearing. At what frequency do we get it? Uh, all this consumption data that we will have been talking, uh, at what frequency we get it and what is the best frequency we can get? Um, I think Saurabh has replied to that on the chat. Maybe Saurabh, you can respond again. Yes. Uh, so uh, if you are looking at NSS data, so they have something called thick rounds and thin rounds. Thick round means they have larger sample size. So that happens every five years. And they have a smaller sample size, which is much more frequent, like almost every year or so. But the purpose of thin rounds is to collect data on uh, price level. And from those thin rounds, we won't be able to infer at the district level. So if your intention is to build or continuously monitor uh, or generate a district level atlas, probably the thin rounds is not going to be uh, sufficient for us. That's why from the, this particular, from this perspective, I asked my question that whether we can have a community participation based uh, app and collecting data for, for population, whether that is a possibility in the future. Anybody else? Uh, any question from the room? Yeah, over to you, Richard. Okay. Um, so I'll uh, just make a couple of brief comments that I missed making when I was speaking earlier. Um, one of the uh, the comments has to do with sort of a bit of a history in the sense that, you know, a lot of our food and agrarian policy uh, built on the Green Revolution and continues to build on the Green Revolution because of a certain understanding of our past uh, as, you know, the, the whole past of famine um, and malnourishment. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. We've again lost Dr. Shatrugna here, unfortunately, due to connectivity issues. Um, but uh, although we don't have adequate data on nutritional 
um, outcomes of the past of people, um, whatever production data that we have tells us that in fact, uh, uh, you know, this, this notion that India wasn't producing enough food, uh, which gave rise to this broader logic of food insecurity, which really pushed us in some senses towards uh, policies associated with the green revolution. A lot of those, uh, a lot of that work is now increasingly being questioned. And, you know, people are looking at uh, the PL480 as a specific policy choice that, you know, so the import of food that we were getting from the United States, it was happening in years of high production, low production, it was sort of independent of our production levels. It was really to, in fact, solve for other issues that we had within our economy in terms of trying to provide cheaper food to industrial workers, um, to subsidize the industrial wage bill. Uh, it was, you know, working for the US because they had excess surpluses. So, you know, there are there are other kinds of histories that are emerging effectively also, you know, linked to that is the entire question of Amartya Sen and the, his work on entitlements, talking about how famine was, uh, has historically in India and around the world never really been a question of production. It's been a question of entitlements and distribution uh, and specific policy choices made by either the colonial administration or uh, mostly the colonial administration in the case of India. Um, so coming back to this, you know, often uh, we, we are, you know, in the public policy discourse, often the question is framed that, you know, um, it, Nutrition security is an elite preoccupation uh, and that a country like India with so much, you know, hunger should really be focused on food security and, you know, uh, which is why you also have a huge emphasis on monoculture farming and yield uh, and productivity of farms, quantitative productivity being a very important metric to measure everything, uh, just like the calorie has been in the nutrition space. Um, and uh, you know, one of the main uh, points I wish to make is that, you know, this this excessive focus on food security, uh, defining food as only carbohydrates and especially only rice and wheat to the exclusion of everything else, in fact, is something that has driven nutrition insecurity in our country. Um, so, uh, again, this, this will certainly require a lot more data to flesh out and figure out. Uh, but the cereal heavy diets and the carbohydrate heavy diets, highly polished carbohydrate heavy diets that we have pushed onto our people in the last 40 years through our uh, public distribution system, but then also through our marketing system um, are, uh, uh, you know, links to public policy choices we have made in the past, uh, which also then means that, you know, th there, is a, there is a dire need for us to bring together data uh, in important ways so that we can reshape public policy choices in the present, bring back, I mean, this goes back to the earlier question that was asked, you know, what would it take uh, to make people aware of nutritious items? Uh, one of the interesting things is that, that has just shown up, uh, it came in my inbox uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, was a circular by the Ministry of Education, which has now asked universities, colleges, schools across the country to introduce millets into their menus, into their hostel and food menus, and has also asked schools, colleges, universities to uh, inform students about the nutritional value of millets. This is in relation with the International Year of Millets 2023 that is being organized by the United Nations, uh, sorry, by the FAO, broadly the UN. Um, and so, I mean, these are, of course, very small measures. Um, but, uh, you know, th this is part of the larger set of policy changes that are required at the state level. Uh, two or three states in the country, Telangana, Karnataka, Orissa, for example, are already buying millets through their procurement guarantee schemes. Um, and there has been a growing shift towards uh, growing millets in these regions. Um, and these, these are the kinds of, I mean, there's a big basket of public policy shifts which are required in the agriculture and food space um, that will have a direct implication on the kinds of foods that are that are available. I mean, that maida biscuit is available because we are overproducing wheat and because we have the technologies to process it. And there is an entire infrastructure built around providing that from Uttarakhand to the Adivasi regions in central India. And so, what would it take to create an alternative infrastructure, which again, as the panelists have said, would have to be decentralized, would have to be uh, specific to specific regions, would have to take on board differences and variabilities, um, would probably bring together not very, very large corporations and scale, but far more decentralization in terms of both uh, 
uh, the kinds of raw materials, but also the kinds of institutional structures, whether it is startups or smaller uh, companies or you know other kinds of organizations in this space. So the diversity that is required to be brought in is not just nutrient diversity, but it's also diversity in terms of our institutional structures that are providing nutritious food to us. Um, I'll stop there. We still have five or six more minutes uh, in this session. So if there are any further questions, either on the chat or if people have raised hands, I, I cannot see if anybody has raised their hand. Uh, um, there's, there's one question from the house. Yes. Oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so my question is... Uh, we have talked about the standardization, which is kind of enforced, so to say, by these big corporations. Right? I saw some ad some time ago where these uh, uh, research about cereals, you know, the, the conflicts. The whole advertise advertorial had come into the newspaper, and then we found out that it was sponsored by Kellogg's. And this is so rampant now, as Professor Jane and other people have mentioned, that even in villages you see all these packets. And at the same time, we have so much of diversity in India in terms of food and nutrition. How do you counterbalance such a strong force? That's, uh, yeah, that's, not... <laughs> that's the big question, right? Because the thing is that the corporations have both time, money, resources to in fact flood the media space uh, with the kinds of information. I mean, the advertorial is the latest in the way many of these, uh, th these things have been framed. Uh, I don't know whether you see, you've seen a lot of those advertisements for, uh, you know, tonic water or protein water, you know, some, some, you know, wonderful water for athletes. And then if you look at the ingredients, there, there's sugar in all of it. Um, so uh, it's, it's clearly, uh, you know, corporate marketing is something that uh, I don't think any state or even the government, well, well I suppose I should take that back. Uh, our governments have been advertising a great deal in the last few years. So perhaps they do have the budgets to counter the advertisement of the corporates. But uh, as you know, Dr. Shatragna said, the nutritionists have no money. We're shutting down all of our research centers that are bringing together data. So what would it take? Um, I mean, if, if, you, if we go back to an, an allied question in a different sphere, um, the question of climate change. I'm not sure whether the analogy might really work, um, but uh, or you know the the broader logic of the environment. I think the place to begin has been school children, and perhaps that's where um, or, or you know Diwali firecrackers. Uh, it's this, the the kids who are telling parents, no, we're not going to get this stuff. It's bad for us. Um, I wonder if that's where we can begin. Unfortunately, a lot of the food targeting is targeted at children. So, you know, one of the worst kinds of statistics you will see is, is schools in the United States with vending machines of Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola and how, in fact, companies these companies have, have sort of integrated into the school system saying we will provide the drinks, so-called. Um, and, and there are exclusive pouring rights, as they are known, where it, it, you know if you have a contract with Coca-Cola, then you cannot allow Pepsi. If you have a contract with Pepsi, you can't allow the others. Uh, but you know the, the logic is all the same. It's this sugary Coca-Cola, I mean, the cola that you're providing. So that level of integration of these companies into our food system especially with little children. I mean, in India, it's like, you know, what, what kind of stuff will you allow to be sold outside the school gate? Uh, so, so, I mean, there, there has to be a combination of, I, I guess, public policy, but also um, getting into, uh, you know, starting at, at beginning with children. Um, and of course, you know, there's an additional issue right here, here right, where I think Professor Jen has mentioned this earlier, um, that a lot of these foods, uh, the ultra processed foods are very addictive. So while we may, you know, have the so called education, or we may want not to eat them, you know, getting rid of your morning biscuit with your chai, I mean, this is something I, I was teaching a class on food and nutrition to my students at IIT Delhi, a few years back. And I still wanted my one biscuit with, with my tea every morning. And so I took it upon me that, okay, by the end of the semester, I'm going to stop that and replace that with something else. Uh, but how do we deal with these kinds of addictions that sugary foods, in fact, create in our bodies? Um, so, you know, these are far more complicated questions. Um, perhaps, you know, data can help us at least, uh, you know, shed some light on them and perhaps influence public policy in very specific ways. But thank you for your question. 
So, Richa, if I may come in, um, you know, um, yeah, corporates and Coca Cola are a problem, but in India, the low hanging fruit is the government because if you say that 70% um, of our food distribution is covered through the National Food Security Act, um, then I think 70% uh, of the nutrition is covered by the National Food Security Act and the public distribution system. So um, I, I, would, you, would you agree with the statement that we don't need data, we don't need, uh, uh, so if you have to, uh, the mainstream nutrition problem is just addressed by changing the, addressing the uh, PDS and the rice and wheat that is distributed there. Would you agree with that? Uh, I think a, a great deal of the answer might certainly lie there. By bringing in pulses, oil seeds, uh, millets back into the PDS, we can certainly make a difference. But that's not going to change the fact that, you know, in rural India, the staple thing that's now available is biscuit, cola, and chips. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe Sudha can jump in here. So somewhere one will also have to address that side. Sudha, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, so one thing is, yes, uh, the, the PDS, what, what is supplied through uh, the public distribution system is, is a huge source of nutrition. And I also just want to add that um, wheat and rice were aspirational foods for communities across the country. So it not just, you know, it's, it's not just your addictive part. There's also this entire, um, uh, you know, wanting to eat the food of the rich. Um, I remember a, an activist from Odisha, uh, uh, the Muni, Munigura uh, area, who was talking about how for the Adivasi, the, the aspirational figure is the pot-bellied banya, right? The, you know, this is the prosperous person. He's nice and fat. He doesn't have to work very hard. So there's, uh, there's a lot of aspirational uh, values also associated with food in India. So, um, you know, when, when people are eating biscuits, they're thinking about the food of the rich and the food that the people in the cities eat. So there is also that entire aspect to be countered. So yes, in PDS, uh, so some of the experiences from Karnataka, um, uh, they started introducing uh, millets uh, and and very uh, nicely also ragi in southern Karnataka and uh, jowar in northern Karnataka. And uh, okay, there is acceptance, but there is also resistance. There are also people saying, why are you doing this? You know, don't cut our rice supplies to give us ragi. Okay, fine, you give us some ragi, but you give us the five kilos of rice that you were giving us. So um, uh, a lot, I mean, uh, yes, PDS, obviously, we'll have to change things, but uh, this, this entire acceptability perceptions um, are things that have to be addressed. Uh, what also happens with data and with, um, you know, with, with, with the high tech options is that uh, what people are saying about food is taken as gospel truth and then everything is tailored around that. And then, you know, there's, there's also a lot of interrogation that we need to do about why people are saying that, you know, this is the food they want to eat. You know, what the um, what is the history and what is the politics or, you know, hierarchies behind, behind that. So um, I just wanted to add, add that bit to this. Thank you, Sudha. And I can see we are out of time. So unless there are questions... Either just of last one, one, one last question from the room. I'll give okay. Yeah, I have the mic. Thanks. Uh, so first of all, Richard, thanks for this very interactive, interesting uh, session. Uh, thinking out loud, you know, uh, on the policy line, so we have, um, for instance, at the national level, a Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, and now economists are talking about it, we should also have an Urban Guarantee Employment Guarantee. So what it takes to actually let's have a food nutritional guarantee scheme, you know, especially for the rural and urban areas. This would be really helpful, like in the long run not sure how it would be implemented. Similarly, the government is doing in a long way, you know, coming up with campaigns to avoid cigarettes because in, it's injurious for health. So how could we actually ensure that the minimum basic intake of food nutrition, you know, at the national and state level could be, um, you know, made as a mandatory thing, especially for the school children or basically at a certain level where it's important. Because we, so it actually requires at also the national level or state level, very hardcore campaign schemes to be undertaken, you know, whether it's through the private sector or the public sector to come up with such innovative campaigns, which target spe specifically for the food nutrition, you know, to be focused in the rural, especially in the remote areas. So um, I think that was just one of the thinking out loud kind of a suggestion. 
Um, so mm -hmm. if I can just quickly respond to that, uh, Professor Subhashish, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, I think the examples that you mentioned, both employment and tobacco, are very specific problems, you know, that uh, ha that you can have fairly straightforward solutions to them. Um, in, the, in the space of nutrition, the solution is actually making it more complex, bringing back diversity and variability into the system, uh, moving away from standardization. And, you know, just like, you know, the, the last comment where we discussed, it's not just about supply, it's also about aspirations and demand. Um, even if you change the state, what do you do about the other kinds of food environments that people find themselves in? Uh, so there are multiple places of intervention that may be required. You know, you may educate children about it, but they may be living in areas which are, in fact, food deserts in our country. And so they may uh, not be able to even locate and buy from fruits and vegetables, even if they may want to, um, or if they can, then it's too expensive. So, you know, th there are multiple things to actually solve for um, in this. And that's, you know, possibly why um, it, it's, we don't yet have, you know, a guarantee act for nutrition, but we have one for food. Um, but um, I think I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Richa. Thanks for the excellent session. So uh, we'll close here and we'll reconvene in half an hour, seven o'clock. Thank you to all the panelists, Saurabh, Dr. Bagla, Sudha, um, and of course, Professor Shatrugna, although she's dropped off, unfortunately. Thank you all. Right.
Hello. Hi. Hi, Sujata. Hi, Hi, Hi. 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 How are you? Fine, thanks. Sujata, long time. I know, really a long time. You must come to Hyderabad with your daughter. Uh, pehle COVID khatam karo. <laughs> oh, yeah. As I said, there are Nothing is a matter. Wear a mask and roam around. That's all. That's my advice for you. I know I took uh, a vaccine and have zero antibodies. I can't believe it. Really? Yeah. You got the test done? Twice. Ooh. So they gave you water instead of vaccine? Possibly. <laughs> So I don't know what to do. And I'm in Nentagi, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> Tell them this in both term and ask uh, our friend. What's I know. Name? I've told them. I said, can I, nahi, koi nahi, aisa kuch nahi. Then they say, no, no, antibodies are not the only thing that you should be worried about. There are other things that vaccines do. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Aparajita. Uh, are they the child's yeah. vaccine or? Booster dose or what are Nothing is now? happening. No, not nothing is happening as of now. Aparajita, we will just uh, give uh, people some five more minutes to troop in, perhaps. Okay, okay. So, Aparajita, can I, uh, after my presentation, because you don't have a QA, thankfully. Ah. So, is we'll okay have five if... minutes of QA after ah. each of uh, the talks for the and respective. Talk. Session talk. We will yes. have five minutes of QA. And sure. after that, we can leave if we don't want to listen. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And is this going to be on uh, on uh, YouTube? Even later on, we can listen. I yes, this so. will be on YouTube. This is uh, being live on YouTube, but so the record can, recording will be. Can, on acha, that same link will work even yes. later on. Even later on, yeah. Because in case I have to also go, I would like to listen to them. Yeah, so it'll be. Available. <laughs> Yeah, Mah Mohanan. But in case I can't stay that late, then I will like to listen to him later. I must say that I have not. It's just something that Aprajita told me to do, so I'm doing it. But <laughs> that's about it. You know, I think Indrani, that's across the country. Everyone is feeling very low and depressed with this COVID. Honestly, so many people we know we have lost. The loss has just been too much. It has depressed everyone's moods, you know. Yeah. Um, it has depressed my mood for so sure. Well, uh, COVID and politics both have depressed me. <laughs> that of course. Politics. If I may say so. But I don't know. I might be taken uh, rested for saying that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Debnath, good to meet you. Where is he from? Professor, you are muted. Where is he from? Hi, nice to meet all of you. Um, so I am from um, uh, IIT Delhi, uh, but uh, I was in Hyderabad for five, six years. I, worked, uh, I was at- IIT, uh, Hyderabad? IIT. No, ISB Hyderabad, in School of Business. ISB Hyderabad. Yes. You were teaching something there? You were teaching? Yes, I was in the uh, Economics and Public Policy Department. Nice, nice. You enjoyed it? Yes, uh, I did, <laughs> but uh, you know, for family reasons and everything else, I had to move. <clears throat> so very, uh, Indrani, have you been there? It's a very fancy campus. Uh, uh, yeah, so typical management schools are tends to be a little bit fancy. Our management school, I know. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's good, you know. It's nice. I mean, really, Rajat Gupta deserves all praise for that. You yes, know, behind the ball. Um, there are so, so many other people as well. Pramath was there and uh, I guess the initial team that they gathered and the administration support that they received to get such a yeah, nice... I know the story of ISB. Take it mm -hmm. from me. It was Rajat Gupta all through. Mm -hmm. It was he. Everybody else then did. Of course, no one individual can ever, you know, uh, do everything. But really, it was his dream his vision, his collection, he went door to door asking for money for ISP. I mean, that's, that really is a very creditable contribution. 
not many NRIs do all that. Sure. I joined much later, so uh, I don't know much of the backstory or the because development you know that of it. After that, he set up PHFI. Mm-hmm. And um, so, I mean, if, if you ask Narayan Murthy, he'll himself tell you how much Ajit Gupta did in collecting money for the ISB and meeting Chandrabab Naidu, meeting and used his whole, uh, you know, position as MD of Nekinsi mm-hmm. to get India these institutions. I don't think there's any NRI who has contributed to the institutional development of the country as uh, Rajat Gupta did. It's really unfortunate. Yeah, it is unfortunate what happened later, but... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Manoj. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well, as I said. Very yeah. nice to meet Hi. you. Hi. Nice Hi. to see friend, familiar faces. Yes. Hi, Sujata. Hi, Drani. Hi, Prasita. Very nice Hi. to see you. Hi. Where are you, Manoj? I'm at Duke. I'm back on campus. So here, this is our my our campus. Oh, I don't know. Can wow. you see? There we are. Wow. Yeah. So that's my view from here. Nice. Have this is been- a very pretty campus. One of these days, we should have you all over. You should invite more people once have travel starts. Vaccinated. <laughs> have you been vaccinated? Otherwise, we can't talk. Oh yeah, yeah. You. I'm boosted I mean, even. The American vaccine comes through the computer. We heard that. <laughs> it's actually a microchip that they implant so that Bill Gates know knows what, what I'm do. doing. Yeah, what you can get started now. Yeah. Oh, recording in progress, so we better keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so shall we start, uh, Shubhashish? Now that we're equal, equal panelists and attendees, we can. <laughs> yeah, so let me, uh, let me welcome everyone to this session. Uh, this is the last session for today. Um, this is uh, broadly on uh, socioeconomic determinants of health. And we have an exciting panel uh, lineup of um, talks, uh, ranging from understanding uh, gender disparities in health, uh, health demand, the role of health insurance, challenges uh, in front of health policy, and so on. So. Um, I first invite uh, Professor Shishit Devnath, uh, who is uh, at IIT Delhi. So Shishit, you can take over. Uh, thank you, Aparajita. I hope uh, I am audible and uh, yes. it's a, g- a great opportunity to finally uh, shed off the COVID blues and participate in some interesting seminars. So um, this is a 20 minute talk. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. And this is based off one research paper that we are currently writing, but definitely um, I'm not going to present everything that is in there. I'm just going to talk about some ideas that I have been thinking lately. And uh, <clears throat> so let me first uh, talk a little bit about uh, one stylized fact, uh, which is the changing burden of disease. So um, in many developing countries, including India, we are uh, noticing that the burden of disease uh, due to communicable maternal and neonatal neonatal diseases are continuously decreasing Uh, because of various factors. And I don't want to get into the factors, but at the same time, simultaneously, the the burden of non-communicable diseases are increasing. So heart diseases, lung diseases, and uh, uh, oncology related diseases. These things are uh, creating uh, or, or these things are causing more deaths compared to uh, communicable diseases. And that is evident from these two graphs that I'll share. So this is uh, a, you know, roughly showing the burden of disease uh, due to various um, our burden of disease or um, um, the causes of death essentially for various diseases. And uh, the orange area that you see collectively represents the Uh, communicable maternal and uh, neonatal diseases, uh, how much they contribute towards uh, the number, total number of deaths. And this is only for India. And uh, this is from 1990s, so way back. And uh, recently, uh, you can see that it has shrunk uh, sizably. And uh, uh, the the blue area dominates uh, this particular graph, showing that uh, the burden uh, deaths due to communicable, non-communicable diseases have increase substantially. Uh, <clears throat> so why is this fact uh, interesting or why we should pay attention to this fact? Well, non-communicable diseases are very expensive to treat. And uh, 
Um, in our country, uh, my talk would be exclusively, you know, India specific, uh, you know, a lot of healthcare expenditure is out of pocket. So in 2000, uh, the, the percentage of healthcare expenditure, which was out of pocket stood at 72%. It has decreased substantially, but still hovers uh, above 60% uh, even um, in 2020. And uh, this is worrisome because for poorer household, uh, the way typically these healthcare expenditures, mostly catastrophic are met, are by selling off an income generating asset. And that might push them towards poverty, which is of course not an welfare enhancing outcome. And uh, <clears throat> so this is some stylist fact that uh, we have been observing. And we also observe that the role of the state and the, the federal government uh, towards this healthcare sector had steadily been you know, switched, switching away from provision of healthcare towards financing of healthcare. What do I mean by that? Well, um, several state governments have rolled out health insurance plans. Uh, of course, these are means tested. Uh, not everybody is eligible. Um, based on some eligibility criteria, and that uh, these health insurance plans are covering tertiary diseases uh, uh, in, in, in India. And the several state governments have come up with their own plan. Um, Arugishri was one of the most successful ones uh, in Andhra Pradesh and uh, Telangana, Arstwal Andhra Pradesh. But since then, and uh, even maybe some of their uh, some of the programs were there before Arugishri as well. So we have recently Swastha Sathi, which has been introduced uh, in West Bengal, and the government claims uh, a success in implementing these. Then, of course, Arugishri. Then we have Bhamasha Swastha Bima Yojana in Rajasthan, and then Punjab has one. And then finally, uh, we have Ayushman Bharat Bima Yojana, which is Pan India. Uh, but uh, of course, there is a predecessor for all this. We had RSBY a long time back uh, along similar lines, which were exclusively for BPL families. And uh, what these health insurance plans do, uh, typically, <clears throat> they cover tertiary care, and these are. Uh, based on eligibility, which are means tested, particularly for uh, mm -hmm. you know families which are socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged. Uh, mostly in most states, uh, it's the BPL families which are eligible, and covers only inpatient expenditures. And you know, most of these are they claim to be cashless. You don't have to pay any cash. These are on family floater basis uh, per family. A certain amount of money is there, which can be. Uh, um, availed uh, for a given year. And under most of these programs, the, the hospitals apply for empanelment to the insurance authority. And this uh, for this empanelment, they have to satisfy a certain criteria. They must have some quality standards. They must have some basic sizes and some amenities uh, to be able to serve patients under who are enrolled under these health insurance programs. And uh, <clears throat> after these Mostly private, uh, public health you know, hospitals are also eligible for empanelment. So after uh, these empaneled hospitals, they provide their services, they can claim the, the, the predetermined surgery or procedure specific prices from the insurance authority, which typically is the state by default. They create a trust and the trust reimburses these hospitals, whatever price that has been um, determined um, even before the empanelment process uh, started. And uh, this is also, you know, decision or uh, how do we set the price for these procedures? That's also a, a debatable uh, policy issue. Um, I'm not getting in there. There's a lot of uh, debate around it. Uh, hospitals, of course, want the rates to be higher. The government wants to keep it lower. There's a trade-off if you keep the prices too low, then uh, you know, hospitals which can provide quality care, they may not want to participate. And if you keep it very, very high, then that's not sustainable for the government. So uh, there is this trade off between at what price do you really reimburse these impaneled hospital for these services that they provide. And uh, there have been multiple studies. Uh, I will quote one, which was by Fan, Karen, uh, Karan and Mahal, Ajay Mahal published in 2012. And uh, they show that eligibility for uh, one of such insurance program reduces out-of-pocket expenditure in, in Andhra Pradesh. And I'm sure probably this happened for many other uh, state-sponsored health insurance programs as well. <clears throat> so 
they are good in the sense they are reducing out of pocket expenditure and uh, uh, but there could be some reasons to be a little bit worried and uh, the reasons could be you know uh, there is a sizable increase in the demand for healthcare because essentially for the eligible population the price of healthcare services is becoming almost zero so once you are getting covered, uh, so these are cashless uh, empanelment is or enrollment is done uh, on the basis of some nominal or even no payment at all. So in, in context of India, where the target population might not have education, they might not know what healthcare procedures they actually need. Uh, they depend on uh, whatever the hospitals or the doctors are prescribing them. We have a huge asymmetry of information in this whole market, right? And in the presence of asymmetry of information where the patients are not paying the actual price or even the reduced price of a particular uh, services, there is a heavy chance of producer moral hazard. So it might be possible that uh, uh, producers might push unnecessary treatments towards the patient who unknowingly will go under the knives uh, and then the hospitals will claim the benefits or the packages from the government. Now, is that a concern? Uh, well, anecdotally in the popular media, we see uh, these reports popping up uh, every now and then. So this is a uh, local vernacular news, uh, which says that there are unnecessary, um, you know, um, sur surgeries that are done for in West Bengal uh, uh, in health insurance eligible patients, Swasta Sati. Then there is uh, uh, the reports uh, popping up in many other newspaper articles that uh, unnecessary hysterectomies are performed in uh, many states. Uh, then this is an NDTB report which shows that uh, school children, you know, unnecessary uh, appendectomy were done on school children uh, because the hospitals wanted to claim the 20,000 rupees benefit. Uh, and these kids just uh, went to uh, a particular nursing home with mild uh, stomach uh, ache complaints and so on. So these are early telltale signs uh, that we should be worried about, uh, <clears throat> or at least we should be caution cautious. So what we did, uh, by we, I mean uh, one of our PhD students, Komal Sarin and Professor Saurav uh, Paul, who was earlier there in, in the previous panel, so we asked this question, can, can these publicly financed health insurance programs uh, has the possibility of becoming counterproductive, ushering in unnecessary medical procedures, having adverse health consequences? Do, should we be worried about these? And, uh, <clears throat> and we, we studied this question in the context of Ardugishri Health Insurance Scheme. And... Uh, uh, we, in particular, we looked for uh, unnecessary hysterectomies, whether they were done or not. Why hysterectomies? Well, mainly because of uh, data limitations on tertiary healthcare um, you know, in utilization. Uh, we could do this analysis because the last round of uh, family health survey uh, actually had a module on hysterectomy. And they, they collected data on whether um, women of a particular age has undergone a hysterectomy procedure, where did they get it? And uh, this was asked all um, pan India and when the surgery was done. Right. And uh, then we further ask this question, does these indiscriminate hysterectomies, if at all any, uh, led to unintended impact on women's health? So <clears throat> why particularly Arugishri? Well, uh, it had a very generous package for hysterectomy. That's, uh, that's the reason why, why we picked it. Um, the, it's another typical health insurance plan and one of the most successful ones. And uh, it covered about 940 procedures, including, of course, hysterectomy. And it was based on a private uh, public partnership model. The, the objective was to you know, provide universal, at least for uh, most of the population, because the eligibility criteria for Ardugishri was uh, below poverty line households. And uh, uh, about more than 80% population in Andhra Pradesh, actually, uh, I don't know whether they are poor or not, but they hold a BPL uh, card. So uh, this was cashless and uh, providing tertiary care through a network of private public hospitals, which were impaneled under the Arabishri Trust. And uh, 
reimbursement rates were higher compared to other schemes, particularly for hysterectomy, and uh, private payers had incentives to induce demand to earn revenue. So that's why we did it. And uh, probably uh, the, we have a table here which shows the reimbursement rates uh, for hysterectomy under our wishery, which is the first row. And you can see that per hysterectomy, uh, impaneled hospital could claim about 20,000 rupees, which is substantially higher than uh, many other <clears throat> uh, health insurance uh, plans in, in India. So <clears throat> we did uh, dig up a, a little bit and we figured out that uh, there was quite a bit of a media reportage on this issue that uh, unnecessary hysterectomies are being performed. And the state government was uh, aware of it and they intervened and in the middle of uh, the implementation of the Arabishri, hysterectomies were taken uh, out of this. So hysterectomies are no longer uh, you know, reimbursable or private hospitals are not allowed to perform hysterectomies under our grocery. They can be performed only in public, public hospitals as of now, but that's not how it was initially. So, <clears throat> uh, and perhaps this map uh, tells a lot about the correlation between access to uh, health insurance and hysterectomy rates. And so uh, the, the map, uh, in the on the left on the screen shows uh, district wise uh, the rates of uh, 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 or the households percentage of households which have access to state uh, sponsored health insurance plans and you can clearly see that uh, the districts in andhra and telangana tamil nadu north is they stand out because uh, the lot of families have state provided health insurance and on the right hand side this is from nfhs data where we plot the the prevalence of hysterectomy, number of hysterectomies performed per thousand uh, women. And you can also see there, uh, perhaps Bihar and notably Andhra and Telangana stands out uh, among a few other districts in India as well. And the correlation uh, between the, the, the districts in, in the two figures left and right, it is very, very high. And that is what uh, we are tr trying to figure out. So um, I'm not going to, since this uh, time is limited, I'm not going to get into the details of the estimation of the data, but I'll show you roughly. These are, we don't claim these results to be causal results, but uh, these are very, very strong correlations. Uh, and uh, the results uh, go through uh, various uh, strict robustness tests as well. So what we found that Aragishri eligibility uh, leads to, or at least high, is highly correlated with an increase in the probability of undergoing hysterectomy by about 3.3 percentage points. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the place of the hysterectomy also matters. So <clears throat> eligibility you know, increases the chances of hysterectomy performed only in private hospitals. Uh, the, the, you know, it doesn't really increase the chance of hysterectomy uh, performed by a public hospital at all. We find just zero effect there. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> And we also find that uh, uh, the districts where there are a lot of hospitals, uh, you know, who are impaneled or who are um, serving a tertiary care, uh, there where the competition among the hospitals is are high, women are more likely to report that they they have undergone hysterectomy, and, uh, and they were eligible for Argishri as well. So Argishri eligible women are more likely to undergo hysterectomy in districts within Telangana where, uh, where the competition among the hospitals are really, really high. And this is uh, the typical way and this literature uh, tries to show that there might be telltale signs of induced demands. And the theory of induced demands is uh, that, you know, there are a lot of competition among the, the providers, healthcare providers, and due to competition, they have to push these surgeries. And uh, it started with a seminal paper, which showed that uh, wherever uh, the fertility rates in the US declined, because again, the same profitability idea, wherever the fertility rates in, in the United States dropped the number of, or uh, the percentage of births due to C-section uh, increase uh, sizably. We also find similar results uh, as the, the healthcare market becomes very, very competitive uh, hospitals in order to remain profitable, they, what we find that it's highly correlated that in those districts, eligible women are more likely to undergo hysterectomies. Now, why hysterectomies? Why should we be worried about it? Because it's one of the most uh, prevalent surgery uh, among uh, not only women, but uh, 
in general. So this is uh, surgical removal of uterus, and it's the second most frequently performed medical procedure in women after C-section. And uh, in 2016, the prevalence was about 17 hysterectomies per 1,000 married women between the ages of 15 and 49 years in India. And uh, uh, this prevalence rate is continuously increasing, but the worrisome fact is that it is increasing for women below 50 years or below 45 years of age, which is not medically warranted because a hysterectomies for a younger women is, is, uh, is bad for their health. What could be the consequences? Well, <clears throat> these hysterectomies, especially in younger women, they are not benign. Uh, they can cause uh, genitourinary complications, uh, infections, uh, UTIs. Uh, women who underwent hysterectomy, they experience uh, significantly lower bone density measurements. Uh, these are all medical literatures that we are citing here. And uh, it also increases long-term risk of cardiovascular and metabolic conditions, especially uh, in women uh, uh, who are below 35 years. Um, and uh, because uh, it might affect uh, um, <clears throat> several ways the, the body works. Now, uh, fortunately for us, NFHS collected some self-reported data on these conditions as well, whether they, they had gone through any problem uh, which is related to genitourinary diseases, musculoskeletal diseases, or cardiovascular diseases. And we still find that those women who had undergone hysterectomy, they are more likely to complain that they had actually undergone, even though these are self-reported, but this is coming from a really, really large data set. So they are more likely to complain that they are going through these and these diseases. So, <clears throat> um, you know, to, to summarize what, what we find here is that uh, uh, rising health expenditure, you know, not covered by insurance uh, has catastrophic uh, effect on welfare. There are several studies which has shows that how catastrophic health expenditure may lead to poverty. Some of them are um, really the very, very high estimates. And uh, Publicly financed health insurance are a great way to deal with these expenditures, the way typically India has done and many other developing nations have done. And But there, uh, you know, in many countries, it's universal. In our country, it is means tested and mostly uh, through the, eligib the eligibility condition is uh, below poverty line households. However, we know that uh, healthcare market suffers from a lot of information asymmetry and uh, people may not have a lot of information about whether they need a particular procedure or not. Uh, the practice of getting second opinion is also uh, often remote in rural areas and especially if they don't know, you know how to interpret a medical report, they can be duped very, very easily. And uh, so due to this nature of this market, uh, which was, uh, you know, predicted long time back by my seminal paper by Arrow, that uh, inducement uh, of unnecessary demand remains a concern. And uh, we do find that at least for hysterectomy, it is very much there. And the government took action on, on time and hysterectomy was banned uh, to be performed by impaneled private hospitals, uh, but still they can continue in private uh, public hospitals. And, uh, but there are several other such procedures that we could not study because of data limitations. And this could be C-section, appendectomies, and we, these are typically uh, very, very prone to in inducement. So um, <clears throat> what we propose uh, is that we need a meticulous scrutiny of the claims that these hospitals are, impaneled hospitals are filing to the insurance uh, uh, agencies to, to get reimbursed. Uh, these are currently has no co-payments at all. So those who are using it, the end users, they don't end up paying anything. That is good and that is bad in a way as well. So if they are not having any co-payments, then uh, you know they, they typically don't tend to care too much about what procedures they, they are getting in. Um, um, restriction of medical services prone to inducement uh, to uh, public hospitals only. That could be one solution. Typically, the governments take this particular route because uh, the doctors and the, uh, the other staff in public hospitals, their uh, incentive structures are quite different in India. They are paid a fixed salary versus uh, private hospitals where their salaries could be a function, direct function of the number of surgeries and procedures that they are performing. So, so I guess Shishir, we are out of time. Sorry huh. to stop you. We have a lot of questions. Huh. Maybe okay. uh, you can wrap up and uh, yeah, I'm just on the last last yeah. line. Yeah. Okay. 
So, uh, so these are some of the potential solution to the problem. Uh, but uh, this, uh, you know, this proliferation of state health insurance, this is this is good. We are getting a lot of population covered, uh, which can prevent catastrophic health care. But there is this uh, reason that we need to be uh, cautious about or worried about. So I'll stop here and I'll see if we have we can answer some questions. So uh, we are out of time for the first. Uh, uh, session uh, for this first uh, talk. So maybe I suggest that you uh, take up the questions on the chat box and you um, put your answers. There are a lot of questions I can see. Mm. Um, and so maybe you could uh, respond in the chat box. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, we will move to the next speaker. Uh, I thank now you. invite uh, Professor Indrani Gupta. Uh, who is uh, the head and head of the Health Policy Research Institute at the Institute of Economic Growth. Um, Indrani will be speaking about whether um, health budgeting is necessary for targeting um, gender, uh, sorry, gender budgeting is necessary for targeting gender disparities in health outcomes. So over to you, Indrani. Thank you, Prashita. Can you see my screen though? Yes. Okay, so uh, thanks very much for having me here. I, I must say that I wasn't quite clear about the, um, uh, the theme of today's uh, seminar series, but nevertheless, I, I was told that this has something to do with data. So here is a piece of work that I, we have been doing on, uh, on a particular, uh, you know, I'm on the Lancet Commission on Gender and Health. So uh, before this, I've never worked on gender. Uh, actually, I work more on uh, Professor Devnath's area on health financing. But this time, I thought, let's look at gender budgets and see whether they lead to better health outcomes. So that's the motivation for this talk, really. It's not uh, a finished product at all. It's just some of the thoughts that I had while I was working on this paper. So basically, why am I looking at gender budget? Well, world over, we know that gender budget or gender responsive budget this has been undertaken by a number of countries. And it's been evolving continuously. It was started in Australia and then it got impetus at the Beijing uh, Women's Conference in 95. And the way it is defined is that it's a gender-based assessment of budgets incorporating a gender perspective at all levels of the budgetary process and restructuring both revenues and expenditure in order to promote gender equality. Or you can say it's integrating a clear gender perspective within an overall budgetary process using analytical tools. So basically, it is uh, a, an approach to that uses fiscal policy and administration to promote gender equality. That's what gender budgeting is. Now, initially, the movement started with this very narrow focus on improving the inequality between men and women. But now it has been expanded and it includes the third gender as well. And basically, the point is that uh, it is to ensure that budgets respond to the needs of all people of various gender, I mean, all the three genders. Now, countries have had very different approaches, different players and focus and extremely heterogeneous examples. In fact, when we started looking at the literature, we found that there is no one, uh, uh, you know, a size that fit all. It's, it's really a very heterogeneous group. And you can uh, if you really want to know more about uh, gender budgets, you can read uh, Diane Elson's, she's a guru here, uh, in the Rutledge Handbook of Feminist Economics. Now, essentially, it's a res gender responsive budget we have to plan uh, on gender disaggregated data. And that's why I thought this was good for this talk, because I thought there's something to do with data uh, that we needed to talk about. So you need to need gender disaggregated data to do your gender responsive budget. You also need to do multi-stakeholder consultations. You have to work at, with different tiers of government, the lawmakers, parliament, researchers, civil society, the works. You have to track and monitor, and you have to evaluate and technical evaluation. Now, since it involves budgets, a truly gender responsive budget has to look at both how funds are raised and how they're allocated. So you have to reorganize revenue raising as well as spending. And you have to have a flexible tool. 
And there are several tools for GRB, depending on the national local context. I won't get into details, but if you really want to know, there's a lot of literature on the different kind of tools that you have. Uh, you can have a public expenditure incidence analysis, public finance management analysis, et cetera, the different kinds of tools. And as Trotsky says, this is basically gender budgeting is supposed to be just good budgeting so that you prioritize your budget depending on um, which gender is experiencing what. Now, before I go into health and gender, I wanted to say what indicators would be useful to see impact across all sectors, whether health or otherwise. When we started looking at the literature, we found far fewer papers and reports on indicators to measure performance of gender budget. So everybody is doing gender budget, but how many are actually measuring and how many are evaluating? Um, even in developed countries, limited application of gender perspective and spending review. Uh, there are a few quantitative papers on impact, like on labor force participation, school enrollment, and macro aggregates like growth. And overall, it seems that gender responsive budgets have made an impact on uh, political and administrative representation of women, some on labor market conditions and female employment, some on school education, and things like bank accounts with women as primary account holder. Uh, and there are some progress on the third gender as well. Now, our interest was, since I work on health, have gender budgets reduce gender inequalities in health? How do you even measure that? Now, uh, certain papers are there, a scoping review, which sought to identify and analyze policies uh, that aim to reduce gender inequalities. There were lots of articles published under this between 2002 and 18. And the review indicates a few very important points that few policies have been formulated, implemented, or evaluated to tackle the problem of gender inequality in health. Now I'm talking only about health because there are failures in design, but especially in implementation, there's a lack of capacity and awareness among policymakers, underfinancing, over-bureaucratization, lack of gender disaggregated data, and absence of women's participation. These are some of the problems that, that emerge. And an analysis of what works to transform gender norms in health-related outcomes has been taken. It's a Lancet, uh, an article by Heyman uh, and others in uh, Lancet. And the results indicate that improved equality in education and at work have had positive impact on health outcomes. So in a way, you're saying that uh, the health outcomes have been impacted by more by improved education and, and work rather than on, on uh, specifically gender budgets. Um, governance has been an important part of that, uh, and for sustainable norm change and health improvements, programs that have been multi-sectoral and multi-level and have gone beyond the health sector, those have worked the best. Um, my thing was, so now let's move back from the literature review and see how to assess the impact of GRB on health outcomes. Now, there could be a few ways to do this. One is that you look at improvements and in indicators like MMR and uh, other mortality rates for all genders. You can see whether the gaps between the two genders on mortality rates have narrowed over the years, especially in countries that have huge gaps. Um, improved treatment seeking behavior of all and narrowing of gaps therein, and many other indicators on specific disease burden and health outcomes. So when I started looking at that, I first looked at the existing gender inequality indices that exist in the world in, globally. So you have the gender inequality index across human development and regions. And if you look at the left side, you can see that there is a high correlation between obviously low uh, level of human development and gender inequality. So higher is your uh, uh, development, human development, higher will be your gender inequality. And that's across the, uh, very nicely the, uh, the, the slopes are. If you look at regions, you can also see a similar result. The developed regions have lower gender inequality and the less developed regions have higher gender inequality. And if you look at the actual values, the gaps are humongous, very, very stark. So very, whereas you have an MMR of 14 in high human development, you have an MMR of 572. So there is, even today in 2019, despite the fact that many, many countries have been doing gender-based budgeting, you don't seem to have, you can't find those uh, results, at least in the summary indicators that are available in the world. Now, if you look at specific uh, 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 gender gap reports, uh, you know that the World Economic Forum brings out uh, a gender gap index based on economic participation and opportunity, 
education, health and survival, and political empowerment. And you see which countries have and have not undertaken a gender budget. You can see that it, it varies. So for instance, New Zealand has, doesn't have one, Lithuania doesn't have one, Switzerland doesn't have one, et cetera. And some other countries do. And these are the top 10 countries that have closed the gender gap. So even among the countries that have closed the gender gap, it doesn't seem to be the case that all countries have a gender budget. In India, out of the 156 countries ranked, uh, we are basically uh, <laughs> quite at the bottom. So uh, less said the better. Now, I was looking at, now these are all work in progress. So let me just say what, we, we, what we're trying to find out. So we were trying to see whether the high MMR countries, uh, the MMR countries with high GDP and MMR uh, in, in low GDP countries, is there any convergence? Is there any you know, divergence between countries that have started gender budgeting and countries that haven't? One problem was that different countries have started gender budgeting in different years. So there is that staggering, you know, staggered uh, initiation problem. And also these are all different tools that they have used. So it is a bit, because initially we thought we'll do some econometric analysis, but I think that I have to kind of wait or figure out how exactly to do that, given that there is no homogeneity. Nevertheless, what we found was that there's hardly any trend in countries with and without in, in, the, in the trends on MMR. And then I looked at countries specifically with low spending on health as a share of GDP and tried to look at the mortality rates per thousand persons in, in a bunch of countries. And I didn't see, uh, you know, once the, that, that line, uh, the vertical line shows when the gender budgeting started, and then subsequently you see the trends, you don't really see any narrowing, uh, pretty much the, the, the two have remained the same. Now, these are countries with pretty high uh, mortality rates. So you could have seen a further narrowing. It's not as though they've finished their task of, of, of narrowing the gap. Similarly, the case with other uh, countries like Bangladesh, Cameroon, and Benin. Then one looked at countries without gender budget at all. And again, you don't see any patterns. Uh, the countries have either uh, remained pretty much the same over the last several years, irrespective of the fact that they don't have a, a gender budget. Now, the key points that we took away from just this kind of uh, uh, visualizing and, and, and comparing uh, of values is was that many countries with high MMR and a gender budget do not seem to have been able to improve their, let's say their MMR significantly or narrow the uh, all-cause mortality in those countries. And many other countries that have not yet adopted the GRB, gender inequality and health outcomes have improved, uh, which is very nice. Uh, however, in countries like Brazil, Japan, etc., and some other countries, gender budget has resulted in special attention given to health outcomes in some of the countries. Now, countries can allocate resources based on a prioritization exercise, irrespective of whether or not they have a gender budget approach. Now, the reason why we this is very important is that sometimes when you have a bandwagon on which one has to get on and, and everybody is doing gender budget, so India is also doing, doing gender budget. And we have looked at India's gender budget with a you know a fine tooth comb, we have gone through it, by the way, that is not being presented here. Uh, it is It sometimes deflects the attention away from what you actually need to do. So first of all, a good gender budget approach requires gender disaggregated data at the very least and a proper evaluation subsequently. Now, if you do not have gender disaggregated data, I don't see how you can do gender budgeting at all. Now, what kind of gender disaggregated data do you need to do good gender budgeting? Well, here are some papers we found that have actually looked at the gender differences. So let's say being unmarried conferred higher risk of stroke and all-cause mortality for men than women. Uh, diverse separated men had a high risk of cancer mortality and CVD mortality. Now, this is a result of a systematic review. What would that tell you that if you had uh, NCD funding and you had to spend on somebody, uh, you know, uh, you had to prioritize, this is the way you would prioritize. And we have found a whole bunch of such studies where you actually, they had done the analysis on a gender disaggregated way. So for instance, the last one, uh, all cause mortality increased as diseases are added to an individual, women and men presented different mortality patterns according to multiple mor morbidity. That was a Brazil study. Uh, similarly, I, I mean, I know time is short. A study published in Lancet Global Health looked at gender inequalities in health and well-being for 40 low and middle income countries. And they found significant variation across regions and countries 
Gender inequalities in well-being emerge most prominently and increase during adolescence. And compared with girls, boys experience excess oil cause mortality. Now, the reason I'm saying all of this is if that is the case, then this is where you would be investing, not on girls necessarily, but also on adolescent boys or in addition to girls, more on adolescent boys. So that kind of gender segregated data is a must if you're doing gender responsive budgeting. Do we have that in India? Of course not. Now, when you look at other countries where you have had healthcare reforms, let's say China uh, and at the progress in US3, uh, all of you know, and uh, Sujata I'm sure is the person who's the most expert in this. There are other reasons why the health outcomes have changed. For instance, they've invested heavily on a surveillance uh, system. They have invested on social health insurance. There's been a huge gap in uh, healthcare expenditure of the government, etc. Now, another very interesting paper that we found was Rwanda and Burundi. Both the countries had been ravaged by a lot of political uh, issues and, uh, and similar histories, but one country did better than others, though they started at a very similar uh, stage. And the results indicated that a strong public leadership and investment in health information system drove the results in Rwanda compared to Burundi. So you could actually improve your health outcomes for genders despite uh, whether or not you had a gender budget. Lastly, I, we also looked at the public expenditure and financial accountability of PIFA, which is a partnership program with the European Commission and a bunch of other global agencies. And it provides a framework for assessing and reporting public financial management using quantitative indicators to measure performance. They find, this is the 2020 global report, that countries on average perform better in preparing their budgets and executing them, and gender considerations in the design, implementation, and evaluation of budget policies are not yet mainstreamed in most countries, though some countries have made some important advances in this area. And they have looked at a huge long list of countries, including India, of course. Very briefly in India, one slide only, I have, we have looked at India's case uh, in a longish paper. We know our low health financing, that's an old story now. Uh, but when you look at gender budget, within uh, our, our health budget, the share of, first of all, the share of gender budget in GDP is, has been roughly the same over the years, it's slightly less than 1%, of which the MOHFW's share is about 20%. And within the MOHW, about 40% is on gender budget. Now, given that Indian government spends 1% of its GDP on health, this is a very, very insignificant amount and one wouldn't expect anything to actually come out of it. Then the interesting part is, what is this gender budget on within the ministry? The items include uh, things like HSS, health system strengthening, routine immunization, polio, identity deficiency, et cetera. And this recent scheme launched by the PM. Uh, so what it does is it kind of, uh, in a very rote kind of way, it, it just allocates, so this is for males, this is for females, males, females, like that. So there's not much of a, a reason behind these, these allocations, especially because nobody has been looking at whether uh, these are required or what has happened in the past with those budgets. Now, the so prioritization process is not systematic or evidence-based and data requirements are significant. So without a thorough understanding of what is required, what has been spent and what has been achieved, gender budgeting, I think, is, is doesn't really help. Though there are some sparks like education, labor market outcomes that have really worked. So in sum, the countries that have made good progress on health outcomes and inequalities are mostly countries that have been able to obviously increase the health spending, not their gender budget so much. With or without gender budget, they have moved ahead. And developed countries with gender budget have been mostly focusing on very narrow issues like, you know, uh, political, you know, uh, ceilings for women or wages or maternity leave, etc. Also on political participation, they have gained because they've already reached a very high level of health outcomes. And now they can actually focus on the specifics. For developing countries, the range from the basic to more complex ones with different profile of disease burden and significant HSS issues. That's a huge thing to uh, ask. And most of these countries are still in the low development, low health financing space with adverse health outcomes. The primary focus for these countries, countries like India, should not be how to allocate gender budgets and present it to the parliament, but to raise resources for health and universal health coverage and to keep data in a format that can 
if they're at all thinking of doing uh, gender budgeting, they should have disaggregated gender, disaggregated data, which we are nowhere near uh, to doing. Um, there is no point redistributing meager expenditure to fulfill gender budget obligations, which is what we are doing year after year after year, because it's counterproductive and it gives you a false sense of achievement. So it might be better for governments and development agencies to emphasize a few areas for gender budgets so and labor market, because the Narega has actually helped uh, and political empowerment may have helped, but health, I don't think health gender budgets have at all helped uh, India at least and many other countries. So I think we are backing up the wrong tree. Over. Thank you, Indrani, for the great talk. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for Q&A. There are people uh, at Ashoka. So this is a hybrid uh, workshop. So I am just asking if there are any questions from the room. Uh, Professor Shubhashish or anybody else can confirm. Anybody, any questions uh, from here? No, 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 not from here, but uh, you can ask the online audience perhaps. Yeah, anybody uh, who has join, joined online, uh, you can unmute and ask your question or your comment. Thank you so much, Indrani. Can I jump in with a very quick question? So when um, donors, especially donors like Gates, who have pushed um, this agenda of like wanting to make sure that there is a focus on gender, which I think is the right step, um, hear a presentation like you just made that say, you know, that the introduction of gender-based budgeting does not really change outcomes. Do they push back or do they try to then, is the response that to then come back and try to understand why is it that the budgeting process doesn't really help? Um, have you had any conversations with that, that, that part of the global community? Yeah so, yeah, so there are many groups that are actually working uh, a lot on gender budgets, uh, especially in the UK and uh, the, uh, many international NGOs. I think my, uh, my uh, response is that which it's not as though I'm saying don't do gender budgeting, but uh, two things. Countries, we're only talking about health, by the way, uh, Manoj. We're not talking about other outcomes. So as if it comes to health, Countries that have a low health financing uh, kind of uh, uh, scenario, for them, I think gender budgeting is not the important thing at this point. They have to just ramp up their health financing. That is what I'm saying, one. Two, if you have to do gender budgeting in health, then you at least the very least is, you know, have to get the gender disaggregated data. And we don't seem to be moving towards that at all. Uh, how can you allocate resources when you don't know what the outcomes are? Right. And it is not, and since it's no longer a male female thing, it is more nuanced than that. In many areas in NCDIs, for instance, you have to spend on males as well. Yeah. Uh, and also regional. And so there are lots of, I'm not saying it's easy. I don't think it's easy to get that kind of data at all. So Absolutely. if you can't get the data, it doesn't mean that you don't do gender budgeting. I, my last recommendation was maybe you should do gender budgeting in narrow areas of overall economic development but not yeah. for health, especially if you haven't completed your health financing agenda. For us, yeah. for India, for instance, it's enough at this point if we just ramp up our health finances, irrespective of whether or not we're allocating it to the right gender. Thank you. Are there any other questions anybody would like to ask? Okay, so thank you again. We'll move to the third presenter. So uh, let me invite K. Sujata Rao, who uh, is former Indian Secretary uh, in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for Government of India. So uh, Sujata will be talking about the need for revisiting the role of primary healthcare in the era of technological advances. Very interesting, very eager to hear to you. Over to you, Sujata. Thank you, Aparajita, and thank you, Ashoka, and you for inviting me this evening. Um, as Indrani, I too was a bit confused on the format. So now, uh, you know, after hearing both the speakers, I wish I too had a, a PowerPoint presentation that might have been uh, more suitable. But anyway, I have a written down speech, and now it's too late to change the format. So I think you'll all have to put up uh, with my uh, talk, uh, which I hope I will wrap up in 15 minutes. Now, you know, as you all are aware, a key concern most frequently mentioned 
in public discourse is the need to have a health system architecture that has been constructed on the bulwark of a strong comprehensive primary health care. Now, this whole term of primary health care, comprehensive primary health care, is from the, directly from the Almata Conference of 1978, when all countries had resolved that every individual will have access to primary health care. And what did it mean? The comprehensive primary health care meant to not only access to basic health care, diagnosis and treatment of communicable diseases, reproductive and child health care services, treatment for minor ailments, and so on, and uh, preventive uh, programs like immunization. But along with it, also it, it also included the social determinants, namely nutrition, sanitation, and clean water. So these were important, largely, these were underscored as important, largely because they're direct causal factors to disease and ill health. So the overall definition of uh, comprehensive primary health care really meant uh, uh, to ensure that every citizen who has a right is provided a mental and physical well-being. Now, over the years, however, countries have gradually drifted away from this goal. Most post-colonial countries were faced with se several competing demands on their fragile resources. Such a resource constraint then gave rise to lowering aspirations and reducing the bar of expectations. The concept of vertical program was adopted. Unlike Sri Lanka or Thailand, India did not increase health budgets and instead opted to implement the strategy of disease eradication through a stream of national health programs uh, that are cheaper to do, easier to administer, and quicker to get some results in the short run. So we have, with this thinking, we had a large number of national health programs dealing with mainly eradication of disease, malaria, leprosy, TB, HIV, AIDS, RCH, immunization, and so on, that administered on a 60-40 sharing formula between the central and state governments. However, through the years, the pot of money for health remained the same. On an average, as Indrani pointed out, 1% of GDP. Half of this was spent on primary care. Such low funding resulted in two unfortunate outcomes. The shifting away of the growing middle class, which has the capacity to pay away from the government hospitals to the private hospitals. And the second was the unfinished nature of primary health care system, despite seven decades creating an inefficient, lopsided, and a wasteful health system. Stunting and malnourishment still impacts over 35% of our children. Two thirds of our women are anemic. Unhealthy populations entail not only high levels of morbidity and mortality, but also absenteeism from work, low productivity, wasteful expenditures on diagnostics and drugs, and getting impoverished in the process necess necessitating welfare. Over eight lakh children every year uh, die on account of diarrhea and other waterborne diseases. Acute respiratory infections continue to take lives which can be saved at a fraction of a cost. Air pollution is responsible for a million deaths every year. The persons who suffer from these causes are largely children and young persons belonging to the economically productive age group. Alongside the demand for old age disease is also growing, pulling most investment towards sophisticated hospitals, high-tech equipment, and super specialists. Government's reluctance to increase resources for healthcare and private investment going into tertiary care has triggered a set of distortions directly impacting on the economic and social conditions of the country. Seven decades on, in primary healthcare space, we still have 20 to 30% vacancies of human personnel, doctors, nurses, paramedics, on an average, we have one doctor for every 1,500 population against the norm of 1,000. This is a national average. In states like Bihar, the ratios will be three times more. It is similar in the case of nurses and other qualified paramedics as well. We have a very long way to go in creating the required number of appropriately skilled personnel, be it generalists for family care and public health or specialists. Likewise, low investments has meant poor infrastructure that is now improving, of course, under the National Health Mission and the Health and Wellness Program launched by the Government of India. For example, in 2018, an economically middle-income state like AP had over 65% of its subcenters in huts or single-room rented accommodation. 
Now the state is trying to build appropriate infrastructure for sub-centers and strengthening the PHCs under the health and wellness program. Due to the utter inadequacy of the primary health system that either have poor infrastructure such as no laboratory services or diagnostic equipment or the required personnel, people have innovated their own coping mechanisms, often consisting of cons consulting the local quack or, or unqualified providers for minor ailments and going to the public or private hospitals in case of serious problems. This situation has, however, steadily improved with the introduction of the NRHM in 2005. The NRHM impact has been significant, measured by the increases in the utilization of primary healthcare centers in terms of outpatient treatment, the threefold increase in institutional deliveries, reduced both, reducing both maternal and infant mortality, and lower mortality due to malaria and vector-borne diseases, and better detection and treatment of TB cases and so on. Notwithstanding the above, given the patchy status of primary health care and the in case of more serious ailments, a question arises whether we need to re-strategize, go back to basics, and ask ourselves answers to some fundamental questions. Do we need to have primary health care at all? What is the evidence to show that it is worth the resources and the policy attention? Given the advances in technology, can we not leapfrog from home treatment for a minor ailment to a hospital without the intermediation of primary care? Of primary care. The, evidence, the above set of questions are important and need to be carefully examined in the light of evidence. Fungible resources on the one hand and the other rapid strides in technology, road communications, transport systems, and people's aspirations towards specialist care and use of modern diagnostics. COVID has shown quite conclusively the power of telemedicine in providing medical solutions to patients living in remote locations when movement was discouraged. Question is whether this experience can be extended and routinized. The attendant question that will follow is whether modern technology can replace human contact, and if not, then what, and if so, what are the boundaries? Taking any, any kind of decisions would need to be evidence-based, and that is where we are wanting in our research. It is only in recent times, say about a decade and a half, that countries have begun to collect data and evidence to study the efficacy of primary health care. For example, studies in Brazil, US, and UK have shown a reduction of nearly one third of hospitalization and specialist care for hypertension or diabetes management due to effective primary health care. This is a huge saving in both costs and also improved health and well being of people. We have no such data for India. We need to therefore collect such data to assess the efficacy and cost savings due to primary health care. The second area where we have a huge data gap to take a considered evidence-based reform is the issue of accountability. In the private healthcare system, productivity and optimal utilization is measured by the resources generated from patients. In the public health system, with some services free, some subsidized, some not available, and all expenditures underwritten by government, there are no such tools available. In several cases, personnel have multiple tasks to attend to. Due to these various considerations, accountability in public facilities becomes difficult to enforce. For example, in some hospitals, one can find a surgeon not performing even one surgery the whole year on plea that the equipment is not functioning or there is no anesthetist or there's no operation theater. Entailing the double whammy of patients and government incurring expenditures are not achieving the objective of reducing out-of-pocket expenditures. In the context of primary health care, the issue of accountability is more complex. This is largely because most primary health care outcomes are dependent on behavior change and cultural biases. A diabetic or a hypertensive must exercise and have diet control. A pregnant woman must rest and eat well. An infant must be immunized. A fever or cough must not be ignored. Medicines must be taken regularly every day. All these are vital for improved well-being, but areas where the control of the caregiver is highly circumscribed. The above issue has been sought to be addressed in some countries by making caregivers accountable to the patient's well-being. 
measuring case management by outcomes such as TB cured, birth of a healthy baby, full immunization ensured to in infants, reducing and stabilizing diabetes and hypertension with close monitoring and effective counseling of the patient to change behavior, etc., are then monetarily rewarded. Such an approach then incentivizes the caregiver to seek out the patient actively then wait for him to come to the center passively. But then such a system would need to be based on evidence, patient records and digitized health records of the family as such. Turning primary healthcare on its head, making the caregiver responsible and accountable for the health of the people under his charge then changes the dynamics. It would imply that the healthcare giver has an intimate knowledge of the health status of families under his charge. Who is old? Who is bedridden? How many infants do I have in my charge? How many need immunization? How many pregnant women need counseling and antenatal care? How many patients are on TB drugs and need to be followed up? And how many went on referral for surgery and are back home for post-operative care and so on? Such information is then based on data and the health team reviews not only how, not only how many vaccine vials have been used, but how many children have got their vaccination and how many have been left out for follow-up. The denominator is always 100 in this case, and the data of the missing numbers is what needs to be monitored. Once baselines and data are available, it becomes possible to state how effective primary care can be and provides the evidence for further investment and attention. Till that level of micro-planning and data monitoring systems are not there, Till such time that health and well being is not data and evidence driven, where every individual counts, we will continue to have a health system that is driven more by hospitals and specialists. Such a model is inefficient as tasks and treatment that can be available at a low facility are a high facility at three times the cost. Instead of especially seeing complex cases that he's trained for, he spends time providing services. Lesser qualified, than, uh, lesser qualified than him. Such systems are costly, inefficient, and wasteful, as I've said before. This is of importance for us all to reflect upon as we are among the 15 countries that spend less than 1% GDP on health and are significant contributors to the global disease burden. This needs to change. Technology is a great enabler. We have the expertise and the knowledge. We just need our policymakers to have that vision that UK's beverage had in 1945, when in a war-torn country, economically battered and with infrastructure leveled to the ground and people living on rations, he dared to espouse the policy for a universal healthcare for all, giving birth to the National Health Service. We need a beverage now more than ever when out-of-pocket health spending has hit the roof on account of the COVID pandemic. So the issue here and I would like to conclude with this statement that, that, we, that we need much more evidence, much more granular data. And the reason for me to emphasize on the data gaps for taking any evidence-based policy for restructuring our health system and giving a greater policy attention to primary health care is, is largely because I understand that many of the people listening in are data crunchers and would be interested to know what are the data gaps in the health sector that they can contribute in by collecting it and analyzing it for us? Thank you very much. Thank you for the illuminating speech. So I now invite uh, for question answer. We have five minutes time for questions and comments. So is there any question from the room? Uh, anyone from the panelists? So I yeah, had uh, one question. Sorry, yeah. Operaji, there's a question from the room. Took some okay, time okay. to get the mic on. Okay, yeah. So let's take that question first. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Rao is this, that how can we keep the unqualified doctors in check in the primary areas because they are, you know, they're they are dime a dozen. And many of the time, because of the ill advice, many of the deaths happen. And, 
And yeah. they are a menace, that's true. But it's all a question of supply demand. As so long as you don't have, I mean, what do the people in a village do? If there's no doctor that they can call upon, there is large absenteeism and they have an ailment, which is, you know, say a stomach pain or a fever or a headache at night. The person available next door is this uh, uh, unqualified path who not only goes and uh, gives them medicines at home, but he also goes the next day if required and gets them from the town and gives it to them. So, and he does it on credit. So that, you know, there's no immediate having to uh, pay for the service or whatever. So it's a question of people's convenience. Our health system, unfortunately, is very facility driven, uh, set up from above where, you know, it seems fine that for 5,000 population, you have a sub-center. But remember, the villages can be far flung and to even access a sub-center where the auxiliary nurse midwife lives can be very far, in, say, in the middle of the night or during rainy season or to cross the stream. So that's the reason why just convenience uh, has led to people depending much more on the quacks. Uh, in Andhra state, which is quite now small after bifurcation, there are almost 30,000 of them. And removing them will, will be hugely problematic unless and until we have we ramp up our delivery system in the in the primary healthcare space and that is very important so what is really happening for example in andhra again i'd like to take uh, to site is that they have a mobile clinic with a doctor lab attendant a, a data monitoring person a nurse and so on they and a pharmacist they go to the village on an appointed day and uh, distribute medicines and uh, treat the patients. But then what happens the remaining 29 days? So these are all practical difficulties. And I think the only answer is that we need to have, uh, we need to take a quick call, whether we can co-op them and give them some training so they don't do harm, or we truly enforce our regulation and eliminate them totally. But then you have to have a replacement. Ma'am, I have a second follow-up question with the permission of the chair. Yeah, please go ahead. Ma'am, how do we ensure that, that there is a mental health care, which is an important part of, uh, I mean, health care in the rural areas? How do we incorporate this mental health care model in the primary health care model, ma'am? You know, uh, the Mental Health Act, I think you must have uh, gone through. It's a brilliant act, uh, which really has tried to demystify mental health away from psychiatrists and specialist dependent to uh, taking lay counselors in the communities. So there is a huge opportunity for the government today to train and identify more lay counselors. I mean, some elderly uh, grandmother could make a perfect uh, a counselor for many depressions that people suffer from. They're not mad. They don't need to be in having institutional care at all or even drugs. It could be a temporary, you know, uh, setback, a mental setback. But then people will say, what the pagal hai? You know, this kind of deviant behavior, which could be a, due to a frustration or due to a, uh, a temporary uh, setback, as I said, is normally, you know, uh, given a label and uh, they're not being treated. So there are, that's a majority of our uh, uh, mentally ill people. And so it provided for lay counselors, it provided for training of our uh, frontline workers and so on to be able to do much more effective counseling. And I think that's where it, it, Kerala has tried to do and shown its efficacy. Tamil Nadu is trying to do that and models are now coming up. And uh, in the Ayushman Bharat wellness, health and wellness clinic model, one of the mandatory services is mental health uh, to be provided at the sub-center level. That's the lowest public facility, which is available at 5,000 population. Uh, the ANMs and the nurse who are positioned there are being trained on how to uh, detect and identify uh, people who need these services and uh, try and uh, deal with the problem and then refer wherever they find it necessary. So it is trying to be uh, integrated with the general health service, but I'm afraid uh, we have a very, very, very long way to go. We have neglected mental health hugely, and it's not going to be easy to uh, cover that gap uh, very quickly. It's really a very serious problem in our country, very serious. Many of the suicides 
particularly young students could have been uh, you know, totally wasteful, could have been avoided. Um, we have to give it a high priority. That's all I can say. Thank so you. we have another question from uh, Indrani. Indrani, would you like to unmute and uh, ask your question? Yeah, yeah, only because it's Sujata. I wanted to know her revised view about the HWC initiative and if you think that has changed the primary care landscape at all. Which one, sorry, Indrani? The Health and Wellness Center initiative. Uh, it hasn't, it has changed the landscape, meaning, you know, Health and Wellness Center, they have spent money on the hardware where at least now you're getting a facility which is much more decent where the a &Ms and the nurse midwife, uh, the nurse uh, community health worker can sit. And in areas where the nurse is, she is able to, die, uh, to detect and uh, you know, provide uh, counseling and distribute the drugs given by the doctor for diabetes and hypertension, uh, able to take the BP of the patient and do some routine care. But uh, so it is decentralized and there's a huge turnout of out, in the outpatient you know, visits to the sub-centers because they're giving drugs for hypertension and diabetes today, which was not the case before. Sub-centers are way too RCH focused. Today, they're trying to branch out to say there are other services to be delivered from the sub-center. And having the nurse there has helped because definitely the nurses are far better than these half-baked ANMs. So there is a potential, but then, you know, you know very well, better than me, how the implementation varies from place to place. Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and all are making very good use of it. But then it's this south-north divide always persists. So uh, much more monitoring, much more intensive training, much more of hand-holding is required in the initial years, uh, which I'm not too sure is coming because the budgets are also not so much as a, as it uh, needs to have. Thank you. Is there another question uh, from the co-panelists? Uh, Manu, I was going to have a, um, had a quick um, follow-up question for Sujata. Earlier when uh, Sujata, you were talking about the uh, informal sector providers, as you know, that's a topic I have I've worked on. So um, here, the West Bengal government has been trying something new, as you probably know, where they are trying to train thousands of these informal sector providers with the Liver Foundation, Abhijit, uh, Abhijit not Banerjee, Abhijit. Um, Chaudhary. Chaudhary, thank you very much. Uh, because yeah. Abhijit Banerjee and Jishnu had done the earlier study which formed the precursor. Um, do you know if other states are trying that or do you know what the, the experience of the West Bengal government so far has been with that? I only know it from Abhijit and uh, he, he is very, very convinced that uh, these trained, uh, you know, these, uh, let's not call them quacks, or maybe you want to call them RMPs, whatever. Sure. When you give them a little bit of training, they can be a great help because they have that communication uh, with the people and they have the people's trust. People trust an RMP much more, whether you like it or not, than yeah. our fancy MBBS doctor because, you know, he just goes there and he's absent half the time and then he gets transferred before they even get to know. So this people's trust is a very important thing, as you know, in health. So Abhijit is very convinced. And, you know, I've also, though I continue to be a bit confused in my head, what is the right way, because I can see the argument, which are equally valid on both ways. But the point ultimately is it's very difficult to remove the quack from our environment. So like China did, what I have believed is what like China did with Barefoot Doctors. What did they do? They were also at the community level in, in the 60s when Mao started. Uh, all sorts of people providing all kinds of care for ailments. Then they screened these people and they, they put them through a test to see what is their uh, knowledge of uh, healthcare. You know, Mohanan, as you know very well, and since you worked on it, many of them are pretty well honed in. They know drugs, they're not quacks, quacks in that sense. They worked as ward boys, they worked for years as apprentices with doctors, they know somewhat. So uh, then they tuned in training to bridge the gap uh, between what they put down is a floor level of knowledge that every community health worker must have, what these people have, and bridge that gap to bring into a standardized uh, floor level. Now, I have been thinking that that's what we should do so that, you know, if you remunerate them and you give them training and bring them up to uh, a minimum level of services, 
and protect them by giving them some good salary, say 10, 15,000, then they won't do any harm because they get recognized by the system and they, and they are able to provide their services to the people. But unfortunately, we, we went parallel and went into the ashtas instead of using this resource, which is already there in the community. And so now we have, we have cluttered the community with so many providers that the health system is bleeding on account of these parallel systems of RMPs, uh, nexus with the private sector and the patient's flow going there, no matter what you do in the public space. But it's a, it's a policy that they're just cutting and not uh, taking a firm view of it. But uh, when and if we do take a view, massive training is what would be the answer. And then providing them necessary drugs and co-op them into the system. That's what I think. And if they're poor and bad and they you know the evaluation, they just die of their natural death. The more doctors we are able to, what I do believe, what I have said in my talk, that it's time we make the primary healthcare system, the doctor, the PHC, accountable to the health of the people, not just wait in his PHC for the patients to come to him. The GP system of UK, in other words. The minute you have the doctor making the house visit, the minute you have the MBBS doctor reaching out and ringing up and say, why did you come for your TB drugs or whatever it is, the quack will vanish slowly. But when there is nothing there, empty spaces, you can't simply say that, you know, the quack is a quack, but at least he's doing something. So I think, you know, it is a supply demand problem and it's also a restructuring of our primary healthcare system. The model hasn't worked in India and we need to have the courage to say this model hasn't worked, we need to revise it and we need to change it. But that uh, requires a beverage and that requires a political vision and a foresight. Let's see. Thank you. Uh, so I'll include my question on the chat box. Uh, I'll invite uh, professor Sonia Balotra, who is a professor of economics at Warwick. It's a pleasure um, to uh, hear her. She has a vast body of work uh, in the area of health, gender, early life intervention, uh, and uh, human capital. So over to you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you, Aparajita, for organizing this. It's very interesting. And thank you to all speakers so far. And Banoj, I hope I can stay for your talk. I have to go for my COVID booster, but just as you finish. So um, I also um, apologize that I probably could have done better in balance, but I'm going to introduce the broader agenda with two slides and then home in on one subtopic. So I think that in India, certainly, but actually even worldwide, even in richer countries, we need to focus in, to zoom in on the health of women. Uh, there's of course intrinsic value um, as there is for all other individuals. Um, women have lagged in economic participation and there's a clear relationship between women's health and their economic productivity. And then women are carers for elderly people, for children, they sort of have this huge home production input. So there's market productivity, home productivity. And then there's intergenerational transmission, which is over and above the caring function. Um, there appears to be sort of biological transmission of health between mothers and children. So for all of these reasons, we should be uh, really looking after the health of women. And I think we're not. Um, I also apologize if this was an hour and if I knew in advance and so on. I would prefer to survey research rather than my research. So it's not vanity, but more that uh, I, I can summarize it easily. Um, so the focal points of my research or also what I believe, I guess they're related, should be on our agenda are reproductive health coverage and related, but not only maternal mortality, maternal depression, domestic violence, which is also a serious public health issue, Fertility, uh, it's declining, but um, I could say a bit more about it, and sex selective abortion. So, on maternal mortality, um, Indrani, sorry, um, Indrani spoke a little bit about maternal mortality across rich and poor countries. We used in this study that I cite here the introduction of gender quotas in 21 different developing countries 
after the Beijing um, Convention in 1995. And uh, we used what are called event study methods to try and establish causality. And we found that the implementation of gender quotas leads to sharp and quite immediate, like within a year, declines in maternal mortality. And this is robust to many checks. We also redid the analysis just for India using the Indian states um, and the implementation of the village level quota and we could replicate this result. Um, to understand the mechanisms, we looked at measures of reproductive health coverage, including uh, prenatal attendance, I mean, uh, attendance, uh, yeah, prenatal care and delivery attendance. And it seems that it all lines up and these effects are real. So what we emphasize in the paper is that this is quite low cost and it's not so much about country income like GDP or about public funds allocated to maternal mortality. It's primarily about political will. And we do some more work in the paper to try and differentiate between income in general, health expenditure in particular, and political will. Um, in work that uh, we're doing for some years with uh, co-authors, including Joanna Maselko, who leads this very large project, and my collaborators um, and uh, colleagues, Victoria Baranov and Pietro Biroli, um, we, uh, there are many different papers emerging from this work, but the one that I want to highlight here is that we found that maternal depression uh, treatment, treating women with a simple community-based intervention involving cognitive behavioral therapy led to women being empowered in the particular sense of having more say, more control over household income, so their bargaining power improved. And also investments of parents in both the money and the time metrics in children improved. And if you drill down, it seems that all of this is uh, through the improvements in children are driven by girls. So treating maternal depression improved the status of women in the household and investments in girls. And I think that's a neglected sort of um, uh, lens Maternal depression is a neglected lens through which one could look at the persistent problems of underinvestment in children or women's power in the household. Domestic violence is another major public health issue. It's tied up with um, possibly with depression, with poverty, and so on. It's quite complex. In recent work set in Brazil and Chile, and one paper that's cross country. Um, I've been trying to get at the heart of job opportunities or job loss for men and women separately. And I just want to flag here because the results vary that job loss, especially for men, seems very um, predictive of um, domestic violence. Uh, job loss for women can go in either direction. And the direction in which it goes appears to depend on whether women have options outside the partnership they're in. So in this paper, we use information on gender equality and access to divorce and actually demonstrate that the signs flip for women if you have access to divorce. Nine um, uh, important component of women's health is fertility. So for example, repeated fertility, especially with small with short birth intervals is known to deplete the health of women. Also repeated fertility and time out of the market, the labor market um, can um, permanently uh, hamper the economic um, productivity of women. There's a lot of new work establishing what is called, we always knew that children um, uh, that there are work-life balances that women need to manage, but there's a new wave of work in the last three years around the child penalty. And the interesting sort of big stylized fact is that there are even in countries like Denmark and Sweden, where there is a lot of support around maternity, uh, women, women suffer a career penalty of up to 20%. This of course then feeds back into um, their children and into society. 
So there are spillovers. And then specific to India and a few other countries, including China, is this phenomenon of sex selective abortion, which although it's, it's not new, is not abating. And um, um, I'm going to spend some time today just talking about work on sex selective abortion, just to bring, bring in especially a few points at the end. So I might move quite quickly through the first parts uh, so that I can have you um, consider the last bits of that. Um, so I don't need an introduction to this audience, but uh, it seems that the underlying cause of some preference is deep set patrilineal, patrilineal norms. And this is why some preference was observed uh, since the first Indian censuses. It's not new at all. The way in which it's manifest or the procedure by which it's implemented is what's changed over time. So it's, it's been um, expressed through sun bias fertility stopping, which is just that you keep having children till you achieve the desired number of sons, which then increases fertility, but not just increases fertility, possibly increases unwanted fertility leading to underinvestment in children. The other mode that has been identified in the literature is that parental investments have favored boys' survival, so girls have been inverted commas allowed to die. And then more recently, since the mid 80s, so not super recent, but it's important because it's not abating, is sex selective abortion, uh, which is uh, marked by the sex ratio at birth. All I want to say here is that the manifestation has shifted rather than the underlying preference. And it seems that one important driver of this shift in the style of doing this is declining fertility. Um, there are, um, maybe I will actually move quickly now. Uh, there are compositional shifts here where, for example, neglect or fertility stopping may have been more common in less rich households, but prenatal selection is clearly um, dom uh, dominant or uh, concentrated in richer households. So now girls are more than before being disproportionately born into poorer families. The, there is some substitution of prenatal for postnatal selection and declining fertility. So it's important here that fertility is both a cause and a consequence. If fertility is declining because say women are uh, seeking careers, then it's a cause and women who seek careers don't want to keep having um, additional children till they get a boy, they want to more efficiently uh, achieve their sex selection, but it's also a consequence because if you have access to prenatal sex selection, then you uh, lower your fertility. Um, so in this rather ancient paper, we use the fact that there, was, um, there were structural breaks with the first imports of ultrasound technology Tech, sorry, ultrasound machines, and then a second structural break marking the dismantling of economic regulation and local production of ultrasound. And this led to an outbreak of sex selection, which we estimate was about 4.48 million girl abortions each year, which was 3% of potential births up to order two. This picture from our work just shows you on the left the, uh, the curves for highly educated and wealthy women, and on the right for less educated and less wealthy women to demonstrate that, uh, um, that prenatal sex selection is really very much concentrated amongst the educated and the wealthy. The blue lines track the share of females born in families that before that birth had only boys, and the red lines track the share of females born in families that had only girls until that birth. And so you can see that if you had only boys, there's a fairly stable share of females born, which hovers around the normal rate. But if you've had only girls, then there's a sharp drop. Uh, in a, uh, this is ancient work, but we're updating it this year, and there are some very interesting trends 
that are quite new and I hope I'll write about soon. Um, but there are some important changes. Um, sorry, I'm flicking too quickly. In this work with Anukriti and um, Tam, we basically looked forward at how parents um, who have access to sex selection have changed their investments and their fertility. We find that for every three aborted girls, one additional girl survives. So that's some trade-off, but far from complete. So they're still disappearing girls. And we find a significant drop in fertility and also that fertility moves closer to desired fertility. We also are able to look at mechanisms and show that gender gaps in both breastfeeding and immunization um, narrow. Um, and in other work, uh, we use policy experiments or natural experiments to look at the underlying causes a bit more closely. So we know that there are these norms, but it's just very hard to measure a norm. So what we did in different studies was to look at a property rights reform, a reform equalizing inheritance rights, inheritance rights for women, and at world gold price um, fluctuations month by month in a time series over 30 years. So even if the institution of dowry was constant, the cost of dowry was changing and we showed that people didn't adjust the amount of dowry. So the cost of dowry struck them because they didn't, uh, instead of two necklaces, give one necklace. Um, we, we could see that in the data. We find basically that um, property rights reform exacerbated sun preference. And the argument which we're able to sort of quite get quite close to establishing with the data is that Prop, this property rights reform was the uh, West Bengal tenancy reform that gave sharecropping tenants um, inheritable tenancy rights. So those tenancy rights were heritable by sons. And giving property rights to people is one of the most progressive sorts of poverty or anti-poverty strategies one could implement. It's a brave, bold strategy for poverty but it had this unintended consequence of making sons even more desirable because they could inherit those tenancy rights. Uh, then more recently, there was this equalization of inheritance rights for women. And um, we look very carefully at many versions of the data. And it basically seems clear that there is quite a big um, uh, reaction uh, where people, uh, where abortion of girls increases just after these inheritance rights become more equal. So parents, I guess, uh, had not, so social norms had not adjusted to the legal reform and parents reacted to the legal reform trying to escape it by having fewer girls at birth. And finally, we show using time series data um, that gold price inflation led to increased infant mortality before 1985 and to increased um, boys at birth after 1985. The upshot of all this work is that it seems it's difficult to change social norms through legislation. Aparajita has a really nice new paper which shows um, how you can possibly change social norms, not through legislation, but through information campaigns um, and sort of community engagement. And I agree with her results that that seems a more promising way to go. Because legislation is abrupt and is not something that people have given their explicit vote for. Um, it's also relevant to know that commodity price movements can actually change the population composition in India, even though they're driven outside. And, um, and this work is against a backdrop where although we, in a sense, all believe, I think that norms matter, um, we've been challenged in identifying anything because we perceive norms as largely unchanging or sluggish. I'm not going to go through these. 
Uh, this is just to show you that um, the change in the log in the gold price, proportional changes in gold prices are very hard to predict. Um, I wanted to get here and then I'll wrap up. Um, so we did further work trying to understand. So those were ultimate causes. And as we discussed, it's hard to get at them. So can we do anything that's a bit more indirect? And one, uh, one um, result we produced recently is that possibly one reason that despite having the PNDT, the prenatal sex uh, determination prohibition um, and various information campaigns, we haven't really seen sex elective abortion decline significantly is that Hindus do it and Hindus are the leaders that are monitoring it. So we look to Muslims who we know, I'm going to jump there here. Um, we look to Muslims who we know from um, say the World Values Survey for India, but I think we know anyway, are more averse to abortion than Hindus, just like Catholics are. So Muslims don't have a sort of religious aversion to abortion that seems stronger than amongst Hindus. So this is the question, do you agree that abortion is acceptable under different circumstances? And you see, if you're a Muslim, you're seven to 12 or five to 12 percentage points more likely to say you don't agree. And the other panel here is from the NFHS. And my purpose here is just to say that um, elicited sun preference is not different between Hindus and Muslims. So in this work, we try to say sun preference is similar between Hindus and Muslims. What's different is that Muslims don't want to do it through abortion. And so we used close elections between Hindu and Muslim leaders using all available data over about, I think it was four or five election periods. And we find very clearly that when Muslims win power, sex selective abortion falls. Since nothing else moves sex selective abortion, we thought that was quite important to say. However, it doesn't mean that people don't want children. We show that after that fertility goes up. So they're just going back to the old way of having more children. We do other things like in the same data set with the same approach, look at male versus female legislators and we, feel, we, we find women act on fertility possibly by making say contraception more available, but women leaders don't act on sex selective abortion the way that Hindu Muslims do. It's a bit complex and I'm happy to discuss. Also referring back to the paper I've already discussed, it seems that maternal, we also have a new paper where we, a different paper where we have data on beliefs and we ask women uh, their perceived, it's just their subjective perception of how difficult it'll be to breastfeed or play with the child that's in their womb um, and we find that depressed women report um, anticipating being more tired, consistent with depressed women having um, uh, fatigue, which is a symptom of depression. So maternal depression can limit the extent to which you can exercise control over income, say by bargaining with your husband to direct resources at children and in particular girls, but it can also lead to fatigue which can inhibit your breastfeeding or playing with the child. Investments we know are important for the long run. Um, let me move quickly to the end. Um, okay, concluding remarks. So there's a broader question of whether sex elective abortion, sorry, I take that back. There's a broader question about whether abortion, not sex elective, but abortion is not a reproductive health right of women. So we're in a very particular sort of juxtaposition between abortion being a right for women, but sex selective abortion being a great harm to women. Um, and I just want to highlight that abortion, even in say the US where there's lots of access to contraception is quite high. About 21% of pregnancies in the US are aborted. So I'm just putting out there that there is this um, slight conflict of 
um, over access to abortion and the right to select the sex. Um, but sex selective abortion is a particular concern because it skews, it's a harm to women. It reinforces, it is the sort of strongest statement of gender inequality to not want that girl child. And uh, as it um, has progressed and accumulated to create demographic imbalance, it is skewing marriage and labor markets with implications for crime, productivity and inequality. So what can we do? And just bullet points, we could extend the scope of state pensions so that there is at least a slow creep of some independence from the idea that you need your boy to look after you. We could increase the share of women in government, which we've done at the village level, but we've failed to do at the state level. And um, we could do what we would do in any case for development and progress, which is improve returns to human capital by investing in health and education, because there's some evidence that um, um, returns to human capital rise and then men support women's rights because they, they understand that women are mothers and conveyors of um, home education. But in India, the returns have risen and there are barriers to women realizing those returns. And there's all this new work that many people at Ashoka, including Ashwini and Kanika and others uh, have contributed to, which is about the barriers to women realizing the returns to their human capital. Okay, I will stop there. I don't know if I exceeded my time. Sorry. So thanks, thanks for the enriching discussion. So uh, sorry, we are out of time. So we will have the question answer for this talk on the chat. So if you have any questions or comments, please uh, put in the chat box. So we'll go to the last uh, discussion. So it's a privilege to uh, invite Professor Manoj Mohanan, who is a professor at Duke uh, Stanford School of Public Policy. So without wasting any further time, over to you, Manoj. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with sharing my screen. Can you see this? Yes. Excellent. Let's see if I can get this to go. Not really. Just a second. Is this something I need to do differently? Just a second. I have too many windows open. This is the problem. Okay, this should work. All right. Can you see it now? Yes. Fantastic. Um, all right, thank you so much for having me, uh, Aprajita, and uh, it's, it's a bit wonderful to be here. And also, I have to say, it's not really nice to be one of the last speakers to go in because a lot of points that I wanted to cover had already come up in the in previous presentations. So I'll try to speed through uh, and make sure we can all, you can all go home in time. I know it's getting late in India. So um, the topic of the conversation today, I was hoping to focus on data for health policy and specifically, you know, what are the unique data challenges in India? Uh, and where, where do you see potential opportunities and, and uh, kinks in, the, in that process and where we could learn something from the previous work? Um, so overall, we all know that health is a state subject, uh, but there's also a large and growing number of programs that are driven by the union government. And so this federal structure in itself presents some changes and challenges for us when we think about uh, policy adoption and the empirical environment in which the uh, data is produced and data is presented and who makes these decisions about uh, adopting policies for evidence-based policies. And the, the key thing here is, you know, we talk about evidence-based policy um, and I will try to sort of balance some commentary with empirical work, um, but evidence-based policy is, is a tricky term because it, it requires a few things that are actually very hard to produce and implement. One is you need very targeted, tightly defined policy options. So we can't say we want evidence policy on nutrition policy in India. That's very hard to do because it's very vague. So we'll have to have a very specific, tightly defined policy option around something like, you know, reimbursement or sorry, incentives for Anganbadi workers, 
for doing X amount of work or for Y type of activity. And then we can think about the policy options around that. More importantly, we, when we think about the evidence that's needed, and I'm, I'm borrowing from Kate Baker and Amitav Chandra's uh, commentary from New England Journal in 2017 here, is we need also, we, because it's not enough to just say it works, it doesn't work. We'll have to have some understanding of the magnitude of these effects, but also in those specific uh, contexts for our policymakers to be able to take it uh, seriously and then say, yes, this policy is successful or this program was successful in my neighboring state and then try to adopt it. But that sort of brings us to this question, you know, what is a successful program or a policy? Um, we as academics sitting in the room, uh, most of us are academics sitting in the room, we, we might think of a successful policy or a successful program slightly differently, right? We might think about an, ex an existing policy target, an objective that was fairly tightly defined and whether or not this policy implementation ends up uh, meeting those goals or not. But in the world of public policy, when the politicians and the policymakers think of it, oftentimes uh, the general public even thinks about a successful po program as one that often wins large awards or one that uh, is commonly perceived to have done very well. Uh, there is a claim of an impact. And so then you know, one has to ask, what is this impact? Uh, are more lives saved? Are more services delivered? Did we save money in the process? Well, so these are really hard questions. So what I want to do is show you a couple of studies um, and, and sort of help think about how that process of claims, large programs, ambitious efforts, uh, meet the empirical evidence challenge, and then what happens after that. So I'll, um, I will come to COVID because you can't talk in 2021 about anything without bringing in COVID, right? So I will come to COVID, but just hold on for a second. Um, what I'll do is I'll just tell you very quickly about two studies. One was where we were looking at this very large program that the state of Gujarat was implementing to reduce the cost of institutional deliveries in, in Gujarat. Uh, it was called the Chiranjeevi Yojana. And the other one, I bring, I, I'll present um, evidence from a very large NGO driven private sector, public private partnership effort where this NGO was developing social franchising models of care to deliver primary care. Um, that second one will touch upon some of those informal sector provider issues that, that Sujata mentioned as well in her previous talk. So the Sorry, Manoj, uh, are, you, are you sharing like, uh, uh, are your uh, slides, uh, like oh, are you crap. using? I'm just, yeah, we are just are uh, looking at the first slide. So really? I'm not oh, sure. I'm yeah. so sorry. Thank you so much for pointing out. Um, there's something wrong going on here. So maybe let you me... can just do a full screen. Yeah, uh, no, I did it. Uh, let me just do it again. It, the thing is I have three different screens and every time I change over, it goes to something else. Let's try this one. This should work. Can you see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, my feedback window shows me the exact same thing, except uh, this was done. I apologize. Okay. Good thing I didn't uh, go too far. Thank you. Um, so yeah, these are the two studies I'll be telling you about. And thanks, Aprajita, for pointing that. Okay. You'd think by now we'd know how to use, I'd know how to use. So the Chiranjeevi Yojana was uh, a program in, uh, that Gujarat had started that they did not want to do the types of programs that were at the time, the Janani Suraksha type of programs that government of India was implementing across the country. Instead, they were trying to leverage the assets they had, which is a very robust private sector, to then give subsidies to these, these hospitals in the private sector to deliver, ba women, uh, deliver babies for women from below poverty households for free. Um, the program was considered to be widely successful at the time um, got all these international awards and had also delivered about 800,000 babies by the time uh, we were uh, working with the state in 2010. Um, the challenge, the reason why this came about even in the first place was there was a peculiar thing that at the time the evidence seemed to suggest that the state already had, seemed to suggest that there was a huge impact among the users, but there was still very low take up. And the state was kind of perplexed that why is it that a program that seems to be so successful, uh, seems to be so promising because it reduces mortality rates by a lot based on the data they had at the time and uh, was basically free. Why would over half the population that's eligible not want to take this up? Why would they go to 
Sonia's clinic next door and pay money out of pocket instead of coming to my clinic and delivering for free. And so that was the starting point. Um, so we went out, well, this was a study we developed with the state government's uh, sort of encouragement and invitation, and we collected data from over 6,000 households. We found peculiar patterns. So we also checked from DLHS data. The short answer, and I don't have time to go into all of the details, was what we found was actually the problem was with the data that the previous studies had looked at the study, the uh, experiences of the users and tried to infer that if you see lower mortality rates among our users in the hospitals that the program was implemented in, then you basically attribute all differences between that population and the population that was delivering at home to the effect of the program, right? So you're, you're, you're missing out the, the parallel trends assumption in a difference in difference framework where the idea that the four, there are two parts. One is people who come to these hospitals are going to be very different than people who do not want to come to hospitals. And the second thing is hospitals go to areas where they can deliver care and have uh, patient volumes as well. So this was a key part that started a whole body of work for us later on, but it, I like to think that um, all the attention that these studies, that this set of results got um, also helped the state to sort of step back and ask, where is this program being implemented? Like for, for example, why is it that cities like Surat and Baroda that have a lot of large publicly funded hospitals also had these private hospitals delivering babies for free? There was absolutely no reason to do that. So that reducing that duplication helped them with improving the program. Um, the other example, again, here is a story of data here. Uh, the World Health Care, World Health Partner Sky Care program was one of the largest investments that the Gates Foundation had made in India as part of their Ananya project. Right? So these guys got a $23 million from Gates alone and several more millions of dollars from multiple other international organizations to develop this social franchising and telemedicine program. The key idea was simple. 11 districts in Bihar, where most of the care is being provided by the kinds of providers Sujata referred to, they wanted to tie up with them, train them, deliver uh, better quality care because of improving supply chain and also training them, and then also use a franchising model so that they get all the certification, uh, the, the picture I showed you earlier, like this one, the Sheher Ka Doctor Aapke Ghar Ke Paas and stuff. Um, so that, that program was supposed to improve the treatment for childhood diarrhea and pneumonia. Those were the two main target illnesses for reasons Sujata also mentioned that it's still a major condition, right? And so when we uh, looked at this, what we had done there is we conducted, uh, we collected one of the largest data sets that we've done in, in at least in my own career um, across 360 different st study sites half of which were randomized to uh, the program being implemented and the other half not. Um, with using data from about 67,000 children, we were trying to understand what the effect of this program was. And the main reason we worried was these are really hard outcomes to shift. So we didn't want to um, sort of run a study where we think that we might end up being underpowered to pick up significant, economically significant, but small effects. What we find uh, is two things. One is at the end of this program, after they had spent all this money, despite all these awards, uh, the SkyCare program, the, you, you see that first graph out there with the um, donuts holes, the orange ones are the WHP Sky providers. So the vast majority of care in these, in these areas even though this program had been running and trying to recruit providers, the number of providers they were able to recruit is very small, right? So this is a first order problem is a very large NGO came in with a very promising message and they run their program. And sure, if you go to their providers, you might find something different, might. But if you look at the whole picture of what role do these providers play in the entire market, it was very, very small. And so then when we look at the outcomes, whether it's about diarrhea is being treated with ORS or zinc, whether the diarrhea treatment behavior changes at home, because I might go to Aparajita's clinic and learn that actually I should, I can treat my child with ORS next time something happens. So maybe it's not just treatment at her clinic, it's treatment at home, nothing changes, right? So this is like the most precise zero I have personally estimated um, in, in my empirical career. And what happened was, 
this was very contentious at the time because here was a program that had won the Skoll Foundation Social Entrepreneurship Award. For those of you who are not aware, that is a million dollar prize um, that's given out by the Skoll Foundation. It also won the uh, World Economic Forum Awards, uh, the Asian Awards, the other awardee that, during that year for the Asian Awards was Shah Rukh Khan and Albert Ma, along with WHP. So just to give you a sense of the high, high profile. And the difference here was the program was developed by the NGO, much like it often happens in the private or public sector. The folks who create the program and promote it are very convinced that this program, this idea is great. And so for a policymaker, one has to then stop back and say, yes, you have a good slide deck and a pitch that the idea works. Can you show me the evidence? And the problem was, especially in the case of WHP, when the evidence, when present, asked to present evidence, they would say things like, look, our network has provided care for childhood diarrhea for about 2 million kids. Hence, it's great. Well, what would happen if WHP didn't exist? And the answer was, yes, 2 million children would still get care just that it would not be branded as WHP because that's what the whole program was trying to do. Um, but in order to sort of take this question about program impact and turn it into data and ask a question that helps you decide what the future policy steps are is actually quite challenging. So I'll come back to the challenges and the, and the steps there. But before that, it's useful to review what, what parallels we see um, with these two examples in the case of COVID as well. So COVID is trickier and arguably more com complicated as well as possibly more controversial as well, because policy responses are necessary sometimes in the absence of data, right? Unlike, unlike me, a policymaker does not have the luxury of saying, I'll run a big study and wait for it and then decide what to do, because this is a fast moving train. But the question is, did we ignore the data, right? Worse, did we create an environment where we tried to scuttle efforts to collect the necessary data? Um, and, and I say this not to uh, you know, only cite our own work, but to say that you know, as some of my comments come based on the fact that my co-authors co and I um, did some of the first large seroprevalence studies in India, including the Mumbai study, which got global attention, as well as the statewide Karnataka seroprevalence studies. But here's the thing, when, uh, whether it was the first wave or the second wave, what we found was there is twofold things happening. One is this rapid rush to have a policy response. Um, some of it seems to be because the policymaker needs to do something, but the other part is also that there seems to be an overreach of these regulations at this point. Not everything is good, not everything is bad, but some things, just think about this. In Mumbai, there were regulations introduced where doctors were prevented from doing zero, uh, testing of COVID. So much so that the regulation actually said that if you're a doctor and you're going to operate on a case that has appendectomy, that, that's an appendix surgery, appendectomy you're going to perform, you cannot test that patient for COVID unless the patient had symptoms. And here's the bizarre part. We already knew that by then about 90% or 95% of the cases from Maharashtra's own data, we knew were all asymptomatic cases. So why would doctors want to operate on a case and stand right next to this patient and stick there? Uh, if, you're, if you're doing a major surgery, you're going to have all kinds of ventilation equipment that the patient could possibly contaminate with, um, when you're going to do this surgery and not do testing. And the regulation would say that if, if the doctor tested, they would lose their medical license, which is kind of crazy, right? During the second wave, more egregious things happened with very systematic efforts to make sure that the data on mortality or the number of bodies that are being burned and cremated is not being made available. So my own view, and this is purely commentary, when I sit on the sidelines and, and sort of try to collect data and look at what the policy responses are, sometimes it felt like India was responding to the pandemic in US and Europe rather than our own, right? The, the, so the political economy of the pandemic response becomes a really important point, which we can use to understand the challenges of data is the government, and this is not just India, this is globally, the government feels the need to do something that's dramatic. You know, for example, why is the US introducing travel restrictions on some countries versus the others? It's the same idea, is that they have to be seen as doing something and they have to do something short and immediate, but also, 
sadly, for the politics over public's health is such that public memory is short. Like we're not right now holding accountable our policymakers for things they said and did during summer of 2020. Um, all those scandalous graphs that they were presenting, promising that, you know, it'll be sunny summer days by in six months from now, we were all forgotten and forgiven in that sense. And that creates this environment where evidence-based policy as we understand it is important, but there are serious first order problems, right? The policy process making process is complicated. I, as an academic, can provide the numbers, but I need to understand that the policymakers respond to multiple different um, sort of priorities. And the second problem is most democracies which we work in um, have a fragmented power issue. So even if the one state in, in, in India that we were working with, for instance, if in Kerala, where I spent a lot of time, um, wanted to do things differently, they would often get into loggerheads with either neighboring states or sometimes with the center about how to make policy decisions that were not compatible with each other. We see this happening right now during the Omicron crisis as well, where individual states are introducing different regulations. The, the third issue is around limitations of scientific inquiry. Not everything can be answered with numbers, especially with policy problems, right? Sometimes it's a question where moral choices have to be made and then the political reality has to be has to be factored into that um, and then similarly the, the social problems are equally thorny and the last one related to this is the institutional in, in environment that we as knowledge producers work in a very different environment where getting a right answer is very important even if it's ambiguous we are okay right so for example sonia showed us so many of these studies that she's been working on but if you ask Sonia one question has like, can this policy change gender equality? Yes or no? Well, it's going to be hard. But policymakers want the yes or no answer because that's what they need versus for us, we, have, we are sort of sworn to the idea that we'll give you the correct answer, even if it's ambiguous. And that makes it very difficult for us to play together and arrive at um, sort of an equilibrium. And so this is, this is another example is, Let's say we have a policymaker in the room who needs to take in evidence and help us resolve what the, what the controversy is. The problem mainly is the evidence can be confusing. So I love XKCD, and uh, this is a, I, I think this is a fantastic one where they take the same set of data points and give you 12 different interpretations of what those data points could be. And so imagine if 12 of us in the room, each one present to the policymaker saying, you know, here's what the relationship between X and Y looks like. How is that policymaker possibly going to make sense about which one of our interpretations is actually the right one? I mean, this might seem trivial, but it's actually not that different between what happened in any of the studies I mentioned to you, whether it was the initial set of uh, controversies around the Chiranjeevi program's effect or during COVID where some of us were telling the government that, look, this epidemic is far bigger than you think it is. Uh, the rates of underreporting are vastly larger and others were saying, no, no, this is just about perfectly right. And it's all came down to the methodology and the technical details. So the key idea is, you know, uh, Sujata mentioned this as well, is we need evidence-based accountability, but the point is without some amount of technical expertise among the policymakers, introducing that is going to be hard. So I'll leave you with this slide. My last plea, and especially for those of you who are working with policymakers is, we should all be pushing towards policy response, policy reforms to increase access and transparency for data, not the restrictive policies that are being uh, sort of slowly introduced in India. And the last one is public-private partnership. We need to have a trust but verify approach, not an environment of distrust saying everything from that is not publicly sanctioned is bad. Instead, leverage the extensive presence of the private sector in India um, and then go from there. And I use private broadly, including the nonprofit. I'm out of time, so I'll stop right there. And thank you so much. Thanks so much for the interesting talk. I'm sure people have a lot of questions, but we are out of time. So uh, I, I thank all the speakers. Uh, I thank the audience. Uh, and so I'll hand it over to Professor Shubhashish in the room. Uh, thanks, Aparajita. Thanks for, uh, for a great session. Uh, 
So I think we'll end here and we will uh, reconvene at nine o'clock tomorrow morning uh, for the session on agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.